the preface of a theologico-political treatise by spinoza this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org read for you by chiquito crasto a theologico-political treatise by baruch benedict de spinoza translated by robert harvey monroe elvis preface men would never be superstitious if they could govern all their circumstances by set rules or if they were always favoured by fortune but being frequently driven into straits where rules are useless and being often kept fluctuating pitiably between hope and fear by the uncertainty of fortune's greedily coveted favours they are consequently for the most part very prone to credulity the human mind is readily swayed this way or that in times of doubt especially when hope and fear are struggling for the mastery though usually it is boastful overconfident and vain this is a general fact i suppose every one knows though few i believe know their own nature no one can have lived in the world without observing that most people when in prosperity are so overbrimming with wisdom however inexperienced they may be that they take every offer of advice as a personal insult whereas in adversity they know not where to turn but beg and pray for counsel from every passer-by no plan is then too futile too absurd or too fatuous for their adoption the most frivolous causes will raise them to hope or plunge them into despair if anything happens during their fright which reminds them of some past good or ill they think it portends a happy or unhappy issue and therefore though it may have proved abortive a hundred times before style it a lucky or unlucky omen anything which excites their astonishment they believe to be a portent signifying the anger of the gods or of the supreme being and mistaking superstition for religion account it impious not to avert the evil with prayer and sacrifice signs and wonders of this sort they conjure up perpetually till one might think nature as mad as themselves they interpret her so fantastically thus it is brought prominently before us that superstition's chief victims are those persons who greedily covet temporal advantages they it is who especially when they are in danger and cannot help themselves are wont with prayers and womanish tears to implore help from god upbraiding reason as blind because she cannot show a sure path to the shadows they pursue and rejecting human wisdom as vain but believing the phantoms of imagination dreams and other childish absurdities to be the very oracles of heaven as though god had turned away from the wise and written his decrees not in the mind of man but in the entrails of beasts or left them to be proclaimed by the inspiration and instinct of fools madmen and birds such is the unreason to which terror can drive mankind superstition then is engendered preserved and fostered by fear if any one desire an example let him take alexander who only began superstitiously to seek guidance from seers when he first learned to fear fortune in the passes of Sisus, Curtius, Volume 4. Whereas, after he had conquered Darius, he consulted prophets no more, till a second time frightened by reverses. When the Scythians were provoking a battle, the Bactrians had deserted, and he himself was lying sick of his wounds, he once more turned to superstition, the mockery of human wisdom, and bed Aristander, to whom he confided his credulity, inquire the issues of affairs with sacrificed victims. Very numerous examples of a like nature might be cited, clearly showing the fact that only while under the dominion of fear do men fall a prey to superstition, that all the portents ever invested with the reverence of misguided religion are mere phantoms of dejected and fearful minds, and lastly, that prophets have most power among the people and are most formidable to rulers precisely at those times when the state is in most peril i think this is sufficiently plain to all and will therefore say no more on the subject the origin of superstition above given affords us a clear reason for the fact that it comes to all men naturally though some refer its rise to a dim notion of god 
universal to mankind, and also tend to show that it is no less inconsistent and variable than other mental hallucinations and emotional impulses, and further, that it can only be maintained by hope, hatred, anger, and deceit. Since it springs not from reason, but solely from the most powerful phases of emotion. Furthermore, we may readily understand how difficult it is to maintain in the same course men prone to every form of credulity. For as the mass of mankind remains always at about the same pitch of misery, it never assents long to any one remedy, but is always best pleased by a novelty which has not yet proved elusive. This element of inconsistency has been the cause of many terrible wars and revolutions. For as Curtius well says, Lib. Volume 4, Chapter 10. The mob has no ruler more potent than superstition, and is easily led, on the plea of religion, at one moment, to adore its kings as gods, and anon to execrate and abjure them as humanity's common bane. Immense pains have therefore been taken to counteract this evil, by investing religion, whether true or false, with such pomp and ceremony, that it may rise superior to every shock, and be always observed with studious reverence by the whole people. A system which has been brought to great perfection by the Turks, for they consider every controversy impious, and so clog men's minds with dogmatic formulas that they leave no room for sound reason, not even enough to doubt with. But if in despotic statecraft the supreme and essential mystery be to hoodwink the subjects and to mask the fear which keeps them down, with a specious garb of religion, so that men may fight as bravely for slavery as for safety, and count it not shame but highest honour to risk their blood and their lives for the vainglory of a tyrant. Yet in a free state no more mischievous expedient could be planned or attempted. Wholly repugnant to the general freedom are such devices, as enthralling men's minds with the prejudices, forcing their judgment, or employing any of the weapons of quasi-religious sedition. Indeed, such seditions only spring up when law enters the domain of speculative thought, and opinions are put on trial and condemned on the same footing as crimes, while those who defend and follow them are sacrificed, not to public safety, but to their opponents' hatred and cruelty. If deeds only could be made the grounds of criminal charges, and words were always allowed to pass free, such seditions would be divested of every semblance of justification and would be separated from mere controversies by a hard and fast line. Now, seeing that we have the rare happiness of living in a republic, where everyone's judgment is free and unshackled, where each may worship God as his conscience dictates, and where freedom is esteemed before all things dear and precious, I have believed that I should be undertaking no ungrateful or unprofitable task, in demonstrating that not only can such freedom be granted without prejudice to the public peace, but also that without such freedom piety cannot flourish nor the public peace be secure. Such is the chief conclusion I seek to establish in this treatise. But in order to reach it, I must first point out the misconceptions which, like scars of our former bondage, still disfigure our notion of religion and must expose the false views about the civil authority which may have most impudently advocated, endeavouring to turn the mind of the people still prone to heathen superstition away from its legitimate rulers and so bring us again into slavery as to the order of my treatise i will speak presently but first i will recount the causes which led me to write i have often wondered that persons who make a boast of professing the christian religion namely love joy peace temperance and charity to all men should quarrel with such a rancorous animosity and display toward one another such bitter hatred that this rather than the virtues they claim, is the readiest criterion of their faith. Matters have long since come to such a pass that one can only pronounce a man Christian, Turk, Jew, or heathen by his general appearance and attire, by his frequenting this or that place of worship, or employing the phraseology of a particular sect. As for manner of life, it is in all cases the same. Inquiry into the cause of this anomaly leads me unhesitatingly to ascribe it to the fact that the ministries of the church are regarded by the masses merely as dignities, her offices as posts of emolument, in short, popular religion may be summed up as respect for ecclesiastics. The spread of this misconception inflamed every worthless fellow 
with an intense desire to enter holy orders, and thus the love of diffusing God's religion degenerated into sordid avarice and ambition. Every church became a theatre, where orators instead of church teachers harangued, caring not to instruct the people, but striving to attract admiration, to bring opponents to public scorn, and to preach only novelties and paradoxes such as would tickle the ears of their congregation. This state of things necessarily stirred up an amount of controversy, envy, and hatred, which no lapse of time could appease, so that we can scarcely wonder that of the old religion nothing survives but its outward forms, even these, in the mouth of the multitude, seem rather adulation than adoration of the deity, and that faith has become a mere compound of credulity and prejudices, I, prejudices too, which degrade man from rational being to beast, which completely stifle the power of judgment between true and false, which seem in fact carefully fostered for the purpose of extinguishing the last spark of reason. Piety, great God, and religion are becoming a tissue of ridiculous mysteries. Men who flatly despise reason, who reject and turn away from understanding as naturally corrupt, these, I say, these of all men are thought, O oh, lie most horrible, to possess light from on high. Verily, if they had but one spark of light from on high, they would not insolently rave, but would learn to worship God more wisely, and would be as marked among their fellows for mercy as they now are for malice. If they were concerned for their opponents' souls instead of for their own reputations, they would no longer fiercely persecute, but rather be filled with pity and compassion. Furthermore, if any divine light were in them, it would appear from their doctrine. I grant that they are never tired of professing their wonder at the profound mysteries of holy writ. Still I cannot discover that they teach anything but speculations of Platonists and Aristotelians, to which, in order to save their credit for Christianity, they have made holy writ conform. Not content to rave with the Greeks themselves, they want to make the prophets rave also, showing conclusively that never even in sleep have they caught a glimpse of Scripture's divine nature. The very vehemence of their admiration for the mysteries plainly attests that their belief in the Bible is a formal assent rather than a living faith, and the fact is made still more apparent by their laying down beforehand, as a foundation for the study and true interpretation of Scripture, the principle that it is in every passage true and divine. Such a doctrine should be reached only after strict scrutiny and thorough comprehension of the sacred books, which would teach it much better, for they stand in need of no human fictions, and not be set up on the threshold, as it were, of inquiry. As I ponder over the facts that the light of reason is not only despised, but by many even execrated as a source of impiety, that human commentaries are accepted as divine records, and that credulity is extolled as faith. As I mark the fierce controversies of philosophers raging in church and state, the source of bitter hatred and dissension, the ready instruments of sedition and other ills innumerable, I determine to examine the Bible afresh in a careful, impartial, and unfettered spirit, making no assumptions concerning it, and attributing to it no doctrines which I do not find clearly therein set down. With these precautions I constructed a method of scriptural interpretation and thus equipped proceeded to inquire what is prophecy in what sense did god reveal himself to the prophets and why were these particular men chosen by him was it an account of the sublimity of their thoughts about the deity and nature or was it solely on account of their piety these questions being answered i was easily able to conclude that the authority of the prophets has weight only in matters of morality and that their speculative doctrines affect us little Next I inquired why the Hebrews were called God's chosen people, and discovering that it was only because God had chosen for them a certain strip of territory where they might live peaceably and at ease, I learnt that the law revealed by God to Moses was merely the law of the individual Hebrew state, therefore that it was binding on none but Hebrews, and not even on Hebrews after the downfall of their nation. Further, in order to ascertain whether it could be concluded from Scripture, that the human understanding is naturally corrupt. I inquired whether the universal religion, the divine law revealed through the prophets and apostles to the whole human race, differs from that which is taught by the light of natural reason, 
whether miracles can take place in violation of the laws of nature, and if so, whether they imply the existence of God more surely and clearly than events, which we understand plainly and distinctly through their immediate natural causes. Now, as in the whole course of my investigation, I found nothing taught expressly by Scripture, which does not agree with our understanding, or which is repugnant thereto, and as I saw that the prophets taught nothing, which is not very simple and easily to be grasped by all, and further, that they clothed their teaching in the style, and confirmed it with the reasons, which would most deeply move the mind of the masses to devotion towards God, I became thoroughly convinced that the Bible leaves reason absolutely free, that it has nothing in common with philosophy. In fact, that revelation and philosophy stand on totally different footings. In order to set forth this categorically and exhaust the whole question, I point out the way in which the Bible should be interpreted, and show that all knowledge of scriptural questions should be sought from it alone, and not from the objects of ordinary knowledge. Thence I pass on to indicate the false notions which have arisen from the fact that the multitude, ever prone to superstition, and caring more for the shreds of antiquity than for eternal truths, pays homage to the books of the Bible rather than the Word of God. I show that the Word of God has not been revealed as a certain number of books, but was displayed to the prophets as a simple idea of the divine mind, namely, obedience to God in singleness of heart, and in the practice of justice and charity. And I further point out that this doctrine is set forth in Scripture in accordance with the opinions and understandings of those among whom the apostles and prophets preached, to the end that men might receive it willingly and with their whole heart. Having thus laid bare the basis of belief, I draw the conclusion that revelation has obedience for its sole object, and therefore in purpose, no less than in foundation and method, stands entirely aloof from ordinary knowledge. Each has its separate province, neither can be called the handmaid of the other. Furthermore, as men's habits of mind differ, so that some readily embrace one form of faith, some another, for what moves one to pray may move another only to scoff. I conclude, in accordance with what has gone before, that every one should be free to choose for himself the foundations of his creed, and that faith should be judged only by its fruits. Each would then obey God freely with his whole heart, while nothing would be publicly honoured save justice and charity. Having thus drawn attention to the liberty conceded to every one by the revealed law of God, I pass on to another part of my subject and prove that this same liberty can and should be accorded with safety to the state and the magisterial authority, in fact, that it cannot be withheld without great danger to peace and detriment to the community. In order to establish my point, I start from the natural rights of the individual, which are coextensive with his desires and power, and from the fact that no one is bound to live as another pleases but is the guardian of his own liberty. I show that these rights can only be transferred to those whom we depute to defend us, who acquire with the duties of defence the power of ordering our lives, and thence I infer that rulers possess rights only limited by their power, that they are the sole guardians of justice and liberty, and that their subjects should act in all things as they dictate. Nevertheless, since no one can so utterly abdicate his own power of self-defence, as to cease to be a man, I conclude that no one can be deprived of his natural rights absolutely, but that subjects, either by tacit agreement or by social contract, retain a certain number which cannot be taken from them without great danger to the state. From these considerations I pass on to the Hebrew state, which I describe at some length in order to trace the manner in which religion acquired the force of law, and to touch on other noteworthy points. I then prove that the holders of sovereign power are the depositaries and interpreters of religious no less than of civil ordinances, and that they alone have the right to decide what is just or unjust, pious or impious. Lastly, I conclude by showing that they retain this right and secure safety to their state by allowing every man to think what he likes and says what he thinks. Such a philosophical reader are the questions I submit to your notice, counting on your approval for the subject matter of the whole book, and of the several chapters, is important and profitable. I would say more, but I do not want my preface to extend to a volume, especially as I know what its leading propositions are to philosophers, but
but commonplaces. To the rest of mankind I care not to commend my treatise, for I cannot expect that it contains anything to please them. I know how deeply rooted are the prejudices embraced under the name of religion. I am aware that in the mind of the masses superstition is no less deeply rooted than fear. I recognize that their constancy is mere obstinacy, and that they are led to praise or blame by impulse rather than reason. Therefore the multitude, and those of like passions with the multitude, I ask not to read my book. Nay, I would rather that they would utterly neglect it, than that they should misinterpret it after they won't. They would gain no good themselves, and might prove a stumbling block to others, whose philosophy is hampered by the belief that reason is a mere handmaid to theology, and whom I seek in this work especially to benefit. But as there will be many who have neither the leisure nor perhaps the inclination to read through all I have written, I feel bound here, as at the end of my treatise, to declare that I have written nothing which I do not most willingly submit to the examination and judgment of my country's rulers, and that I am ready to retract anything which they shall decide to be repugnant to the laws or prejudicial to the public good. I know that I am a man, and as a man liable to error, but against error I have taken scrupulous care, and striven to keep an entire accordance with the laws of my country, with loyalty and with morality. End of the Preface of A Theological Political Treatise by Baruch Benedict de Spinoza Translated by Robert Harvey Monroe Elvis Read for you by Chiquito Crasto, Birmingham, Alabama Section 1 of A Theological Political Treatise by Baruch Benedict de Spinoza Translated by Robert Harvey Monroe Elvis this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read for you by Chiquito Crasto. Chapter 1. Of Prophecy Prophecy or Revelation is sure knowledge revealed by God to man. A prophet is one who interprets the revelations of God to those who are unable to attain to sure knowledge of the matters revealed, and therefore can only apprehend them by simple faith. The Hebrew word for prophet is Nabi that is, speaker or interpreter. But in Scripture, its meaning is restricted to interpreter of God, as we may learn from Exodus chapter 7, verse 1, where God says to Moses, See, I have made thee a god to Pharaoh, and Aaron thy brother shall be thy prophet, implying that, since in interpreting Moses' words to Pharaoh, Aaron acted the part of a prophet, Moses would be to Pharaoh as a god, or in the attitude of a god. Prophets I will treat of in the next chapter, and at present consider prophecy. Now it is evident from the definition above given, that prophecy really includes ordinary knowledge, for the knowledge which we acquire by our natural faculties depends on our knowledge of God and His eternal laws. But ordinary knowledge is common to all men as men and rests on foundations which all share, whereas the multitude always strains after rarities and exceptions, and thinks little of the gifts of nature. So that when prophecy is talked of, ordinary knowledge is not supposed to be included. Nevertheless, it has as much right as any other to be called divine, for God's nature, in so far as we share therein, and God's laws dictated to us nor does it suffer from that to which we give the preeminence, except in so far as the latter transcends its limits and cannot be accounted for by natural laws taken in themselves. In respect to certainty, it involves, and the source from which it is derived, that is God, ordinary knowledge, is no whit inferior to prophetic, unless indeed we believe, or rather dream, that the prophets had human bodies but superhuman minds, and therefore that their sensations and consciousness were entirely different from our own. But although ordinary knowledge is divine, its professors cannot be called prophets, for they teach what the rest of mankind could perceive and apprehend, not merely by simple faith, but as surely and honourably as themselves. Seeing then that our mind subjectively contains in itself and partakes of the nature of God, and solely from this cause is enabled to form notions explaining natural phenomena and inculcating morality, 
it follows that we may rightly assert the nature of the human mind, in so far as it is thus conceived, to be a primary cause of divine revelation. All that we clearly and distinctly understand is dictated to us, as I have just pointed out, by the idea and nature of God, not indeed through words, but in a way far more excellent and agreeing perfectly with the nature of the mind, as all who have enjoyed intellectual certainty will doubtless attest. Here, however, my chief purpose is to speak of matters having reference to Scripture, so these few words on the light of reason will suffice. I will now pass on to and treat more fully the other ways and means by which God makes revelations to mankind, both of that which transcends ordinary knowledge and of that within its scope. For there is no reason why God should not employ other means to communicate what we know already by the power of reason. Our conclusions on the subject must be drawn solely from Scripture. For what can we affirm about matters transcending our knowledge except what is told us by the words or writings of prophets? And since there are, so far as I know, no prophets now alive, we have no alternative but to read the books of prophets departed, taking care the while not to reason from metaphor or to ascribe anything to our authors which they do not themselves distinctly state. I must further premise that the Jews never make any mention or account of secondary or particular causes, but in a spirit of religion, piety, and what is commonly called godliness, refers all things directly to the deity. For instance, if they make money by a transaction, they say God gave it to them. If they desire anything, they say God has disposed their hearts towards it. If they think anything, they say God told them. Hence we must not suppose that everything is prophecy or revelation which is described in Scripture as told by God to anyone, but only such things as are expressly announced as prophecy or revelation or are plainly pointed to as such by the context. A perusal of the sacred books will show us that all God's revelations to the prophets were made through words or appearances, or a combination of the two. These words and appearances were of two kinds. One, real, when external to the mind of the prophet who heard or saw them. Two, imaginary, when the imagination of the prophet was in a state which led him distinctly to suppose that he heard or saw them. With a real voice, God revealed to Moses the laws which he wished to be transmitted to the Hebrews, as we may see from Exodus chapter 25, verse 22, where God says, And there I will meet with thee, and I will commune with thee from the mercy seat which is between the cherubim. Some sort of real voice must necessarily have been employed, for Moses found God ready to commune with him at any time. This, as I shall shortly show, is the only instance of a real voice. We might perhaps suppose that the voice with which God called Samuel was real. For in 1 Samuel chapter 3 verse 21 we read, And the Lord appeared again in Shiloh, for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel in Shiloh by the word of the Lord, implying that the appearance of the Lord consisted in his making himself known to Samuel through a voice, in other words, that Samuel heard the Lord speaking. But we are compelled to distinguish between the prophecies of Moses and those of other prophets, and therefore must decide that this voice was imaginary, a conclusion further supported by the voice's resemblance to the voice of Eli, which Samuel was in the habit of hearing, and therefore might easily imagine. When thrice called by the Lord, Samuel supposed it to have been Eli. The voice which Abimelech heard was imaginary, for it is written, Genesis chapter 20 verse 6, and God said unto him in a dream, so that the will of God was manifest to him, not in waking, but only in sleep, that is, when the imagination is most active and uncontrolled. Some of the Jews believed that the actual words of the Decalogue were not spoken by God, but that the Israelites heard a noise only without any distinct words, and during its continuance apprehended the Ten Commandments by pure intuition. To this opinion I myself once inclined, seeing that the words of the Decalogue in Exodus are different from the words of the Decalogue in Deuteronomy. For the discrepancy seemed to imply, since God only spoke once, 
that the Ten Commandments were not intended to convey the actual words of the Lord, but only His meaning. However, unless we would do violence to Scripture, we must certainly admit that the Israelites heard a real voice. For Scripture expressly says, Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 4, God spake with you face to face. That is, as two men ordinarily interchange ideas through the instrumentality of their two bodies. And therefore it seems more consonant with Holy Writ to suppose that God really did create a voice of some kind with which the Decalogue was revealed. The discrepancy of the two versions is treated of in chapter 8. Yet not even thus is all difficulty removed, for it seems scarcely reasonable to affirm that a created thing, depending on God in the same manner as other created things, would be able to express or explain the nature of God, either verbally or really by means of its individual organism, for instance, by declaring in the first person, I am the Lord your God. Certainly, when anyone says with his mouth, I understand, we do not attribute the understanding to the mouth, but to the mind of the speaker. Yet this is because the mouth is the natural organ of a man speaking, and the hearer, knowing what understanding is, easily comprehends by a comparison with himself that the speaker's mind is meant. But if we knew nothing of God beyond the mere name and wished to commune with him and be assured of his existence, I fail to see how our wish would be satisfied by the declaration of a created thing, depending on God neither more or less than ourselves. I am the Lord. If God contorted the lips of Moses, or, I will not say Moses, but some beast, till they pronounce the words, I am the Lord, should we apprehend the Lord's existence therefrom? Scripture seems clearly to point to the belief that God spoke himself, having descended from heaven to Mount Sinai for the purpose, and not only that the Israelites heard him speaking, but that their chief men beheld him. Exodus chapter 24. Further, the law of Moses, which might neither be added to nor curtailed, and which was set up as a national standard of right, nowhere prescribed the belief that God is without body, or even without form or figure, but only ordained that the Jews should believe in his existence and worship him alone. It forbade them to invent or fashion any likeness of the deity. But this was to ensure purity of service, because never having seen God, they could not by means of images recall the likeness of God, but only the likeness of some created thing, which might thus gradually take the place of God as the object of their adoration. Nevertheless, the Bible clearly implies that God has a form, and that Moses, when he heard God speaking, was permitted to behold it, or at least its hinder parts. Doubtless some mystery lurks in this question, which we will discuss more fully below. For the present I will call attention to the passages in Scripture indicating the means by which God has revealed His laws to man. Revelation may be through figures only, as in First Chronicles chapter 22, where God displays His anger to David by means of an angel bearing a sword, and also in the story of Balaam. Maimonides and others do indeed maintain that these and every other instance of angelic apparitions, example, to Manoah and to Abraham offering up Isaac, occurred during sleep, for that no one with his eyes open ever could see an angel, but this is mere nonsense. The sole object of such commentators seems to be to extort from Scripture confirmations of Aristotelian quibbles and their own inventions, a proceeding which I regard as the acme of absurdity. In figures not real, but existing only in the prophet's imagination, God revealed to Joseph his future lordship, and in words and figures he revealed to Joshua that he would fight for the Hebrews, causing to appear an angel, as it were the captain of the Lord's host, bearing a sword, and by this means communicating verbally. The forsaking of Israel by providence was portrayed to Isaiah by a vision of the Lord, the thrice holy, sitting on a very lofty throne, and the Hebrews, stained with the mire of their sins, sunk as it were in uncleanness, and thus as far as possible distant from God. The wretchedness of the people at the time was thus revealed, while future calamities were foretold in words. I could cite from Holy Writ many similar examples, but I think they are sufficiently well known already. However, 
we get a still more clear confirmation of our position in Numbers, chapter 12, verses 6 and 7, as follows. If there be any prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known unto him in a vision, that is, by appearances and signs, for God says of the prophecy of Moses that it was a vision without signs, and will speak unto him in a dream, that is, not with actual words and an actual voice. My servant Moses is not so. With him will I speak mouth to mouth, even apparently, and not in dark speeches, and the similitude of the Lord he shall behold. That is, looking on me as a friend and not afraid, he speaks with me. Exodus chapter 33 verse 17. This makes it indisputable that the other prophets did not hear a real voice, and we gather as much from Deuteronomy chapter 24 verse 10. And there arose not a prophet since in Israel, like unto Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face, which must mean that the Lord spoke with none other, for not even Moses saw the Lord's face. These are the only media of communication between God and man, which I find mentioned in Scripture, and therefore the only ones which may be supposed or invented. We may be able quiet to comprehend that God can communicate immediately with man, for without the intervention of bodily means, he communicates to our minds his essence. Still, a man who can by pure intuition comprehend ideas which are neither contained in nor deductible from the foundations of our natural knowledge must necessarily possess a mind far superior to those of his fellow men. Nor do I believe that any have been so endowed save Christ. To him, the ordinances of God leading men to salvation were revealed directly without words or visions, so that God manifested himself to the apostles through the mind of Christ as he formerly did to Moses through the supernatural voice. In this sense, the voice of Christ, like the voice which Moses heard, may be called the voice of God. And it may be said that the wisdom of God, that is, wisdom more than human, took upon itself in Christ human nature, and that Christ was the way of salvation. I must at this juncture declare that those doctrines which certain churches put forward concerning Christ I neither affirm nor deny, for I freely confess that I do not understand them. What I have just stated I gather from Scripture, where I never read that God appeared to Christ or spoke to Christ, but that God was revealed to the apostles through Christ, that Christ was the way of life, and that the old law was given through an angel, and not immediately by God, whence it follows that if Moses spoke with God face to face, as a man speaks with his friend, that is by means of their two bodies, Christ communed with God mind to mind. Thus we may conclude that no one except Christ received the revelations of God without the aid of imagination, whether in words or vision. Therefore the power of prophecy implies not a peculiarly perfect mind, but a peculiarly vivid imagination, as I will show more clearly in the next chapter. We will now inquire what is meant in the Bible by the Spirit of God breathed into the prophets, or by the prophets speaking with the Spirit of God. To that end, we must determine the exact signification of the Hebrew word ruach, commonly translated spirit. The word ruach generally means a wind, for example, the south wind, but it is frequently employed in other derivative significations. It is used as equivalent to 1 breath, neither is there any spirit in his mouth. Psalm 135, verse 17. 2. Life or breathing, and his spirit returned to him. 1 Samuel, chapter 30, verse 12. That is, he breathed again. 3. Courage and strength, neither did there remain any more spirit in any man. Joshua, chapter 2, verse 11. And the spirit entered into me, and made me stand on my feet. Ezekiel chapter 2 verse 2. 4. Virtue and fitness. They should speak, and multitudes of years should teach wisdom. But there is a spirit in man. Job chapter 32 verse 7. That is, wisdom is not always found among old men, for I now discover that it depends on individual virtue and capacity. So, a man in whom is the spirit, Numbers, chapter 27, verse 18. 5. Habit of mind. Because he had another spirit with him. 
Numbers chapter 14 verse 24, that is another habit of mind. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you. Proverbs chapter 1 verse 23. 6. Will, purpose, desire, impulse. Whither the spirit was to go, they went. Ezekiel chapter 1 verse 12. That cover with a covering, but not of my spirit. Isaiah chapter 30 verse 1. For the Lord hath poured out on you the spirit of deep sleep. Isaiah chapter 29 verse 10. Then was their spirit softened. Judges chapter 8 verse 3. He that ruleth his spirit is better than he that talketh a city. Proverbs chapter 16 verse 32. He that hath no rule over his own spirit. Proverbs chapter 25 verse 28. Your spirit as fire shall devour you. Isaiah chapter 33 verse 1. From the meaning of disposition we get 7. Passions and faculties. A lofty spirit means pride. A lowly spirit, humility. An evil spirit, hatred and melancholy. So to the expressions spirits of jealousy, fornication, wisdom, counsel, bravery, stand for a jealous, lascivious, wise, prudent or brave mind for we hebrews use substantives in preference to adjectives or these various qualities eight the mind itself or the life yea they shall all have one spirit ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 19 the spirit shall return to god who gave it nine the quarters of the world from the winds which blow thence or even the side of anything turned towards a particular quarter Ezekiel chapter 37 verse 9 chapter 42 verses 16, 17, 18, 19, etc. I have already alluded to the way in which things are referred to God and said to be of God. 1. As belonging to His nature and being, as it were, part of Him, for example, the power of God, the eyes of God. 2. As under His dominion and depending on His pleasure, Thus the heavens are called the heavens of the Lord, as being his chariot and habitation. So Nebuchadnezzar is called the servant of God, Assyria the scourge of God, etc. 3. As dedicated to him, for example, the temple of God, a Nazarene of God, the bread of God. 4. As revealed through the prophets and not through our natural faculties. In this sense, the Mosaic law is called the law of God. 5 as being in the superlative degree. Very high mountains are styled the mountains of God, a very deep sleep, the sleep of God, etc. In this sense, we must explain Amos chapter 4, verse 11. I have overthrown you as the overthrow of the Lord came upon Sodom and Gomorrah. That is, that memorable overthrow. For since God himself is a speaker, the passage cannot well be taken otherwise. The wisdom of Solomon is called the wisdom of God, or extraordinary. The size of the cedars of Lebanon is alluded to in the psalmist's expression, the cedars of the Lord. Similarly, if the Jews were at a loss to understand any phenomenon, or were ignorant of its cause, they referred it to God. Thus a storm was termed the chiding of God, thunder and lightning the arrows of God, for it was thought that God kept the winds confined in caves, his treasuries thus differing merely in name from the Greek wing god Aeolus. In this manner miracles were called works of God, as being especially marvellous, though in reality, of course, all natural events are the works of God and take place solely by His power. The psalmist calls the miracles in Egypt the works of God, because the Hebrews found in them a way of safety which they had not looked for and therefore especially marvelled at. As then unusual natural phenomena are called works of God, and trees of unusual size are called trees of God, we cannot wonder that very strong and tall men, though impious robbers and whoremongers, are in Genesis called sons of God. This reference of things wonderful to God was not peculiar to the Jews. Pharaoh, on hearing the interpretation of his dream, exclaimed that the mind of the gods was in Joseph. Nebuchadnezzar told Daniel that he possessed the mind of the holy gods. So also in Latin, anything well made is often said to be wrought with divine hands, which is equivalent to the Hebrew phrase 
wrought with the hand of God. We can now very easily understand and explain those passages of Scripture which speak of the Spirit of God. In some places the expression merely means a very strong, dry and deadly wind, as in Isaiah chapter 40 verse 7, The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, because the Spirit of the Lord bloweth upon it. Similarly, in Genesis chapter 1 verse 2, the Spirit of the Lord moved over the face of the waters. At other times it is used as equivalent to a high courage. Thus the Spirit of Gideon and of Samson is called the Spirit of the Lord, as being very bold and prepared for any emergency. Any unusual virtue or power is called the Spirit or virtue of the Lord. Exodus chapter 31 verse 3 I will fill him, Bezaleel, with the Spirit of the Lord, that is, as the Bible itself explains, with talent above man's usual endowment. So Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2, And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, is explained afterwards in the text to mean the spirit of wisdom and understanding, of counsel and might. The melancholy of Saul is called the melancholy of the Lord, or a very deep melancholy. The persons who applied the term show that they understood by it nothing supernatural, in that they sent for a musician to assuage it by harp playing. Again, the Spirit of the Lord is used as equivalent to the mind of man. For instance, Job chapter 27 verse 3. And the Spirit of the Lord in my nostrils. The allusion being to Genesis chapter 2 verse 7. And God breathed into man's nostrils the breath of life. Ezekiel also, prophesying to the dead, says, chapter 27, verse 14, And I will give to you my spirit, and ye shall live, that is, I will restore you to life. In Job, chapter 34, verse 14, we read, If he gather unto himself his spirit and breath. In Genesis, chapter 6, verse 3, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, that is, since man acts on the dictates of his body, and not the spirit which I give him to discern the good, I will let him alone. So too, Psalm 51, verse 12. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. It was supposed that sin originated only from the body, and that good impulses come from the mind. Therefore the psalmist invokes the aid of God against the bodily appetites, but prays that the spirit which the Lord, the Holy One, has given him might be renewed. Again, inasmuch as the Bible, in concession to popular ignorance, describes God as having a mind, a heart, emotions, nay, even a body and breath, the expression spirit of the Lord is used for God's mind, disposition, emotion, strength or breath. Thus Isaiah Chapter 40, verse 13. Who hath disposed the Spirit of the Lord? That is, who save himself hath caused the mind of the Lord to will anything? And Isaiah. Chapter 63, verse 10. But they rebelled and vexed the Holy Spirit. The phrase comes to be used of the law of Moses, which in a sense expounds God's will. Isaiah, chapter 63, verse 11. Where is he that put his Holy Spirit within him? meaning, as we clearly gather from the context, the law of Moses. Nehemiah, speaking of the giving of the law, says, chapter 1, verse 20, Thou gavest also thy good spirit to instruct them. This is referred to in Deuteronomy, chapter 4, verse 6. This is your wisdom and understanding. And in Psalm 143, verse 10, Thy good spirit will lead me into the land of uprightness. The Spirit of the Lord may mean the breath of the Lord, for breath, no less than a mind, a heart and a body, are attributed to God in Scripture, as in Psalm 33, verse 6. Hence it gets to mean the power, strength or faculty of God, as in Job chapter 33, verse 4, the Spirit of the Lord made me, that is, the power, or if you prefer, the decree of the Lord. So the psalmist in poetic language declares, 33 verse 6. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth, that is, by a mandate issued as it were in one breath. Also, Psalm 
cxxxix. 7, " Whither shall I go from Thy Spirit, or whither shall I flee from Thy presence ?" that is, whither shall I go so as to be beyond Thy power and Thy presence ? Lastly, the Spirit of the Lord is used in Scripture to express the emotions of God, for example, His kindness and mercy (Micah ii. 7). Is the Spirit (that is, the mercy) of the Lord straitened ? Are these cruelties His doings ? Zech. iv. 6, " Not by might or by power, but my Spirit, that is mercy, saith the Lord of hosts." The twelfth verse of the seventh chapter of the same prophet must, I think, be interpreted in like manner. " Yea, they have made their hearts as an adamant stone, lest they should hear the law, and the words which the Lord of hosts hath sent in His Spirit, that is, in His mercy, by the former prophets." So also Haggai chapter 2 verse 5, So my spirit remaineth among you, fear ye not. The passage in Isaiah chapter 48 verse 16, And now the Lord of God and His Spirit hath sent me, may be taken to refer either to God's mercy or His revealed law. For the prophet says, From the beginning, that is, from the time when I first came to you, to preach God's anger and His sentence gone forth against you. I spoke not in secret. From the time that it was, there am I. And now I am sent by the mercy of God as a joyful messenger to preach your restoration. Or we may understand him to mean, by the revealed law, that he had before come to warn them by the command of the law. Leviticus chapter 19 verse 17. In the same manner and under the same conditions as Moses had warned them. And that now, like Moses, he ends by preaching their restoration. But the first explanation seems to me the best. Returning then to the main object of our discussion, we find that the scriptural phrases, the Spirit of the Lord was upon a prophet. The Lord breathed His Spirit into men. Men were filled with the Spirit of God, with the Holy Spirit, etc., are quite clear to us, and mean that the prophets were endowed with a peculiar and extraordinary power, and devoted themselves to piety with a special constancy. That thus they perceived the mind or the thought of God, for we have shown that God's Spirit signifies in Hebrew God's mind or thought, and that the law which shows His mind and thought is called His Spirit. Hence that the imagination of the prophets, inasmuch as through it were revealed the decrees of God, may equally be called the mind of God, and the prophets be said to have possessed the mind of God. On our minds also the mind of God, and His eternal thoughts are impressed. But this being the same for all men, is less taken into account, especially by the Hebrews, who claimed a preeminence and despised other men and other men's knowledge. Lastly, the prophets were said to possess the Spirit of God, because men knew not the cause of the prophetic knowledge, and in their wonder referred it with other marvels directly to the deity, styling its divine knowledge. We need no longer scruple to affirm that the prophets only perceived God's revelations by the aid of imagination that is, by words and figures, either real or imaginary. We find no other means mentioned in Scripture, and therefore must not invent any. As to the particular law of nature by which the communications took place, I confess my ignorance. I might indeed say, as others do, that they took place by the power of God. But this would be mere trifling, and no better than explaining some unique specimen by a transcendental term. Everything takes place by the power of God. Nature herself is the power of God under another name, and our ignorance of the power of God is coextensive with our ignorance of nature. It is absolute folly, therefore, to ascribe an event to the power of God when we know not its natural cause, which is the power of God. However, we are not now inquiring into the causes of prophetic knowledge. We are only attempting, as I have said, to examine the scriptural documents and to draw our conclusions from them as from ultimate natural facts. The cause of the documents do not concern us. As the prophets perceive the revelation of God by the aid of imagination, they could indisputably perceive much that is beyond the boundary of the intellect. For many more ideas can be constructed from words and figures than from the principles and notions on which the whole fabric of reason knowledge is reared. Thus we have a clue to the fact that the prophets perceived near everything in parables and allegories, 
and clothed spiritual truths in bodily forms, for such is the usual method of imagination. We need no longer wonder that Scripture and the prophets speak so strangely and obscurely of God's spirit or mind. Numbers chapter 11 verse 17, 1 Kings chapter 22 verse 21, etc. That the Lord was seen by Micah as sitting, by Daniel as an old man clothed in white, by Ezekiel as a fire, that the Holy Spirit appeared to those with Christ as a descending dove, to the apostles as fiery tongues, to Paul on his conversion as a great light. All these expressions are plainly in harmony with the current ideas of God and spirits. Inasmuch as imagination is fleeting and inconstant, we find that the power of prophecy did not remain with a prophet for long, nor manifest itself frequently, but was very rare, manifesting itself only in a few men, and in them not often. We must necessarily inquire how the prophets became assured of the truth of what they perceived by imagination, and not by sure mental laws. But our investigation must be confined to Scripture, for the subject is one on which we cannot acquire certain knowledge, and which we cannot explain by the immediate causes. Scripture teaching about the assurance of prophets I will treat of in the next chapter. End of section 1. Read for you by Chiquito Crasto, Birmingham, Alabama. Section 2 of A Theological Political Treatise by Baruch Benedict de Spinoza. Translated by Robert Harvey Monroe Elvis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read for you by Chiquito Crasto. Chapter 2 Of Prophets It follows from the last chapter that, as I have said, the prophets were endowed with unusually vivid imaginations and not with unusually perfect minds. This conclusion is amply sustained by Scripture, for we are told that Solomon was the wisest of men but had no special faculty of prophecy. Haman, Calliol, and Dara, though men of great talent, were not prophets, whereas uneducated countrymen, nay, even women such as Hagar, Abraham's handmaid, were thus gifted. Nor is this contrary to ordinary experience and reason. Men of great imaginative power are less fitted for abstract reasoning, whereas those who excel in intellect and its use keep their imagination more restrained and controlled holding it in subjection, so to speak, lest it should usurp the place of reason. Thus, to suppose that knowledge of natural and spiritual phenomena can be gained from the prophetic books is an utter mistake, which I shall endeavour to expose, as I think philosophy, the age, and the question itself demand. I care not for the girdings of superstition, for superstition is the bitter enemy of all true knowledge and true morality. Yes, it has come to this. Men who openly confess that they can form no idea of God and only know Him through created things, of which they know not the causes, can unblushingly accuse philosophers of atheism. Treating the question methodically, I will show that prophecies are varied, not only according to the imagination and physical temperament of the prophet, but also according to his particular opinions and further that prophecy never rendered the prophet wiser than he was before. But I will first discuss the assurance of truth which the prophets received, for this is akin to the subject matter of the chapter, and will serve to elucidate somewhat our present point. Imagination does not in its own nature involve any certainty of truth, such as is implied in every clear and distinct idea but requires some extrinsic reason to assure us of its objective reality. Hence, prophecy cannot afford certainty. And the prophets were assured of God's revelation by some sign, and not by the fact of revelation, as we may see from Abraham, who, when he had heard the promise of God, demanded a sign, not because he did not believe in God, but because he wished to be sure that it was God who made the promise. The fact is still more evident in the case of Gideon. Show me, he says to God, show me a sign that I may know that it is thou that talkest with me. God also says to Moses, and let this be a sign that I have sent thee. Hezekiah, though he had long known Isaiah to be a prophet, 
nonetheless demanded a sign of the cure which he predicted. It is thus quite evident that the prophets always received some sign to certify them of their prophetic imaginings, and for this reason Moses bids the Jews, Deuteronomy chapter 18, ask of the prophets a sign, namely the prediction of coming event. In this respect, prophetic knowledge is inferior to natural knowledge, which needs no sign, and in itself implies certitude. Moreover, Scripture warrants the statement that the certitude of the prophets was not mathematical, but moral. Moses lays down the punishment of death for the prophet who preaches new gods, even though he confirm his doctrine by signs and wonders. Deuteronomy chapter 13. For he says, The Lord also worketh signs and wonders to try his people. And Jesus Christ warns his disciples of the same thing. Matthew chapter 24 verse 24. Furthermore, Ezekiel chapter 14 verse 9 plainly states that God sometimes deceives men with false revelations. And Micaiah bears like witness in the case of the prophets of Ahab. Although these instances go to prove that revelation is open to doubt, it nevertheless contains, as we have said, a considerable element of certainty, for God never deceives the good nor his chosen. But, According to the ancient proverb, and as appears in the history of Abigail and her speech, God uses the good as instruments of goodness, and the wicked as means to execute his wrath. This may be seen from the case of Micaiah above quoted. For although God had determined to deceive Ahab, through prophets he made use of lying prophets. To the good prophets he revealed the truth, and did not forbid his proclaiming it. Still, the certitude of prophecy remains, as I have said, merely moral. For no one can justify himself before God, nor boast that he is an instrument for God's goodness. Scripture itself teaches and shows that God led away David to number the people, though it bears ample witness to David's piety. The whole question of the certitude of prophecy was based on these three considerations. One, that the things revealed were imagined very vividly, affecting the prophets in the same way as things seen when awake. 2. The presence of a sign. 3. Lastly and chiefly, that the mind of the prophet was given wholly to what was right and good. Although scripture does not always make mention of a sign, we must nevertheless suppose that a sign was always vouchsafed. For scripture does not always relate every condition and circumstance, as many have remarked, but rather takes them for granted. We may, however, admit that no sign was needed when the prophecy declared nothing that was not already contained in the law of Moses, because it was confirmed by that law. For instance, Jeremiah's prophecy of the destruction of Jerusalem was confirmed by the prophecies of other prophets and by the threats in the law, and therefore it needed no sign. Whereas Hananiah, who, contrary to all prophets, foretold the speedy restoration of the state, stood in need of a sign, or he would have been in doubt as to the truth of his prophecy until it was confirmed by facts. The prophet which prophesieth of peace, when the word of the prophet shall come to pass, then shall the prophet be known that the Lord hath truly sent him. As, then, the certitude afforded to the prophet by signs was not mathematical, that is, did not necessarily follow from the perception of the thing perceived or seen, but only moral. And as the signs were only given to convince the prophet, it follows that such signs were given according to the opinions and capacity of each prophet, so that a sign which would convince one prophet would fall far short of convincing another who was imbued with different opinions. Therefore the signs varied according to the individual prophet. So also did the revelation vary, as we have stated, according to individual disposition and temperament, and according to the opinions previously held. It varied according to disposition in this way. If a prophet was cheerful, victories, peace, and events which make men glad were revealed to him, in that he was naturally more likely to imagine such things. If, on the contrary, he was melancholy, wars, massacres, and calamities were revealed. And so, according as a prophet was merciful, gentle, quick to anger, or severe, he was more fitted for one kind of revelation than another. 
it varied according to the temper of imagination in this way if a prophet was cultivated he perceived the mind of god in a cultivated way if he was confused he perceived it confusedly and so with revelations perceived through visions if a prophet was a countryman he saw visions of oxen cows and the like if he was a soldier he saw generals and armies if a courtier a royal throne and so on lastly prophecy varied according to the opinions held by the prophets for instance to the magi who believed in the follies of astrology the birth of christ was revealed through the vision of a star in the east to the augurs of nebuchadnezzar the destruction of jerusalem was revealed through entrails whereas the king himself inferred it from oracles and the direction of arrows which he shot into the air to prophets who believed that man acts from free choice and by his own power god was revealed as standing apart from and ignorant of future human actions all of this we will illustrate from scripture the first point is proved from the case of elisha who in order to prophesy to jehoram asked for a harp and was unable to perceive the divine purpose till he had been recreated by its music then indeed he prophesied to jehoram and to his allies glad tidings which previously he had been unable to attain to because he was angry with the king and those who are angry with any one can imagine evil of him but not good the theory that god does not reveal himself to the angry or the sad is a mere dream for god revealed to moses while angry the terrible slaughter of the first born and did so without the intervention of a harp to cain in his rage god was revealed and to ezekiel impatient with anger was revealed the contumacy and wretchedness of the jews jeremiah miserable and weary of life prophesied the disasters of the hebrews so that josiah would not consult him but inquired of a woman inasmuch as it was more in accordance with womanly nature that god should reveal his mercy thereto so micaiah never prophesied good to ahab though other true prophets had done so but invariably evil thus we see that individual prophets were by temperament more fitted for one sort of revelation than another the style of prophecy also varied according to the eloquence of the individual prophet the prophecies of ezekiel and amos are not written in a cultivated style like those of isaiah and nahum but more rudely any hebrew scholar who wishes to enquire into this point more closely and compares chapters of the different prophets treating of the same subject will find great dissimilarity of style compare for instance chapter 1 of the courtly isaiah verse 11 to verse 20 with chapter 5 of the countryman amos verses 21 to 24 compare also the order and reasoning of the prophecies of jeremiah written in idumea chapter 49 with the order and reasoning of obadiah compare lastly isaiah chapter 40 verses 19 and 20 and chapter 44 verse 8 with hosea chapter 8 verse 6 and chapter 13 verse 2 and so on a due consideration of these passage will clearly show us that god has no particular style in speaking but according to the learning and capacity of the prophet is cultivated compressed severe untutored prolix or obscure there was moreover a certain variation in the visions vouchsafed to the prophets and in the symbols by which they expressed them for isaiah saw the glory of the lord departing from the temple in a different form from that presented to ezekiel the rabbis indeed maintain that both visions were really the same but that ezekiel being a countryman was above measure impressed by it and therefore set it forth in full detail but unless there is a trustworthy tradition on the subject which i do not for a moment believe this theory is plainly an invention isaiah saw seraphim with six wings ezekiel beasts with four wings isaiah saw god clothed and sitting on a royal throne ezekiel saw him in the likeness of a fire each doubtless saw god under the form in which he usually imagined him further the visions varied in clearness as well as in details for the revelations of zechariah were too obscure to be understood by the prophet without explanation as appears from his narration of them the visions of daniel could not be understood by him 
even after they had been explained. And this obscurity did not arise from the difficulty of the matter revealed. For being merely human affairs, these only transcended human capacity in being future. But solely in the fact that Daniel's imagination was not so capable for prophecy while he was awake as while he was asleep. And this is further evident from the fact that at the very beginning of the vision he was so terrified that he almost despaired of his strength. Thus, on account of the inadequacy of his imagination and his strength, the things revealed were so obscure to him that he could not understand them even after they had been explained. Here we may note that the words heard by Daniel were, as we have shown above, simply imaginary. So that it is hardly wonderful that in his frightened state he imagined them so confusedly and obscurely that afterwards he could make nothing of them. Those who say that God did not wish to make a clear revelation do not seem to have read the words of the angel, who expressly say that he came to make the prophet understand what should befall his people in the latter days. Daniel chapter 10 verse 14. The revelation remained obscure because no one was found at that time with imagination sufficiently strong to conceive it more clearly. Lastly, the prophets to whom it was revealed that God would take away Elijah wished to persuade Elisha that he had been taken somewhere where they could find him, showing sufficiently clearly that they had not understood God's revelation aright. There is no need to set this out more amply, for nothing is more plain in the Bible than that God endowed some prophets with far greater gifts of prophecy than others. But I will show in greater detail and length, for I consider the point more important that the prophecies varied according to the opinions previously embraced by the prophets, and that the prophets held diverse and even contrary opinions and prejudices. I speak, be it understood, solely of matters speculative. For in regard to uprightness and morality, the case is widely different. From thence I shall conclude that prophecy never rendered the prophets more learned, but left them with their former opinions, and that we are, therefore, not at all bound to trust them in matters of intellect. Every one has been strangely hasty in affirming that the prophets knew everything within the scope of human intellect, and, although certain passages of Scripture plainly affirm, that the prophets were in certain respects ignorant. Such persons would rather say that they do not understand the passages than admit that there was anything which the prophets did not know, or else they try to wrest the scriptural words away from their evident meaning. If either of these proceedings is allowable, we may as well shut our Bibles, for vainly shall we attempt to prove anything from them if their plainest passages may be classed among obscure and impenetrable mysteries or if we may put an interpretation on them which we fancy. For instance, nothing is more clear in the Bible than that Joshua, and perhaps also the author who wrote his history, thought that the sun revolves around the earth, and that the earth is fixed, and further, that the sun for a certain period remains still. Many who will not admit any movement in the heavenly bodies explain away the passage till it seems to mean something quite different. Others who have learned to philosophize more correctly and understand that the earth moves while the sun is still, or at any rate it does not revolve round the earth, try with all their might to wrest this meaning from Scripture, though plainly nothing of the sort is intended. Such quibblers excite my wonder. Are we, forsooth, bound to believe that Joshua the soldier was a learned astronomer, or that a miracle could not be revealed to him? or that the light of the sun could not remain longer than usual above the horizon without his knowing the cause. To me both alternatives appear ridiculous, and therefore I would rather say that Joshua was ignorant of the true cause of the lengthened day, and that he and the whole host with him thought that the sun moved around the earth every day, and that on that particular occasion it stood still for a time, thus causing the light to remain longer. And I would say that they did not conjecture that from the amount of snow in the air, see Joshua chapter 10 verse 11, the refraction may have been greater than usual, or that there may have been some other cause which we will not now inquire into. So also the sign of the shadow going back was revealed to Isaiah, according to his understanding, that is, as proceeding from a going backwards of the sun. 
for he too thought that the sun moves and that the earth is still of parhelia he perhaps never even dreamed we may arrive at this conclusion without any scruple for the sign could really have come to pass and have been predicted by isaiah to the king without the prophet being aware of the real cause with regard to the building of the temple by solomon if it was really dictated by god we must maintain the same doctrine namely that all the measurements were revealed according to the opinions and understanding of the king for as we are not bound to believe that solomon was a mathematician we may affirm that he was ignorant of the true ratio between the circumference and the diameter of a circle and that like the generality of workmen he thought that it was as three to one but if it is allowable to declare that we do not understand the passage in good sooth i know nothing in the bible that we can understand for the process of building is there narrated simply and as a mere matter of history if again it is permitted to pretend that the passage has another meaning and was written as it is for some reason unknown to us this is no less than a complete subversal of the bible for every absurd and evil invention of human perversity could thus without detriment to scriptural authority be defended and fostered our conclusion is in no wise impious for though solomon isaiah joshua etc were prophets they were none the less men and as such not exempt from human shortcomings according to the understanding of noah it was revealed to him that god was about to destroy the whole human race for noah thought that beyond the limits of palestine the world was not inhabited not only in matters of this kind but in others more important the prophets could be and in fact were ignorant for they taught nothing special about the divine attributes but held quite ordinary notions about god and to these notions their revelations were adapted as i will demonstrate by ample scriptural testimony from all which one may easily see that they were praised and commended not so much for the sublimity and eminence of their intellect as for their piety and faithfulness adam the first man to whom god was revealed did not know that he is omnipotent and omniscient for he hid himself from him and attempted to make excuses for his fault before god as though he had had to do with a man therefore to him also was god revealed according to his understanding that is as being unaware of his situation or his sin for adam heard or seemed to hear the lord walking in the garden calling him and asking him where he was and then on seeing his shamefacedness asking him whether he had eaten of the forbidden fruit adam evidently only knows the deity as the creator of all things to cain also god was revealed according to his understanding as ignorant of human affairs nor was a higher conception of the deity required for repentance of a sin to laban the lord revealed himself as the god of abraham because laban believed that each nation had its own special divinity see genesis chapter 31 verse 29 abraham also knew not that god is omnipresent and has foreknowledge of all things for when he heard the sentence against the inhabitants of sodom he prayed that the lord should not execute it till he had ascertained whether they all merited such punishment for he said see genesis chapter 18 verse 24 per adventure there be 50 righteous within the city and in accordance with this belief god was revealed to him as abraham imagined he spake thus i will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it which has come unto me and if not i will know further the divine testimony concerning abraham asserts nothing but that he was obedient and that he commanded his household after him that they should keep the way of the lord genesis chapter 18 verse 19 it does not state that he held sublime conceptions of the deity moses also was not sufficiently aware that god is omniscient and directs human actions by his sole decree for although god himself says that the israelites should hearken to him moses still considered the matter doubtful and repeated but if they will not believe me nor hearken unto my voice to him in like manner god was revealed as taking no part in and as being ignorant of a future human actions the lord gave him two signs and said and it shall come to pass 
that if they will not believe thee, neither hearken to the voice of the first sign, that they will believe the voice of the latter sign. But if not, thou shalt take of the water of the river, etc. Indeed, if any one considers without prejudice the recorded opinions of Moses, he will plainly see that Moses conceived the deity as a being who has always existed, does exist, and always will exist. And for this cause he calls him by the name Jehovah, which in Hebrew signifies these three phases of existence. As to his nature, Moses only taught that he is merciful, gracious, and exceeding jealous, as appears from many passages in the Pentateuch. Lastly, he believed and taught that this being was so different from all other beings that he could not be expressed by the image of any visible thing. Also, that he could not be looked upon, and that not so much from inherent impossibility as from human infirmity. Further, that by reason of his power, he was without equal and unique. Moses admitted indeed that there were beings, doubtless by the plan and command of the Lord, who acted as God's vicegerents, that is, beings to whom God had given the right, authority and power to direct nations and to provide and care for them. But he taught that this being whom they were bound to obey was the highest and supreme God, or, to use the Hebrew phrase, God of gods, and thus in the song, Exodus chapter 15 verse 11, he exclaims, Who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods? And Jethro says, Exodus chapter 18 verse 11, Now I know that the Lord is greater than all gods. That is to say, I am at length compelled to admit to Moses that Jehovah is greater than all gods and that his power is unrivaled. We must remain in doubt whether Moses thought that these beings who acted as God's vicegerents were created by him, for he has stated nothing, so far as we know, about their creation and origin. He further taught that this being had brought the visible world into order from chaos, and had given nature her germs, and therefore that he possesses supreme right and power over all things. Further, that by reason of his supreme right and power, he had chosen for himself alone the Hebrew nation and a certain strip of territory, and had handed over to the care of other gods substituted by himself the rest of the nations and territories, and that therefore he was called God of Israel and the God of Jerusalem, whereas the other gods were called the gods of the Gentiles. For this reason the Jews believed that the strip of territory which God had chosen for himself demanded a divine worship quite apart and different from the worship which obtained elsewhere, and that the Lord would not suffer the worship of other gods adapted to other countries. Thus they thought that the people whom the king of Assyria had brought into Judea were torn in pieces by lions because they knew not the worship of the national divinity. Second Kings chapter 17 verse 25 Jacob, according to Abin Ezra's opinion, therefore admonished his sons when he wished them to seek out a new country, that they should prepare themselves for a new worship, and lay aside the worship of strange gods, that is, of the gods of the land where they were. Genesis chapter 35 verses 2 and 3. David, in telling Saul that he was compelled by the king's persecution to live away from his country, said that he was driven out from the heritage of the Lord and sent to worship other gods. 1 Samuel chapter 26 verse 19. Lastly, he believed that this being or deity had his habitation in the heavens. Deuteronomy chapter 33 verse 27, an opinion very common among the Gentiles. If we now examine the revelations to Moses, we shall find that they were accommodated to these opinions, as he believed that the divine nature was subject to the conditions of mercy graciousness, etc. So God was revealed to him in accordance with his idea and under these attributes. See Exodus chapter 34 verses 6 and 7 and the second commandment. Further, it is related, Exodus chapter 33 verse 18, that Moses asked of God that he might behold him. But as Moses, as we have said, had formed no mental image of God, and God, as I have shown, only revealed himself to the prophet's in accordance with the disposition of their imagination, he did not reveal himself in any form. This, I repeat, 
was because the imagination of Moses was unsuitable, for other prophets bear witness that they saw the Lord. For instance, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, etc. For this reason God answered Moses, Thou canst not see my face. And inasmuch as Moses believed that God can be looked upon, that is, that no contradiction of the divine nature is therein involved, for otherwise he would never have preferred his request, it is added, for no one shall look on me and live, thus giving a reason in accordance with Moses' idea, for it is not stated that a contradiction of the divine nature would be involved, as was really the case, but that the thing would not come to pass because of human infirmity. When God would reveal to Moses that the Israelites, because they worshipped the calf, were to be placed in the same category as other nations, he said, chapter 33, verses 2 and 3, that he would send an angel, that is, a being who should have charge of the Israelites instead of the supreme being, and that he himself would no longer remain among them, thus leaving Moses no ground for supposing that the Israelites were more beloved by God than the other nations whose guardianship he had entrusted to other beings or angels. Vida verse 16. Lastly, as Moses believed that God dwelt in the heavens, God was revealed to him as coming down from the heaven onto a mountain, and in order to talk with the Lord, Moses went up the mountain, which he certainly need not have done if he could have conceived of God as omnipresent. The Israelites knew scarcely anything of God although he was revealed to them. And this is abundantly evident from their transferring, a few days afterwards, the honour and worship due to him to a calf, which they believed to be the God who had brought them out of Egypt. In truth, it is hardly likely that men accustomed to the superstitions of Egypt, uncultivated and sunk in most abject slavery, should have held any sound notions about the deity or that Moses should have taught them anything beyond a rule of right living, inculcating it not like a philosopher as a result of freedom, but like a lawgiver, compelling them to be moral by legal authority. Thus the rule of right living, the worship and love of God, was to them rather a bondage than the true liberty, the gift and grace of the deity. Moses bid them love God and keep his law, because they had in the past received benefits from him, such as the deliverance from slavery in Egypt, and further terrified them with threats if they transgressed his commands, holding out many promises of good if they should observe them, thus treating them as parents treat irrational children. It is therefore certain that they knew not the excellence of virtue and the true happiness. Jonah thought that he was fleeing from the sight of God, which seems to show that he too held that God had entrusted the care of the nations outside Judea to other substituted powers. No one in the whole of the Old Testament speaks more rationally of God than Solomon, who in fact surpassed all the men of his time in natural ability. Yet he considered himself about the law, esteeming it only to have been given for men without reasonable and intellectual grounds for their actions, and made small account of the laws concerning kings which are mainly three. Nay, he openly violated them. In this he did wrong, and acted in a manner unworthy of a philosopher, by indulging in sensual pleasure, and taught that all fortune's favours to mankind are vanity, that humanity has no nobler gift than wisdom, and no greater punishment than folly. See Proverbs chapter 16, verses 22 and 23. But let us return to the prophets whose conflicting opinions we have undertaken to note. The expressed idea of Ezekiel seems so diverse from those of Moses to the rabbis who have left us the extant prophetic books, as is told in the treatise of Sabbathus, chapter 1, verses 13 and 2, that they had serious thoughts of omitting his prophecy from the canon, and would doubtless have thus excluded it if a certain Hananiah had not undertaken to explain it a task which, as is there narrated, he with great zeal and labour accomplished. How he did so does not sufficiently appear, whether it was by writing a commentary, which has now perished, or by altering Ezekiel's words and audaciously striking out phrases according to his fancy. However this may be, chapter 18 certainly does not seem to agree with Exodus chapter 34, 
verse 7, Jeremiah chapter 32, verse 18, etc. Samuel believed that the Lord never repented of anything he had decreed. 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 29. For when Saul was sorry for his sin and wished to worship God and ask for forgiveness, Samuel said that the Lord would not go back from his decree. To Jeremiah, on the other hand, it was revealed that if that nation against whom I, the Lord, have pronounced turn from their evil, I will repent of the evil that I thought to do unto them. If it do evil in my sight, and that it obey not my voice, then I will repent of the good wherewith I said I would benefit them. Jeremiah chapter 28 verses 8 to 10. Joel chapter 2 verse 13 taught that the Lord repented him only of evil. Lastly, it is clear from Genesis chapter 4 verse 7 that a man can overcome the temptations of sin and act righteously, for this doctrine is told to Cain, though as we learn from Josephus and the scriptures, he never did so overcome them. And this agrees with the chapter of Jeremiah thus cited, for it is there said that the Lord repents of the good or evil pronounced, if the men in question change their ways and manner of life. But, on the other hand, Paul, Romans chapter 9 verse 10, teaches as plainly as possible that men have no control over the temptations of the flesh, save by the special vocation and grace of God. And when, Romans chapter 3 verse 5 and chapter 6 verse 19, he attributes righteousness to man, he corrects himself as speaking merely humanly and through the infirmity of the flesh. We have now more than sufficiently proved our point that God adapted revelations to the understanding and opinions of the prophets, and that in matters of theory, without bearing on charity or morality, the prophets could be, and in fact were ignorant, and held conflicting opinions. It therefore follows that we must by no means go to the prophets for knowledge, either of natural or of spiritual phenomena. We have determined then that we are only bound to believe in the prophetic writings the object and substance of the revelation with regard to the details every one may believe or not as he likes for instance the revelation to cain only teaches us that god admonished him to lead the true life for such alone is the object and substance of the revelation not doctrines concerning free will and philosophy hence though the freedom of the will is clearly implied in the words of the admonition we are at liberty to hold a contrary opinion since the words and reasons were adapted to the understanding of Cain. So too, the revelation to Micaiah would only teach that God revealed to him the true issue of the battle between Ahab and Aram. And this is all we are bound to believe. Whatever else is contained in the revelation concerning the true and the false spirit of God, the army of heaven standing on the right hand and on the left, and all the other details, does not affect us at all. Everyone may believe as much of it as his reason allows. The reasonings by which the Lord displayed his power to Job, if they really were a revelation, and the author of the history is narrating, and not merely, as some suppose, rhetorically adorning his own conceptions, would come under the same category. That is, they were adapted to Job's understanding for the purpose of convincing him and are not universal, or for the convincing of all men we can come to no different conclusion with respect to the reasonings of Christ, by which he convicted the Pharisees of pride and ignorance and exhorted his disciples to lead the true life. He adapted them to each man's opinions and principles. For instance, when he said to the Pharisees, Matthew chapter 12 verse 26, And if Satan cast out devils, his house is divided against itself, how then shall his kingdom stand? He only wished to convince the Pharisees according to their own principles, not to teach that there are devils or any kingdom of devils. So too when he said to his disciples, Matthew chapter 8 verse 10, See that ye despise not one of these little ones, for I say unto you that they are angels, etc. He merely desired to warn them against pride and despising any of their fellows, not to insist on the actual reason given, which was simply adopted in order to persuade them more easily. Lastly, we should say exactly the same of the apostolic signs and reasonings, but there is no need to go further into the subject. If I were to enumerate all the passages of Scripture addressed only to individuals, 
or to a particular man's understanding, and which cannot, without great danger to philosophy, be defended as divine doctrines, I should go far beyond the brevity at which I aim. Let it suffice then to have indicated a few instances of general application, and let the curious reader consider others by himself. Although the points we have just raised concerning prophets and prophecy are the only ones which have any direct bearing on the end in view, namely the separation of philosophy from theology, still, as I have touched on the general question, I may here inquire whether the gift of prophecy was peculiar to the Hebrews or whether it was common to all nations. I must then come to a conclusion about the vocation of the Hebrews, all of which I shall do in the ensuing chapter. End of section 2. Read for you by Chiquito Crasto, Birmingham, Alabama. Section 3 of A Theological Political Treatise by Baruch Benedict de Spinoza. Translated by Robert Harvey Monroe Elvis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read for you by Chiquito Crasto. Chapter 3. Of the Vocation of the Hebrews and Whether the Gift of Prophecy was Peculiar to Them. Every man's true happiness and blessedness consists solely in the enjoyment of what is good, not in the pride that he alone is enjoying it, to the exclusion of others. He who thinks himself the more blessed because he is enjoying benefits which others are not, or because he is more blessed or more fortunate than his fellows, is ignorant of true happiness and blessedness, and the joy which he feels is either childish or envious and malicious. For instance, a man's true happiness consists only in wisdom, and the knowledge of the truth, not at all in the fact that he is wiser than others, or that others lack such knowledge. Such considerations do not increase his wisdom or true happiness. Whoever, therefore, rejoices for such reasons rejoices in another's misfortune, and is so far malicious and bad, knowing neither true happiness nor the peace of the true life. When Scripture, therefore, is exhorting the Hebrews to obey the law, says that the law has chosen them for himself before other nations, Deuteronomy chapter 10 verse 15, that he is near them, but not near others, Deuteronomy chapter 4 verse 7, that to them alone he has given just laws, Deuteronomy chapter 4 verse 8, and lastly, that he has marked them out before the others, Deuteronomy chapter 4 verse 32. It speaks only according to the understanding of its hearers, who, as we have shown in the last chapter, and as Moses also testifies, Deuteronomy chapter 9 verses 6 and 7, knew not true blessedness. For in good sooth they would have been no less blessed if God had called all men equally to salvation, nor would God have been less present to them for being equally present to others. Their laws would have been no less just if they had been ordained for all, and they themselves would have been no less wise. The miracles would have shown God's power no less by being wrought for other nations also. Lastly, the Hebrews would have been just as much bound to worship God if he had bestowed all these gifts equally on all men. When God tells Solomon, 1 Kings chapter 3 verse 12, that no one shall be as wise as he in time to come, it seems to be only a matter of expressing surpassing wisdom. It is little to be believed that God would have promised Solomon for his greater happiness that he would never endow any one with so much wisdom in time to come. This would in no wise have increased Solomon's intellect, and the wise king would have given equal thanks to the Lord if every one had been gifted with the same faculties. Still, though we assert that Moses, in the passages of the Pentateuch, just cited, spoke only according to the understanding of the Hebrews, we have no wish to deny that God ordained the Mosaic law for them alone, nor that he spoke to them alone, nor that they witnessed marvels beyond those which happened to any other nation. But we wish to emphasize that Moses desired to admonish the Hebrews in such a manner, and with such reasoning as would appeal most forcibly to their childish understanding, and constrain them to worship the deity. 
Further, we wish to show that the Hebrews did not surpass other nations in knowledge or in piety, but evidently in some attribute different from these, or, to speak like the Scriptures, according to their understanding, that the Hebrews were not chosen by God before others for the sake of the true life and sublime ideas, though they were often thereto admonished, but with some other object. What that object was, I will duly show. But before I begin, I wish in a few words to explain what I mean by the guidance of God, by the help of God, external and inward, and lastly, what I understand by fortune. By the help of God, I mean the fixed and unchangeable order of nature, or the chain of natural events. For I have said before, and shown elsewhere, that the universal laws of nature according to which all things exist and are determined, are only another name for the eternal decrees of God, which always involve eternal truth and necessity. So that to say that everything happens according to natural laws, and to say that everything is ordained by the decree and ordinance of God, is the same thing. Now, since the power in nature is identical with the power of God, by which alone all things happen and are determined, it follows that whatsoever man as a part of nature provides himself with to aid and preserve his existence, or whatsoever nature affords him without his help, is given to him solely by the divine power, acting either through human nature or through the external circumstance. So, whatever human nature can furnish itself with by its own efforts to preserve its existence may be fitly called the inward aid of God whereas whatever else accrues to man's profit from outward causes may be called the external aid of God. We can now understand what is meant by the election of God. For since no one can do anything save by the predetermined order of nature, that is by God's eternal ordinance and decree, it follows that no one can choose a plan of life for himself or accomplish any work save by God's vocation choosing him for the work or the plan of life in question, rather than any other. Lastly, by fortune, I mean the ordinance of God in so far as it directs human life through external and unexpected means. With these preliminaries, I return to my purpose of discovering the reason why the Hebrews were said to be elected by God before other nations, and with the demonstration I thus proceed. All objects of legitimate desire fall, generally speaking, under one of these three categories. 1. The knowledge of things through their primary causes. 2. The government of the passions or the acquirement of the habit of virtue. 3. Secure and healthy life. The means which most directly conduce towards the first two of these ends, and which may be considered their proximate and efficient causes, are contained in human nature itself so that their acquisition hinges only on our own power and on the laws of human nature. It may be concluded that these gifts are not peculiar to any nation, but have always been shared by the whole human race, unless indeed we would indulge the dream that nature formerly created men of different kinds. But the means which conduce to security and health are chiefly in external circumstances and are called the gifts of fortune because they depend chiefly on objective causes of which we are ignorant. For a fool may be almost as liable to happiness or unhappiness as a wise man. Nevertheless, human management and watchfulness can greatly assist towards living in security and warding off the injuries of our fellow men and even of beasts. Reason and experience show no more certain means of attaining this object than the formation of a society with fixed laws the occupation of a strip of territory, and the concentration of all forces, as it were, into one body, that is, the social body. Now, for forming and preserving a society, no ordinary ability and care is required. That society will be most secure, most stable, and least liable to reverses, which is founded and directed by far-seeing and careful men. While, on the other hand, a society constituted by men without trained skill, depends in a great measure on fortune and is less constant. If, in spite of all, such society lasts a long time, it is owing to some other directing influence than its own. 
if it overcomes great perils and its affairs prosper it will perforce marvel at and adore the guiding spirit of god in so far that is as god works through hidden means and not through the nature and mind of man for everything happens to it unexpectedly and contrary to anticipation it may even be said and thought to be by miracle nations then are distinguished from one another in respect to the social organization and laws under which they live and are governed the hebrew nation was not chosen by god in respect to its wisdom nor its tranquillity of mind but in respect to its social organization and the good fortune with which it obtained supremacy and kept it so many years this is abundantly clear from scripture even a cursory perusal will show us that the only respects in which the hebrews surpassed other nations are in their successful conduct of matters relating to government and in their surmounting great perils solely by god's external aid in other ways they were on a par with their fellows and god was equally gracious to all for in respect to intellect as we have shown in the last chapter they held very ordinary ideas about god and nature so that they cannot have been god's chosen in this respect nor were they so chosen in respect of virtue and true life for here again they with the exception of a very few elect were on an equality with other nations therefore their choice and vocation consisted only in the temporal happiness and advantages of independent rule in fact we do not see that god promised anything beyond this to the patriarchs or their successors in the law no other reward is offered for obedience than the continual happiness of an independent commonwealth and other goods of this life while on the other hand against contumacy and the breaking of the covenant is threatened the downfall of the commonwealth and great hardships nor is this to be wondered at for the ends of every social organization and commonwealth are as appears from what we have said and as we will explain more at length hereafter security and comfort a commonwealth can only exist by the laws being binding on all if all the members of a state wish to disregard the law by that very fact they dissolve the state and destroy the commonwealth thus the only reward which could be promised to the hebrews for continued obedience to the law was security and its attendant advantages while no surer punishment could be threatened for disobedience than the ruin of the state and the evils which generally follow therefrom in addition to such further consequences as might accrue to the jews in particular from the ruin of their special state but there is no need to go into this point at more length i will only add that the laws of the old testament were revealed and ordained to the jews only for as god chose them in respect to the special constitution of their society and government they must of course have had special laws whether god ordained special laws for other nations also and revealed himself to their lawgivers prophetically that is under the attributes by which the latter were accustomed to imagine him i cannot sufficiently determine it is evident from scripture itself that other nations acquired supremacy and particular laws by the external aid of god witness only the two following passages in genesis chapter 14 verses 18 19 and 20 it is related that melchizedek was king of jerusalem and priest of the most high god that in exercise of his priestly functions he blessed abraham and that abraham the beloved of the lord gave to this priest of god a tithe of all his spoils this sufficiently shows that before he founded the israelitish nation god constituted kings and priests in jerusalem and ordained for them rites and laws whether he did so prophetically is as i have said not sufficiently clear but i am sure of this that abraham while he sojourned in the city lived scrupulously according to these laws for abraham had received no special rights from god and yet it is stated genesis chapter 26 verse 5 that he observed the worship the precepts the statutes and the laws of god which must be interpreted to mean the worship the statutes the precepts and the laws of king melchizedek malachi chides the jews as follows chapter 1 verses 10 and 11 
who is there among you that will shut the doors of the temple neither do ye kindle fire on mine altar for naught i have no pleasure in you saith the lord of hosts for from the rising of the sun even until the going down of the same my name shall be great among the gentiles and in every place incense shall be offered in my name and a pure offering for my name is great among the heathen saith the lord of hosts these words which unless we do violence to them could only refer to the current period abundantly testify that the jews of that time were not more beloved by god than other nations that god then favoured other nations with more miracles than he vouchsafed to the jews who had then partly recovered their empire without miraculous aid and lastly that the gentiles possessed rites and ceremonies acceptable to god but i pass over these points lightly it is enough for my purpose to have shown that the election of the jews had regard to nothing but temporal physical happiness and freedom in other words autonomous government and to the manner and means by which they obtained it consequently to the laws in so far as they were necessary to the preservation of that special government and lastly to the manner in which they were revealed in regard to other matters wherein man's true happiness consists they were on a par with the rest of the nations when therefore it is said in scripture deuteronomy chapter 4 verse 7 that the lord is not so nigh to any other nation as he is to the jews reference is only made to their government and to the period when so many miracles happened to them for in respect of intellect and virtue that is in respect of blessedness god was as we have already said and are now demonstrating equally gracious to all scripture itself bears testimony to this fact for the psalmist says in one hundred and forty five verse eighteen the lord is near unto all of them that call upon him to all that call upon him in truth so in the same psalm verse nine the lord is good to all and his tender mercies are over all his works in psalm thirty three verse fifteen it is clearly stated that god has granted to all men the same intellect in these words he fashioneth their hearts alike the heart was considered by the hebrews as i suppose every one knows to be the seat of the soul and the intellect lastly from job chapter thirty eight verse twenty eight it is plain that god had ordained for the whole human race the law to reverence god to keep from evil doing or to do well and that job although a gentile was of all men more acceptable to god because he excelled all in piety and religion lastly from jonah chapter four verse two it is very evident that not only to the jews but to all men god was gracious merciful long-suffering and of great goodness and repented him of the evil for jonah says therefore i determined to flee before unto tarshish for i know that thou art a gracious god and merciful slow to anger and of great kindness etc and that therefore god would pardon the ninevites we conclude therefore inasmuch as god is to all men equally gracious and the hebrews were only chosen by him in respect to their social organization and government that the individual jew taken apart from his social organization and government possessed no gift of god above other men and that there was no difference between jew and gentile as it is a fact that god is equally gracious merciful and the rest to all men and as the function of the prophet was to teach men not so much the laws of their country as true virtue and to exhort them thereto it is not to be doubted that all nations possessed prophets and that the prophetic gift was not peculiar to the jews indeed history both profane and sacred bears witness to the fact although from the sacred histories of the old testament it is not evident that the other nations had as many prophets as the hebrews or that any gentile prophet was expressly sent by god to the nations this does not affect the question for the hebrews were careful to record their own affairs not those of other nations it suffers then that we find in the old testament gentiles and uncircumcised as noah enoch abimelech balaam etc exercising prophetic gifts further that hebrew prophets were sent by god not only to their own nation but to many others also 
Ezekiel prophesied to all nations then known, Obadiah to none that we are aware of, save the Idumeans, and Jonah was chiefly the prophet of the Ninevites. Isaiah bewails and predicts the calamities and hails the restoration not only of the Jews but also of other nations, for he says, chapter 16, verse 9, Therefore I will bewail Jazer with weeping, and in chapter 19 he foretells first the calamities and then the restoration of the Egyptians, see verses 19, 20, 21, and 25, saying that God shall send them a saviour to free them, that the Lord shall be known in Egypt, and further, that the Egyptians shall worship God with sacrifice and oblation, and at last he calls that nation the blessed Egyptian people of God, all of which particulars are especially noteworthy. Jeremiah is called not the prophet of the Hebrew nation, but simply the prophet of the nations. See Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 5. He also mournfully foretells the calamities of the nations and predicts their restoration, for he says, chapter 48 verse 31, of the Moabites, Therefore I will howl for Moab, and I will cry out for all Moab, verse 36, and therefore mine heart shall sound for Moab like pipes. In the end he prophesies their restoration, as also the restoration of the Egyptians, Ammonites, and Elamites. Therefore it is beyond doubt that other nations also, like the Jews, had their prophets who prophesied to them. Although Scripture only makes mention of one man, Balaam, to whom the future of the Jews and the other nations was revealed, we must not suppose that Balaam prophesied only that once, for from the narrative itself it is abundantly clear that he had long previously been famous for prophecy and other divine gifts. For when Balak bade him come to him, he said, Numbers chapter 22 verse 6, For I wot that he whom thou blessed is blessed, and he whom thou cursest is cursed. Thus we see that he possessed the gifts which God had bestowed on Abraham. Further, as accustomed to prophecy, Balaam bade the messengers wait for him till the will of the Lord was revealed to him. When he prophesied, that is, when he interpreted the true mind of God, he was wont to say this of himself. He had said which heard the words of God and knew the knowledge of the Most High, which saw the vision of the Almighty falling into a trance, but having his eyes open. Further, after he had blessed the Hebrews by the command of God, he began, as was his custom, to prophesy to other nations and to predict their future, all of which abundantly shows that he had always been a prophet, or had often prophesied, and, as we may also remark here, possess that which afforded the chief certainty to prophets of the truth of their prophecy, namely, a mind turned wholly to what is right and good. For he did not bless those whom he wished to bless, nor curse those whom he wished to curse, as Balak supposed, but only those whom God wished to be blessed or cursed. Thus he answered Balak, If Balak should give me his house full of silver and gold, I cannot go beyond the commandment of the Lord to do either good or bad of my own mind, but what the Lord saith, that will I speak. As for God being angry with him in the way, the same happened to Moses, when he set out to Egypt by the command of the Lord, and as to his receiving money for prophesying, Samuel did the same. 1 Samuel chapter 9, verses 7 and 8. If in any way he sinned, there is not a just man upon earth that doeth good and sinneth not. Ecclesiastes chapter 7 verse 20. Vida, second epistle of Peter chapter 2 verses 15 and 16. And Jude verses 5 and 11. His speeches must certainly have had much weight with God, and his power for cursing must assuredly have been very great from the number of times that we find stated in Scripture in proof of God's great mercy to the Jews, that God would not hear Balaam, and that he changed the cursing to blessing. See Deuteronomy chapter 23 verse 6, Joshua chapter 24 verse 10, Nehemiah chapter 13 verse 2. Therefore he was without doubt most acceptable to God, for the speeches and cursings of the wicked move God not at all. 
as then he was a true prophet and nevertheless joshua calls him a soothsayer or augur it is certain that this title had an honourable signification and that those whom the gentiles called augurs and soothsayers were true prophets while those whom scripture often accuses and condemns were false soothsayers who deceived the gentiles as false prophets deceived the jews indeed this is made evident from other passages in the bible whence we conclude that the gift of prophecy was not peculiar to the jews but common to all nations the pharisees however vehemently contend that this divine gift was peculiar to their nation and that the other nations foretold the future what will superstition invent next by some unexplained diabolical faculty the principal passage of scripture which they cite by way of confirming their theory with its authority is exodus chapter thirty three verse sixteen where moses says to god for wherein shall it be known here that i and thy people have found grace in thy sight is it not in that thou goest with us so shall we be separated i and thy people from all the people that are upon the face of the earth from this they would infer that moses asked of god that he should be present to the jews and should reveal himself to them prophetically further that he should grant this favour to no other nation it is surely absurd that moses should have been jealous of god's presence among the gentiles or that he should have dared to ask any such thing the fact is as moses knew that the disposition and spirit of his nation was rebellious he clearly saw that they could not carry out what they had begun without very great miracles and special external aid from god nay that without such aid they must necessarily perish as it was evident that god wished them to be preserved he asked for this special external aid thus he says exodus chapter thirty four verse nine if now i have found grace in thy sight o lord let my lord i pray thee go among us for it is a stiff-necked people the reason therefore for his seeking special external aid from god was the stiff-neckedness of the people and it is made still more plain that he asked for nothing beyond this special external aid by god's answer for god answered at once verse ten of the same chapter behold i made a covenant before all thy people i will do marvels such as have not been done in all the earth nor in any nation therefore moses had in view nothing beyond the special election of the jews as i have explained it and made no other request to god i confess that in paul's epistle to the romans i find another text which carries more weight namely where paul seems to teach a different doctrine from that set down for he there says romans chapter three verse one what advantage then hath the jew or what profit it there of circumcision much every way chiefly because that unto them were committed the oracles of god but if we look to the doctrine which paul especially desired to teach we shall find nothing repugnant to your present contention on the contrary his doctrine is the same as ours for he says in romans chapter three verse twenty nine that god is the god of the jews and of the gentiles and chapter two verses twenty five and twenty six but if thou be a breaker of the law thy circumcision is made uncircumcision therefore if the uncircumcision keep the righteousness of the law shall not his uncircumcision be counted for circumcision further in chapter four verse nine he says that all alike jew and gentile were under sin and that without commandment and law there is no sin wherefore it is most evident that to all men absolutely was revealed the law under which all lived namely the law which has regard only to true virtue not the law established in respect to and in the formation of a particular state and adapted to the disposition of a particular people lastly paul concludes that since god is the god of all nations that is is equally gracious to all and since all men equally live under the law and under sin so also to all nations did god send his christ to free all men equally from the bondage of the law that they should no more do right by the command of the law but by the constant determination of their hearts so that paul teaches exactly the same as ourselves 
when therefore he says to the jews only were entrusted the oracles of god we must either understand that to them only were the laws entrusted in writing while they were given to other nations merely in revelation and conception or else as none but jews would object to the doctrine he desired to advance that paul was answering only in accordance with the understanding and current ideas of the jews for in respect to teaching things which he had partly seen partly heard he was to the greeks a greek and to the jews a jew it now only remains for us to answer the arguments of those who would persuade themselves that the election of the jews was not temporal and merely in respect of their commonwealth but eternal for they say we see the jews after the loss of their commonwealth and after being scattered so many years and separated from all other nations still surviving which is without parallel among other peoples and further the scriptures seem to teach that god has chosen for himself the jews for ever so that though they have lost their commonwealth they still nevertheless remain god's elect the passages which they think teach most clearly this eternal election are chiefly one jeremiah chapter thirty one verse thirty six where the prophet testifies that the seed of israel shall for ever remain the nation of god comparing them with the stability of the heavens and nature two ezekiel chapter twenty verse thirty two where the prophet seems to intend that though the jews wanted after the help afforded them to turn their backs on the worship of the lord that god would nevertheless gather them together again from all the lands in which they were dispersed and lead them to the wilderness of the peoples as he had led their fathers to the wilderness of the land of egypt and would at length after purging out from among them the rebels and transgressors bring them thence to his holy mountain where the whole house of israel would worship him other passages are also cited especially by the pharisees but i think i shall satisfy every one if i answer these two and this i shall easily accomplish after showing from scripture itself that god chose not the hebrews for ever but only on the condition under which he had formerly chosen the canaanites for the last as we have shown had priests who religiously worshipped god and whom god at length rejected because of their luxury pride and corrupt worship moses leviticus chapter eighteen verse twenty seven warned the israelites that they be not polluted with whoredoms lest the land spew them out as it had spewed out the nations who had dwelt there before and in deuteronomy chapter eight verses nineteen and twenty in the plainest terms he threatens their total ruin for he says i testify against you that ye shall surely perish as the nations which the lord destroyeth before you face so shall ye perish in like manner many other passages are found in the law which expressly show that god chose the hebrews neither absolutely nor for ever if then the prophets foretold for them a new covenant of the knowledge of god love and grace such a promise is easily proved to be only made to the elect for ezekiel in the chapter which we have just quoted expressly says that god will separate from them the rebellious and transgressors and zephaniah chapter three verses twelve and thirteen says that god will take away the proud from the midst of them and leave the poor now inasmuch as their election has regard to true virtue it is not to be thought that it was promised to the jews alone to the exclusion of others but we must evidently believe that the true gentile prophets and every nation as we have shown possess such promised the same to the faithful of their own people who were thereby comforted wherefore this eternal covenant of the knowledge of god and love is universal as is clear moreover from zephaniah chapter three verses ten and eleven no difference in this respect can be admitted between jew and gentile nor did the former enjoy any special election beyond that which we have pointed out when the prophets in speaking of this election which regards only true virtue mixed up much concerning sacrifices and ceremonies and the rebuilding of the temple and city they wished by such figurative expression after the manner and nature of prophecy to expound matters spiritual so as at the same time to show to the jews whose prophets they were the true restoration of the state and of the temple to be expected about the time of cyrus 
At the present time, therefore, there is absolutely nothing which the Jew can arrogate to themselves beyond other people. As to their continuance so long after dispersion and the loss of empire, there is nothing marvellous in it, for they so separated themselves from every other nation as to draw down upon themselves universal hate, not only by their outward rights, rights conflicting with those of other nations, but also by the sign of circumcision which they most scrupulously observe. That they have been preserved in great measure by Gentile hatred, experience demonstrates. When the king of Spain formally compelled the Jews to embrace the state religion or go into exile, a large number of Jews accepted Catholicism. Now as these renegades were admitted to all the native privileges of Spaniards and deemed worthy of filling all honourable offices, it came to pass that they straightway became so intermingled with the Spaniards as to leave of themselves no relic or remembrance. But exactly the opposite happened to those whom the king of Portugal compelled to become Christians, for they always, though converted, lived apart, inasmuch as they were considered unworthy of any civic honours. The sign of circumcision is, as I think, so important that I could persuade myself that it alone would preserve the nation for ever. Nay, I would go so far as to believe that if the foundations of their religion have not emasculated their minds, they may even, if occasion offers, so changeable our human affairs, raise up their empire afresh, and that God may a second time elect them. Of such a possibility we have a very famous example in the Chinese. They too have some distinctive mark on their heads, which they most scrupulously observe, and by which they keep themselves apart from every one else, and have thus kept themselves during so many thousand years that they far surpass all other nations in antiquity. They have not always retained empire, but they have recovered it when lost, and doubtless will do so again after the spirit of the Tartars becomes relaxed through the luxury of riches and pride. Lastly, if any one wishes to maintain that the Jews from this or from any other cause have been chosen by God for ever, I will not gainsay him if he will admit that this choice, whether temporary or eternal, has no regard, in so far as it is peculiar to the Jews, to aught but dominion and physical advantages, for by such alone can one nation be distinguished from another. Whereas in regard to intellect and true virtue, every nation is on a par with the rest, and God has not in these respects chosen one people rather than another. End of section 3 Read for you by Chiquito Crasto, Birmingham, Alabama Section 4 of A Theological Political Treatise by Baruch Benedict de Spinoza. Translated by Robert Harvey Monroe Elvis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read for you by Chiquito Crasto. Chapter 4 of The Divine Law. The word law, taken in the abstract, means that by which an individual, or all things, or as many things as belong to a particular species, act in one and the same fixed and definite manner, which manner depends either on natural necessity or on human decree. A law which depends on natural necessity is one which necessarily follows from the nature or from the definition of the thing in question. A law which depends on human decree, and which is more correctly called an ordinance, is one which men have laid down for themselves and others in order to live more safely or conveniently or from some similar reason. For example, the law that all bodies impinging on lesser bodies lose as much of their own motion as they communicate to the latter is a universal law of all bodies, and depends on natural necessity. So too, the law that a man in remembering one thing straightaway remembers another either like it or which he had perceived simultaneously with it is a law which necessarily follows from the nature of man. But the law that men must yield or be compelled to yield somewhat of their natural right, and that they bind themselves to live in a certain way, depends on human decree. Now, though I freely admit that all things are predetermined by universal natural laws to exist and operate in a given fixed and definite manner, I still assert that the laws I have just mentioned depend on human decree. 
1. Because man, in so far as he is a part of nature, constitutes a part of the power of nature. Whatever, therefore, follows necessarily from the necessity of human nature, that is, from nature herself, in so far as we conceive of her as acting through man, follows, even though it be necessarily from human power. Hence the sanction of such laws may very well be said to depend on man's decree, for it principally depends on the power of the human mind, so that the human mind in respect to its perception of things as true and false can readily be conceived as without such laws, but not without necessarily law as we have just defined it. 2. I have stated that these laws depend on human decree, because it is well to define and explain things by their proximate causes. The general consideration of fate and the concatenation of causes would aid us very little in forming and arranging our ideas concerning particular questions. Let us add that, as to the actual coordination and concatenation of things, that is how things are ordained and linked together. We are obviously ignorant. Therefore, it is more profitable for right living, nay, it is necessary for us to consider things as contingent. So much about law in the abstract. Now the word law seems to be only applied to natural phenomena by analogy, and is commonly taken to signify a command which men can either obey or neglect, inasmuch as it restrains human nature within certain originally exceeded limits, and therefore lays down no rule beyond human strength. Thus it is expedient to define law more particularly as a plan of life laid down by man for himself or others with a certain object. However, as the true object of legislation is only perceived by a few, and most men are almost incapable of grasping it, though they live under its conditions, legislators, with a view to exacting general obedience, have wisely put forward another object, very different from that which necessarily follows from the nature of law. They promise to the observers of the law that which the masses chiefly desire, and threaten its violators with that which they chiefly fear, thus endeavouring to restrain the masses, as far as may be, like a horse with a curb. Whence it follows that the word law is chiefly applied to the modes of life enjoined on men by the sway of others. Hence, those who obey the law are said to live under it and to be under compulsion. In truth, a man who renders every one their due because he fears the gallows acts under the sway and compulsion of others and cannot be called just. But a man who does the same from a knowledge of the true reason for laws and their necessity acts from a firm purpose and of his own accord and is therefore properly called just. This I take it is Paul's meaning when he says that those who live under the law cannot be justified through law. For justice, as commonly defined, is the constant and perpetual will to render every man his due. Thus Solomon says, Proverbs chapter 21, verse 15, It is a joy to the just to do judgment, but the wicked fear. Law, then being a plan of living which men have for a certain object laid down for themselves or others, may, as it seems, be divided into human law and divine law. By human law I mean a plan of living which serves only to render life and the state secure. By divine law I mean that which only regard the highest good, in other words, the true knowledge of God and love. I call this law divine because of the nature of the highest good, which I will here shortly explain as clearly as I can. Inasmuch as the intellect is the best part of our being, it is evident that we should make every effort to perfect it as far as possible, if we desire to search for what is really profitable to us. For in intellectual perfection, the highest good should consist. Now since all our knowledge and the certainty which removes every doubt depends solely on the knowledge of God. Firstly, because without God nothing can exist or be conceived. Secondly, because so long as we have no clear and distinct idea of God, we may remain in universal doubt. It follows that our highest good and perfection also depends solely on the knowledge of God. Further, since without God nothing can exist or be conceived, it is evident that all natural phenomena involve an express conception of God 
as far as this essence and perfection extend so that we have greater and more perfect knowledge of god in proportion to our knowledge of natural phenomena conversely since the knowledge of an effect through its cause is the same thing as the knowledge of a particular property of a cause the greater our knowledge of natural phenomena the more perfect is our knowledge of the essence of god which is the cause of all things so then our highest good not only depends on the knowledge of god but wholly consists therein and it further follows that man is perfect or the reverse in proportion to the nature and perfection of the object of his special desire hence the most perfect and the chief sharer in the highest blessedness is he who prizes above all else and takes a special delight in the intellectual knowledge of god the most perfect being hither then our highest good and our highest blessedness aim namely to the knowledge and love of god therefore the means demanded by this aim of all human actions that is by god in so far as the idea of him is in us may be called the commands of god because they proceed as it were from god himself inasmuch as he exists in our minds and the plan of life which has regard to this aim may be fitly called the law of god the nature of the means and the plan of life which this aim demands how the foundations of the best states follow its lines and how men's life is conducted are questions pertaining to general ethics here i only proceed to treat of the divine law in a particular application as the love of god is man's highest happiness and blessedness and the ultimate end and aim of all human actions it follows that he alone lives by the divine law who loves god not from fear of punishment or from love of any other object such as sensual pleasure fame or the like but solely because he has knowledge of god or is convinced that the knowledge and love of god is the highest good the sum and chief precept then of the divine law is to love god as the highest good namely as we have said not from fear of any pains and penalties or from the love of any other object in which we desire to take pleasure the idea of god lays down the rule that god is our highest good in other words that the knowledge and love of god is the ultimate aim to which all our actions should be directed the worldling cannot understand these things they appear foolishness to him because he has too meager a knowledge of god and also because in this highest good he can discover nothing which he can handle or eat or which affects the fleshly appetites wherein he chiefly delights for it consists solely in thought and the pure reason they on the other hand who know that they possess no greater gifts than intellect and sound reason will doubtless accept what i have said without question we have now explained that wherein the divine law chiefly consists and what are human laws namely all those which have a different aim unless they have been ratified by revelation for in this respect also things are referred to god as we have shown above and in this sense the law of moses although it was not universal but entirely adapted to the disposition and particular preservation of a single people may yet be called a law of god or divine law inasmuch as we believe that it was ratified by prophetic insight if we consider the nature of natural divine law as we have just explained it we shall see one that it is universal or common to all men for we have deduced it from universal human nature two that it does not depend on the truth of any historical narrative whatsoever for inasmuch as this natural divine law is comprehended solely by the consideration of human nature it is plain that we can conceive it as existing as well in adam as in any other man as well in a man living among his fellows as in a man who lives by himself the truth of a historical narrative however cannot give us the knowledge nor consequently the love of god for love of god springs from knowledge of him and knowledge of him should be derived from general ideas in themselves certain and known so that the truth of a historical narrative is very far from being a necessary requisite for our attaining our highest good still though the truth of histories cannot give us the knowledge and love of god i do not deny that reading them is very useful with a view to life in the world 
for the more we have observed and known of men's customs and circumstances which are best revealed by their actions the more warily we shall be able to order our lives among them and so far as reason dictates to adapt our actions to their dispositions three we see that this natural divine law does not demand the performance of ceremonies that is action in themselves indifferent which are called good from the fact of their institution or actions symbolizing something profitable for salvation or if one prefers this definition actions of which the meaning surpasses human understanding the natural light of reason does not demand anything which is itself unable to supply but only such as it can very clearly show to be good or a means to our blessedness such things as are good simply because they have been commanded or instituted or as being symbols of something good are mere shadows which cannot be reckoned among actions that are the offspring as it were or fruit of a sound mind and of intellect there is no need for me to go into this now in more detail four lastly we see that the highest reward of the divine law is the law itself namely to know god and to love him of our free choice and with an undivided and fruitful spirit while its penalty is the absence of these things and being in bondage to the flesh that is having an inconstant and wavering spirit these points being noted i must now inquire one whether by the natural light of reason we can conceive god as a lawgiver or potentate ordaining laws for men two what is the teaching of holy writ concerning this natural light of reason and natural law three with what objects were ceremonies formerly instituted four lastly what is the good gained by knowing the sacred histories and believing them of the first two i will treat in this chapter of the remaining two in the following one our conclusion about the first is easily deduced from the nature of god's will which is only distinguished from his understanding in relation to our intellect that is the will and the understanding of god are in reality one and the same and are also distinguished in relation to our thoughts which we form concerning god's understanding for instance if we are only looking to the fact that the nature of a triangle is from eternity contained in the divine nature as an eternal verity we say that god possesses the idea of a triangle or that he understands the nature of a triangle but if afterwards we look to the fact that the nature of a triangle is thus contained in the divine nature solely by the necessity of the divine nature and not by the necessity of the nature and essence of a triangle in fact that the necessity of a triangle's essence and nature in so far as they are conceived of as eternal verities depends solely on the necessity of the divine nature and intellect we then style god's will or decree that which before we styled his intellect wherefore we make one and the same affirmation concerning god when we say that he has from eternity decreed that three angles of a triangle are equal to two right angles as when we say that he has understood it hence the affirmations and the negations of god always involve necessity or truth so that for example if god said to adam that he did not wish him to eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil it would have involved a contradiction that adam should have been able to eat of it and would therefore have been impossible that he should have so eaten for the divine command would have involved an eternal necessity and truth but since scripture nevertheless narrates that god did give this command to adam and yet none the less adam ate of the tree we must perforce say that god revealed to adam the evil which would surely follow if he should eat of the tree but did not disclose that such evil would of necessity come to pass thus it was that adam took the revelation to be not an eternal and necessary truth but a law that is an ordinance followed by gain or loss not depending necessarily on the nature of the act performed but solely on the will and absolute power of some potentate so that the revelation in question was solely in relation to adam and solely through his lack of knowledge a law and god was as it were a lawgiver and potentate from the same cause namely from the lack of knowledge the decalogue in relation to the hebrews was a law for since they knew not the existence of god as an eternal truth they must have taken as a law that which was revealed to them in the decalogue namely that god exists and that god only should be worshipped 
but if god had spoken to them without the intervention of any bodily means immediately they would have perceived it not as a law but as an eternal truth what we have said about the israelites and adam applies also to all the prophets who wrote laws in god's name they did not adequately conceive god's decrees as eternal truths for instance we must say of moses that from revelation from the basis of what was revealed to him he perceived the method by which the israelitish nation could best be united in a particular territory and could form a body politic or state and further that he perceived the method by which that nation could best be constrained to obedience but he did not perceive nor was it revealed to him that this method was absolutely the best nor that the obedience of the people in a certain strip of territory would necessarily imply the end he had in view wherefore he perceived these things not as eternal truths but as precepts and ordinances and he ordained them as laws of god and thus it came to be that he conceived god as a ruler a legislator a king as merciful just etc whereas such qualities are simply attributes of human nature and utterly alien from the nature of the deity thus much we may affirm of the prophets who wrote laws in the name of god but we must not affirm it of christ for christ although he too seems to have written laws in the name of god must be taken to have had a clear and adequate perception for christ was not so much a prophet as the mouthpiece of god for god made revelations to mankind through christ as he had before done through angels that is a created voice visions etc it would be as unreasonable to say that god had accommodated his revelations to the opinions of christ and that he had before accommodated them to the opinions of angels that is of a created voice or visions as matters to be revealed to the prophets a wholly absurd hypothesis moreover christ was sent to teach not only the jews but the whole human race and therefore it was not enough that his mind should be accommodated to the opinions of the jews alone but also to the opinion and fundamental teaching common to the whole human race in other words to ideas universal and true inasmuch as god revealed himself to christ or to christ's mind immediately and not as to the prophets through words and symbols we must needs suppose that christ perceived truly what was revealed in other words he understood it for a matter is understood when it is perceived simply by the mind without words or symbols christ then perceived truly and adequately what was revealed and if he ever proclaimed such revelations as laws he did so because of the ignorance and obstinacy of the people acting in this respect the part of god inasmuch as he accommodated himself to the comprehension of the people and though he spoke somewhat more clearly than the other prophets yet he taught what was revealed obscurely and generally through parables especially when he was speaking to those whom it was not yet given to understand the kingdom of heaven see matthew chapter 13 verses 10 etc to those to whom it was given to understand the mysteries of heaven he doubtless taught his doctrines as eternal truths and did not lay them down as laws thus freeing the minds of his hearers from the bondage of that law which he further confirmed and established paul apparently points to this more than once for example romans chapter 7 verse 6 and chapter 3 verse 28 though he never himself seems to wish to speak openly but to quote his own words romans chapter 3 verse 5 and chapter 6 verse 19 merely humanly this he expressly states when he calls god just and it was doubtless in concession to human weakness that he attributes mercy grace anger and similar qualities to god adapting his language to the popular mind or as he puts it first corinthians chapter 3 verses 1 and 2 to carnal men in romans chapter 9 verse 18 he teaches undisguisedly that god's anger and mercy depend not on the actions of men but on god's own nature or will further that no one is justified by the works of the law but only by faith which he seems to identify with the full assent of the soul lastly that no one is blessed unless he have in him the mind of christ romans chapter 8 verse 9 whereby he perceives the laws of god as eternal truths we conclude therefore that god is described as a lawgiver or prince 
and styled just merciful etc merely in concession to popular understanding and the imperfection of popular knowledge that in reality god acts and directs all things simply by the necessity of his nature and perfection and that his decrees and volitions are eternal truths and always involve necessity so much for the first point which i wish to explain and demonstrate passing on to the second point let us search the sacred pages for their teaching concerning the light of nature and this divine law the first doctrine we find in the history of the first man where it is narrated that god commanded adam not to eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil this seems to me that god commanded adam to do and to seek after righteousness because it was good not because the contrary was evil that is to seek the good for its own sake not from fear of evil we have seen that he who acts rightly from the true knowledge and love of right acts with freedom and constancy whereas he who acts from fear of evil is under the constraint of evil and acts in bondage under external control so that this commandment of god to adam comprehends the whole divine natural law and absolutely agrees with the dictates of the light of nature nay it would be easy to explain on this basis the whole history or allegory of the first man but i prefer to pass over the subject in silence because in the first place i cannot be absolutely certain that my explanation would be in accordance with the intention of the sacred writer and secondly because many do not admit that his history is an allegory maintaining it to be a simple narrative of facts it will be better therefore to adduce other passages of scripture especially such as were written by him who speaks with all the strength of his natural understanding in which he surpassed all his contemporaries and whose sayings are accepted by the people as of equal weight with those of the prophets i mean solomon whose prudence and wisdom are commended in scripture rather than his piety and gift of prophecy he in his proverbs calls the human intellect the wellspring of true life and declares that misfortune is made up of folly understanding is a wellspring of life to him that hath it but the instruction of fools is folly proverbs chapter 16 verse 22 life being taken to mean the true life as is evident from deuteronomy chapter 30 verse 19 the fruit of the understanding consists only in the true life and its absence constitutes punishment all this absolutely agrees with what was set out in our fourth point concerning natural law moreover our position that it is the wellspring of life and that the intellect alone lays down laws for the wise is plainly taught by the sage for he says proverbs chapter 13 verse 14 the law of the wise is a fountain of life that is as we gather from the preceding text the understanding in chapter 3 verse 13 he expressly teaches that the understanding renders man blessed and happy and gives him true peace of mind happy is the man that findeth wisdom and the man that getteth understanding for wisdom gives length of days and riches and honor her ways are of pleasantness and all her paths peace chapter 13 verses 16 and 17 according to solomon therefore it is only the wise who live in peace and equanimity not like the wicked whose minds drift hither and thither and as isaiah says in chapter 57 verse 20 are like the troubled sea for them there is no peace lastly we would especially note the passage in chapter 2 of solomon's proverbs which most clearly confirms our contention if thou criest after knowledge and liftest up thy voice for understanding then shalt thou understand the fear of the lord and find the knowledge of god for the lord giveth wisdom out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding these words clearly enunciate one that wisdom or intellect alone teaches us to fear god wisely that is to worship him truly two that wisdom and knowledge flow from god's mouth and that god bestows on us this gift this we have already shown in proving that our understanding and our knowledge depend on spring from and are perfected by the idea or knowledge of god and nothing else solomon goes on to say in so many words that this knowledge contains and involves the true principles of ethics and politics when wisdom entereth into thy heart and knowledge is pleasant to thy soul 
discretion shall preserve thee, understanding shall keep thee, then shalt thou understand righteousness, and judgment, and equity, yea, every good path. All of which is in obvious agreement with natural knowledge. For after we have come to the understanding of things, and have tasted the excellence of knowledge, she teaches us ethics and true virtue. Thus the happiness and the peace of him who cultivates his natural understanding lies, according to Solomon also, not so much under the dominion of fortune, or God's external aid, as an in inward personal virtue, or God's internal aid, for the latter can to a great extent be preserved by vigilance, right action, and thought. Lastly, we must by no means pass over the passage in Paul's epistle to the Romans, chapter 1, verse 20, in which he says, For the invisible things of God from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse, because when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were they thankful. These words clearly show that every one can, by the light of nature, clearly understand the goodness and the eternal divinity of God, and can thence know and deduce what they should seek for, and what avoid. Wherefore the apostle says that they are without excuse, and cannot plead ignorance, as they certainly might if it were a question of supernatural light and the incarnation, passion, and resurrection of Christ. Wherefore, he goes on to say, Ib 24, God gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts, and so on through the rest of the chapter, he describes the vices of ignorance and sets them forth as the punishment of ignorance. This obviously agrees with the verse of Solomon already quoted. The instruction of fools is folly so that it is easy to understand why Paul says that the wicked are without excuse. As every man sows, so shall he reap. Out of evil, evils necessarily spring, unless they be wisely counteracted. Thus we see that Scripture literally approves of the light of natural reason and the natural divine law, and I have fulfilled the promises made at the beginning of this chapter. End of section 4 Read for you by Chiquito Crasto, Birmingham, Alabama. Section 5 of A Theologico-Political Treatise by Baruch Benedict de Spinoza Translated by Robert Harvey Monroe Elvis This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read for you by Chiquito Crasto. Chapter 5 Of the Ceremonial Law in the foregoing chapter we have shown that the divine law, which renders men truly blessed and teaches them the true life, is universal to all men. Nay, we have so intimately deduced it from human nature that it must be esteemed innate, and as it were, ingrained in the human mind. But with regard to the ceremonial observances which were ordained in the Old Testament for the Hebrews only, and were so adapted to their state, that they could for the most part only be observed by the society as a whole, and not by each individual, it is evident that they formed no part of the divine law, and had nothing to do with blessedness and virtue, but had a reference only to the election of the Hebrews, that is, as I have shown in chapter 3, to their temporal bodily happiness and the tranquillity of their kingdom, and that, therefore, they were only valid while that kingdom lasted. If in the Old Testament they are spoken of as the law of God, it is only because they were founded on revelation or a basis of revelation. Still, as reason, however sound, has a little weight with ordinary theologians, I will adduce the authority of Scripture for what I here assert, and will further show, for the sake of greater clearness, why and how these ceremonials served to establish and preserve the Jewish kingdom. Isaiah teaches most plainly that the divine law in its strict sense signifies that universal law which consists in a true manner of life and does not signify ceremonial observances. In chapter 1 verse 10, the prophet calls on his countrymen to hearken to the divine law as he delivers it, and first excluding all kinds of sacrifices and all feasts, he at length sums up the law in these few words, cease to do evil, learn to do well seek judgment, relieve the oppressed. Not less striking testimony is given in Psalm chapter 40, verses 7 to 9, where the psalmist addresses God. 
sacrifice and offering thou didst not desire mine ears hast thou opened burnt offering and sin offering hast thou not required i delight to do thy will o my god yea thy law is within my heart here the psalmist reckons as the law of god only that which is inscribed in his heart and excludes ceremonies therefrom for the latter are good and inscribed on the heart only from the fact of their institution and not because of their intrinsic value other passages of scripture testify to the same truth but these two will suffice we may also learn from the bible that ceremonies are no aid to blessedness but only have reference to the temporal prosperity of the kingdom for the rewards promised for their observance are merely temporal advantages and delights blessedness being reserved for the universal divine law in all the five books commonly attributed to moses nothing is promised as i have said beyond temporal benefits such as honours fame victories riches enjoyments and health though many moral precepts besides ceremonies are contained in these five books they appear not as moral doctrines universal to all men but as commands especially adapted to the understanding and character of the hebrew people and as having reference only to the welfare of the kingdom for instance moses does not teach the jews as a prophet not to kill or to steal but gives these commandments solely as a lawgiver and judge he does not reason out the doctrine but affixes for its non-observance a penalty which may and very properly does vary in different nations so too the command not to commit adultery is given merely with reference to the welfare of the state for if the moral doctrine had been intended with reference not only to the welfare of the state but also to the tranquillity and blessedness of the individual moses would have condemned not merely the outward act but also the mental acquiescence as is done by christ who taught only universal moral precepts and for this cause promises a spiritual instead of a temporal reward christ as i have said was sent into the world not to preserve the state nor to lay down laws but solely to teach the universal moral law so we can easily understand that he wished in no wise to do away with the law of moses inasmuch as he introduced no new laws of his own his sole care was to teach moral doctrines and distinguish them from the laws of the state for the pharisees in their ignorance thought that the observance of the state law and the mosaic law was a sum total of morality whereas such laws merely had reference to the public welfare and aimed not so much at instructing the jews as at keeping them under constraint but let us return to our subject and cite other passages of scripture which set forth temporal benefits as rewards for observing the ceremonial law and blessedness as reward for the universal law none of the prophets puts the point more clearly than isaiah after condemning hypocrisy he commends liberty and charity towards one's self and one's neighbours and promises as a reward then shall thy light break forth as the morning and thy health shall spring forth speedily thy righteousness shall go before thee and the glory of the lord shall be thy re reward chapter fifty eight verse eight shortly afterwards he commends the sabbath and for a due observance of it promises then shalt thou delight thyself in the lord and i will cause thee to ride upon the high places of the earth and feed thee with the heritage of jacob thy father for the mouth of the lord has spoken it thus the prophet for liberty bestowed and charitable works promises a healthy mind in a healthy body and the glory of the lord even after death whereas for ceremonial exactitude he only promises security of rule prosperity and temporal happiness in psalms fifteen and twenty four no mention is made of ceremonies but only of moral doctrines inasmuch as there is no question of anything but blessedness and blessedness is symbolically promised it is quite certain that the expressions the hill of god and his tents and the dwellers therein refer to blessedness and security of soul not to the actual mount of jerusalem and the tabernacle of moses for these latter were not dwelt in by any one and only the sons of levi ministered there further all those sentences of solomon to which i referred in the last chapter for the cultivation of the intellect and wisdom promise true blessedness for by wisdom is the fear of god at length understood 
and the knowledge of God found. That the Jews themselves were not bound to practice their ceremonial observances after the destruction of their kingdom is evident from Jeremiah. For when the prophet saw and foretold that the desolation of the city was at hand, he said that God only delights in those who know and understand that he exercises loving kindness, judgment and righteousness in the earth, and that such persons only are worthy of praise. Jeremiah chapter 9 verse 23. As though God had said that, after the desolation of the city, he would require nothing special from the Jews beyond the natural law by which all men are bound. The New Testament also confirms this view, for only moral doctrines are therein taught, and the kingdom of heaven is promised as a reward, whereas ceremonial observances are not touched on by the apostles after they began to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. The Pharisees certainly continued to practice these rites after the destruction of the kingdom, but more with the view of opposing the Christians than of pleasing God. For after the first destruction of the city, when they were led captive to Babylon, not being then, so far as I am aware, split up into sects, they straightway neglected their rites, bid farewell to the Mosaic law, buried their national customs in oblivion as being plainly superfluous, and began to mingle with other nations, as we may abundantly learn from Ezra and Nehemiah. We cannot therefore doubt that they were no more bound by the law of Moses after the destruction of their kingdom than they had been before it had been begun while they were still living among other peoples before the exodus from Egypt, and were subjected to no special law beyond the natural law, and also, doubtless, the law of the state in which they were living, in so far as it was consonant with the divine natural law. As to the fact that the patriarchs offered sacrifices, I think they did so for the purpose of stimulating their piety, for their minds had been accustomed from childhood to the idea of sacrifice, which we know had been universal from the time of Enoch, and thus they found in sacrifice their most powerful incentive. The patriarchs, then, did not sacrifice to God at the bidding of a divine right, or as taught by the basis of the divine law, but simply in accordance with the custom of the time. And if in so doing they followed any ordinance, it was simply the ordinance of the country they were living in, by which, as we have seen before in the case of Melchizedek, they were bound. I think that I have now given scriptural authority for my view. It remains to show why and how the ceremonial observances tended to preserve and confirm the Hebrew kingdom, and this I can very briefly do on grounds universally accepted. The formation of society serves not only for defensive purposes, but is also very useful and indeed absolutely necessary as rendering possible the division of labour. If men did not render mutual assistance to each other, no one would have either the skill or the time to provide for his own sustenance and preservation. For all men are not equally apt for all work, and no one would be capable of preparing all that he individually stood in need of. Strength and time, I repeat, would fail. If every one had in person to plough, to sow, to reap, to grind corn, to cook, to weave, to stitch, and perform the other numerous functions required to keep life going, to say nothing of the arts and sciences, which are also entirely necessary to the perfection and blessedness of human nature. We see that peoples living in uncivilized barbarism lead a wretched and almost animal life, and even they would not be able to acquire their few rude necessaries without assisting one another to a certain extent. Now if men were so constituted by nature, that they desired nothing but what is designated by true reason, society would obviously have no need of laws. It would be sufficient to inculcate true moral doctrines, and men would freely, without hesitation, act in accordance with their true interests. But human nature is framed in a different fashion. Every one, indeed, seeks his own interest, but does not do so in accordance with the dictates of sound reason. For most men's ideas of desirability and usefulness are guided by their fleshly instincts and emotions, which take no thought beyond the present and the immediate object. Therefore, no society can exist without government and force and laws to restrain and repress men's desires and immoderate impulses. Still, human nature will not submit to absolute repression. Violent governments, as Seneca says, never last long 
the moderate governments endure. So long as men act simply from fear, they act contrary to their inclinations, taking no thought for the advantages or necessity of their actions, but simply endeavouring to escape punishment or loss of life. They must needs rejoice in any evil which befalls their ruler, even if it should involve themselves, and must long for and bring about such evil by every means in their power. Again, men are especially intolerant of serving and being ruled by their equals. Lastly, it is exceedingly difficult to revoke liberties once granted. From these considerations it follows, firstly, that authority should either be vested in the hands of the whole state in common, so that everyone should be bound to serve, and yet not be in subjection to his equals, or else, if power be in the hands of a few, or one man, that one man should be something above average humanity, or should strive to get himself accepted as such. Secondly, laws should in every government be so arranged that people should be kept in bounds by the hope of some greatly desired good, rather than by fear, for then every one will do his duty willingly. Lastly, as obedience consists in acting at the bidding of external authority, it would have no place in a state where the government is vested in the whole people and where laws are made by common consent. In such a society, the people would remain free, whether the laws were added to or diminished, inasmuch as it would not be done on external authority, but their own free consent. The reverse happens when the sovereign power is vested in one man, for all act at his bidding, and therefore, unless they had been trained from the first to depend on the words of their ruler, the latter would find it difficult, in case of need, to abrogate liberties once conceded and impose new laws. From these universal considerations, let us pass on to the kingdom of the Jews. The Jews, when they first came out of Egypt, were not bound by any national laws and were therefore free to ratify any laws they liked or to make new ones, and were at liberty to set up government and occupy a territory wherever they chose. However, they were entirely unfit to frame a wise code of laws and to keep the sovereign power vested in the community. They were all uncultivated and sunk in a wretched slavery. Therefore, the sovereignty was bound to remain vested in the hands of one man who would rule the rest and keep them under constraint, make laws and interpret them. This sovereignty was easily retained by Moses because he surpassed the rest in virtue and persuaded the people of the fact proving it by many testimonies see exodus chapter 14 last verse and chapter 19 verse 9 he then by the divine virtue he possessed made laws and ordained them for the people taking the greatest care that they should be obeyed willingly and not through fear being specially induced to adopt this course by the obstinate nature of the jews who would not have submitted to be ruled solely by constraint and also by the imminence of war for it is always better to inspire soldiers with a thirst for glory than to terrify them with threats. Each man will then strive to distinguish himself by valour and courage, instead of merely trying to escape punishment. Moses, therefore, by his virtue and the divine command, introduced a religion, so that the people might do their duty from devotion rather than fear. Further, he bound them over by benefits, and prophesied many advantages in the future nor were his laws very severe, as any one may see for himself, especially if he remarks the number of circumstances necessary in order to procure the conviction of an accused person. Lastly, in order that the people which could not govern itself should be entirely dependent on its ruler, he left nothing to the free choice of individuals who had hitherto been slaves. The people could do nothing but remember the law and follow the ordinances laid down at the good pleasure of their ruler. They were not allowed to plough, to sow, to reap, nor even to eat, to clothe themselves, to shave, to rejoice, or in fact to do anything whatever as they liked, but were bound to follow the directions given in the law. And not only this, but they were obliged to have marks on their doorposts, on their hands and between their eyes, to admonish them to perpetual obedience. This then was the object of the ceremonial law that men should do nothing of their own free will, but should always act under external authority, and should continually confess by their actions and thoughts that they were not their own masters, but were entirely under the control of others. 
from all these considerations it is clearer than day that ceremonies have nothing to do with the state of blessedness and that those mentioned in the old testament that is the whole mosaic law had reference merely to the government of the jews and merely temporal advantages as for the christian rites such as baptism the lord's supper festivals public prayers and any other observances which are and always have been common to all christendom if they were instituted by christ or his apostles which is open to doubt they were instituted as external signs of the universal church and not as having anything to do with blessedness or possessing any sanctity in themselves therefore though such ceremonies were not ordained for the sake of upholding a government they were ordained for the preservation of a society and accordingly he who lives alone is not bound by them nay those who live in a country where the christian religion is forbidden are bound to abstain from such rites and can none the less live in a state of blessedness we have an example of this in japan where the christian religion is forbidden and the dutch who live there are enjoined by their east india company not to practice any outward rites of religion i need not cite other examples though it would be easy to prove my point from the fundamental principles of the new testament and to adduce many confirmatory instances but i pass on the more willingly as i am anxious to proceed to my next proposition i will now therefore pass on to what i propose to treat of in the second part of this chapter namely what persons are bound to believe in the narratives contained in scripture and how far they are so bound examining this question by the aid of natural reason i will proceed as follows if any one wishes to persuade his fellows for or against anything which is not self-evident he must deduce his contention from their admissions and convince them either by experience or by ratiocination either by appealing to facts of natural experience or to self-evident intellectual axioms now unless the experience be of such a kind as to be clearly and distinctly understood though it may convince a man it will not have the same effect on his mind and disperse the clouds of his doubt so completely as when the doctrine taught is deduced entirely from intellectual axioms that is by the mere power of the understanding and logical order and this is especially the case in spiritual matters which have nothing to do with the senses but the deduction of conclusions from general truths a priori usually requires a long chain of arguments and moreover very great caution acuteness and self-restraint qualities which are not often met with therefore people prefer to be taught by experience rather than deduce their conclusion from a few axioms and set them out in logical order whence it follows that if any one wishes to teach a doctrine to a whole nation not to speak of the whole human race and to be understood by all men in every particular he will seek to support his teaching with experience and will endeavour to suit his reasonings and the definitions of his doctrines as far as possible to the understanding of the common people who form the majority of mankind and he will not set them forth in logical sequence nor adduce the definitions which serve to establish them otherwise he writes only for the learned that is he will be understood by only a small proportion of the human race all scripture was written primarily for an entire people and secondarily for the whole human race therefore its contents must necessarily be adapted as far as possible to the understanding of the masses and proved only by examples drawn from experience we will explain ourselves more clearly the chief speculative doctrines taught in scripture are the existence of god or a being who made all things and who directs and sustains the world with consummate wisdom furthermore that god takes the greatest thought for men or such of them as live piously and honourably while he punishes with various penalties those who do evil separating them from the good all this is proved in scripture entirely through experience that is through the narratives there related no definitions of doctrine are given but all the sayings and reasonings are adapted to the understanding of the masses although experience can give no clear knowledge of these things nor explain the nature of god nor how he directs and sustains all things it can nevertheless teach and enlighten men 
sufficiently to impress obedience and devotion on their minds. It is now, I think, sufficiently clear what persons are bound to believe in the scripture narratives and in what degree they are so bound. For it evidently follows from what has been said that the knowledge of and belief in them is particularly necessary to the masses whose intellect is not capable of perceiving things clearly and distinctly. Further, he who denies them because he does not believe that God exists or takes thought for men and the world may be accounted impious. But a man who is ignorant of them and nevertheless knows by natural reason that God exists as we have said, and has a true plan of life, is altogether blessed, yes, more blessed than the common herd of believers, because, besides true opinions, he possesses also a true and distinct conception. Lastly, he who is ignorant of the Scriptures, and knows nothing by the light of reason, though he may not be impious or rebellious, is yet less than human and almost brutal, having none of God's gifts. We must here remark that when we say that the knowledge of the sacred narrative is particularly necessary to the masses, we do not mean the knowledge of absolutely all the narratives in the Bible, but only of the principal ones, those which, taken by themselves, plainly display the doctrine we have just stated, and have most effect over men's minds. If all the narratives in Scripture were necessary for the proof of this doctrine, and if no conclusion could be drawn without the general consideration of every one of the histories contained in the sacred writings, truly the conclusion and demonstration of such doctrine would overtask the understanding and strength not only of the masses, but of humanity. Who is there who could give attention to all the narratives at once, and to all the circumstances, and all the scraps of doctrine to be elicited from such a host of diverse histories? I cannot believe that the men who left us the Bible as we have it were so abounding in talent that they attempted setting about such a method of demonstration. Still less can I suppose that we cannot understand scriptural doctrine till we have given heed to the quarrels of Isaac, the advice of Achitophel to Absalom, the civil war between Jews and Israelites, and other similar chronicles nor can I think that it was more difficult to teach such doctrine by means of history to the Jews of early times, the contemporaries of Moses, than it was to the contemporaries of Esdras. But more will be said on this point hereafter. We may now only note that the masses are only bound to know those histories which can most powerfully dispose their mind to obedience and devotion. However, the masses are not sufficiently skilled to draw conclusions from what they read they take more delight in the actual stories and in the strange and unlooked-for issues of events than in the doctrines implied. Therefore, besides reading these narratives, they are always in need of pastors or church ministers to explain them to their feeble intelligence. But not to wander from our point, let us conclude with what has been our principal object, namely, that the truth of narratives, be they what they may, has nothing to do with the divine law, and serves for nothing except in respect of doctrine, the sole element which makes one history better than another. The narratives in the Old and New Testament surpass profane history, and differ among themselves in merit simply by reason of the salutary doctrines which they inculcate. Therefore, if a man were to read the scripture narratives believing the whole of them, but were to give no heed to the doctrines they contain, and make no amendment in his life, he might employ himself just as profitably in reading the Quran or the poetic drama or ordinary chronicles with the attention usually given to such writings. On the other hand, if a man is absolutely ignorant of the scriptures and nonetheless has right opinions and a true plan of life, he is absolutely blessed and truly possesses in himself the spirit of Christ. The Jews are of a directly contrary way of thinking. For they hold that true opinions and a true plan of life are of no service in attaining blessedness, if their possessors have arrived at them by the light of reason only, and not like the documents prophetically revealed to Moses. Maimonides ventures openly to make this assertion. Every man who takes to heart the seven precepts and diligently follows them is counted with the pious among the nations, and an heir of the world to come, that is to say, if he takes to heart and follows them because God ordained them in the law, 
and revealed them to us by Moses, because they were of aforetime precepts to the sons of Noah, but he who follows them as led thereto by reason is not counted as a dweller among the pious, nor among the wise of the nations. Such are the words of Maimonides, to which Rabbi Joseph, the son of Shem Job, adds in his book which he calls Kebod Elohim, or God's glory, that although Aristotle, whom he considers to have written the best ethics and to be above everyone else, has not omitted anything that concerns true ethics, and which he has adopted in his own book, carefully following the lines laid down, yet this was not able to suffice for his salvation, inasmuch as he embraced his doctrines in accordance with the dictates of reason, and not as divine documents prophetically revealed. However, that these are mere figments, and are not supported by scriptural authority, will, I think, be sufficiently evident to the attentive reader, so that an examination of the theory will be sufficient for its refutation. It is not my purpose here to refute the assertions of those who assert that the natural light of reason can teach nothing of any value concerning the true way of salvation. People who lay no claims to reason for themselves are not able to prove by reason this their assertion, and if they hawk about something superior to reason, it is a mere figment, and far below reason, as their general method of life sufficiently shows. But there is no need to dwell upon such persons. I will merely add that we can only judge of a man by his works. If a man abounds in the fruits of the Spirit, charity, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faith, gentleness, chastity, against which, as Paul says, Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, there is no law, such an one, whether he be taught by reason only, or by the scripture only, has been in very truth taught by God, and is altogether blessed. Thus have I said all that I undertook to say concerning divine law. End of section 5, read for you by Chiquito Crasto, Birmingham, Alabama. Section 6 of A Theological Political Treatise by Baruch Benedict de Spinoza, translated by Robert Harvey Munro Elvis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read for you by Chiquito Crasto. Chapter 6 Of Miracles As men are accustomed to call divine the knowledge which transcends human understanding, so also do they style divine, or the work of God, anything of which the cause is not generally known. For the masses think that the power and providence of God are most clearly displayed by events that are extraordinary and contrary to the conception they have formed of nature, especially if such events bring them any profit or convenience. They think that the clearest possible proof of God's existence is afforded when nature, as they suppose, breaks her accustomed order, and consequently they believe that those who explain or endeavour to understand phenomena or miracles through their natural causes are doing away with God and His providence. They suppose forsooth that God is inactive, so long as nature works in her accustomed order, and vice versa, that the power of nature and natural causes are idle, so long as God is acting. Thus they imagine two powers distinct one from the other, the power of God and the power of nature, though the latter is in a sense determined by God, or, as most people believe now, created by Him. What they mean by either, and what they understand by God and nature, they do not know, except that they imagine the power of God to be like that of some royal potentate, and nature's power to consist in force and energy. The masses then style unusual phenomena miracles, and partly from piety, partly for the sake of opposing the students of science, prefer to remain in ignorance of natural causes, and only to hear of those things which they know least, and consequently admire most. In fact, the common people can only adore God, and refer all things to His power by removing natural causes, and conceiving things happening out of their due course, and only admires the power of God when the power of nature is conceived of as in subjection to it. This idea seems to have taken its rise among the early Jews, who saw the Gentiles round them worshipping visible gods such as the sun, the moon, the earth, water, air, etc., and in order to inspire the conviction that such divinities were weak and inconstant or changeable, told how they themselves were under the sway of an invisible god, and narrated their miracles, 
trying further to show that the god whom they worshipped arranged the whole of nature for their sole benefit this idea was so pleasing to humanity that men go on to this day imagining miracles so that they may believe themselves god's favourites and the final cause for which god created and directs all things what pretension will not people in their folly advance they have no single sound idea concerning either god or nature they confound god's decrees with human decrees they conceive nature as so limited that they believe man to be its chief part i have spent enough space in setting forth these common ideas and prejudices concerning nature and miracles but in order to afford a regular demonstration i will show one that nature cannot be contravened but that she preserves a fixed and immutable order and at the same time i will explain what is meant by a miracle two that god's nature and existence and consequently his providence cannot be known from miracles but that they can all be much better perceived from the fixed and immutable order of nature three that by the decrees and volitions and consequently the providence of god scripture as i will prove by scriptural examples means nothing but nature's order following necessarily from her eternal laws four lastly i will treat of the method of interpreting scriptural miracles and the chief points to be noted concerning the narratives of them such are the principal subjects which will be discussed in this chapter and which will serve i think not a little to further the object of this treatise our first point is easily proved from what we showed in chapter four about divine law namely that all that god wishes or determines involves eternal necessity and truth for we demonstrated that god's understanding is identical with his will and that it is the same thing to say that god wills a thing as to say that he understands it hence as it follows necessarily from the divine nature and perfection that god understands a thing as it is it follows no less necessarily that he wills it as it is now as nothing is necessarily true save only by divine decree it is plain that the universal laws of nature are decrees of god following from the necessity and perfection of the divine nature hence any event happening in nature which contravened nature's universal laws would necessarily also contravene the divine decree nature and understanding or if any one asserted that god acts in contravention to the laws of nature he ipso facto would be compelled to assert that god acted against his own nature an evident absurdity one might easily show from the same premises that the power and efficiency of nature are in themselves the divine power and efficiency and that the divine power is the very essence of god but this i gladly pass over for the present nothing then comes to pass in nature in contravention to her universal laws nay everything agrees with them and follows from them for whatsoever comes to pass comes to pass by the will and eternal decree of god that is as we have just pointed out whatever comes to pass comes to pass according to laws and rules which involve eternal necessity and truth nature therefore always observes laws and rules which involve eternal necessity and truth although they may not all be known to us and therefore she keeps a fixed and immutable order nor is there any sound reason for limiting the power and efficacy of nature and asserting that her laws are fit for certain purposes but not for all for as the efficacy and power of nature are the very efficacy and power of god and as the laws and rules of nature are the decrees of god it is in every way to be believed that the power of nature is infinite and that her laws are broad enough to embrace everything conceived by the divine intellect the only alternative is to assert that god has created a nature so weak and has ordained for her laws so barren that he is repeatedly compelled to come afresh to her aid if he wishes that she should be preserved and that things should happen as he desires a conclusion in my opinion very far removed from reason further as nothing happens in nature which does not follow from her laws and as her laws embrace everything conceived by the divine intellect and lastly as nature preserves a fixed and immutable order it most clearly follows that miracles are only intelligible as in relation to human opinions and merely mean events of which the natural cause cannot be explained by a reference to any ordinary occurrence either by us or at any rate by the writer and narrator of the miracle we may in fact say that a miracle is an event of which the causes cannot be explained by the natural reason 
through a reference to ascertained workings of nature. But since miracles were wrought according to the understanding of the masses, who are wholly ignorant of the workings of nature, it is certain that the ancients took for a miracle whatever they could not explain by the method adopted by the unlearned in such cases, namely, an appeal to the memory, a recalling of something similar which is ordinarily regarded without wonder. For most people think they sufficiently understand a thing when they have ceased to wonder at it. The ancients then, and indeed most men up to the present day, had no other criterion for a miracle. Hence we cannot doubt that many things are narrated in Scripture as miracles of which the causes could easily be explained by references to ascertained workings of nature. We have hinted as much in chapter 2 in speaking of the sun standing still in the time of Joshua and going backwards in the time of Ahaz. But we shall soon have more to say on the subject when we come to treat of the interpretation of miracles later on in this chapter. It is now time to pass on to the second point and show that we cannot gain an understanding of God's essence, existence, or providence by means of miracles, but that these truths are much better perceived through the fixed and immutable order of nature. I thus proceed with the demonstration. As God's existence is not self-evident, it must necessarily be inferred from ideas so firmly and incontrovertibly true that no power can be postulated or conceived sufficient to impugn them. They ought certainly so to appear to us when we infer from them God's existence, if we wish to place our conclusion beyond the reach of doubt. For if we could conceive that such ideas could be impugned by any power whatsoever, we should doubt of their truth, we should doubt of our conclusion, namely of God's existence, and should never be able to be certain of anything. Further, we know that nothing either agrees with or is contrary to nature, unless it agrees with or is contrary to these primary ideas. Wherefore, if we would conceive that anything could be done in nature by any power whatsoever, which would be contrary to the laws of nature, it would also be contrary to our primary ideas, and we should have either to reject it as absurd or else to cast doubt as just shown on our primary ideas and consequently on the existence of God and on everything howsoever perceived. Therefore, miracles in the sense of events contrary to the laws of nature, so far from demonstrating to us the existence of God, would, on the contrary, lead us to doubt it where otherwise we might have been absolutely certain of it, as knowing that nature follows a fixed and immutable order. Let us take miracles as meaning that which cannot be explained through natural causes. This may be interpreted in two senses, either as that which has natural causes but cannot be examined by the human intellect, or as that which has no cause save God and God's will. But as all things which come to pass through natural causes come to pass also solely through the will and power of God, it comes to this, that a miracle, whether it has natural causes or not, is a result which cannot be explained by its cause, that is a phenomenon which surpasses human understanding. But from such a phenomenon, and certainly from a result surpassing our understanding, we can gain no knowledge. For whatsoever we understand clearly and distinctly should be plain to us either in itself or by means of something else clearly and distinctly understood. Wherefore, from a miracle or a phenomenon which we cannot understand, we can gain no knowledge of God's essence or existence, or indeed anything about God or nature. Whereas, when we know that all things are ordained and ratified by God, that the operations of nature follow from the essence of God, and that the laws of nature are eternal decrees and volitions of God, we must perforce conclude that our knowledge of God and of God's will increases in proportion to our knowledge and clear understanding of nature as we see how she depends on her primal cause and how she works according to eternal law. Wherefore, so far as our understanding goes, those phenomena which we clearly and distinctly understand have much better right to be called works of God and to be referred to the will of God than those about which we are entirely ignorant, although they appeal powerfully to the imagination and compel men's admiration. It is only phenomena that we clearly and distinctly understand which heighten our knowledge of God and most clearly indicate His will and decrees. Plainly, they are but triflers who, when they cannot explain a thing, run back to the will of God. This is truly a ridiculous way of expressing ignorance. Again, even supposing that some conclusion could be drawn from miracles, we could not possibly infer from them the existence of God. For a miracle being an event under limitations is the expression of a fixed and limited power. Therefore, 
we could not possibly infer from an effect of this kind the existence of a cause whose power is infinite but at the utmost only a cause whose power is greater than that of the said effect i say at the utmost for a phenomenon may be the result of many concurrent causes and its power may be less than the power of the sum of such causes but far greater than that of any one of them taken individually on the other hand the laws of nature as we have shown extend over infinity and are conceived by us as after a fashion eternal and nature works in accordance with them in a fixed and immutable order therefore such laws indicate to us in a certain degree the infinity the eternity and the immutability of god we may conclude then that we cannot gain knowledge of the existence and providence of god by means of miracles but that we can far better infer them from the fixed and immutable order of nature by miracle i here mean an event which surpasses or is thought to surpass human comprehension for in so far as it is supposed to destroy or interrupt the order of nature or her laws it not only can give us no knowledge of god but contrarywise takes away that which we naturally have and makes us doubt of god and everything else neither do i recognize any difference between an event against the laws of nature and an event beyond the laws of nature that is according to some an event which does not contravene nature though she is inadequate to produce or effect it for a miracle is wrought in and not beyond nature though it may be said in itself to be above nature and therefore must necessarily interrupt the order of nature which otherwise we conceive of as fixed and unchangeable according to god's decrees if therefore anything should come to pass in nature which does not follow from her laws it would also be in contravention to the order which god has established in nature for ever through universal natural laws it would therefore be in contravention to god's nature and laws and consequently belief in it would throw doubt upon everything and lead to atheism i think i have now sufficiently established my second point that we can again conclude that a miracle whether in contravention to or beyond nature is a mere absurdity and therefore that what is meant in scripture by a miracle can only be a work of nature which surpasses or is believed to surpass human comprehension before passing on to my third point i will adduce a scriptural authority for my assertion that god cannot be known from miracles scripture nowhere states the doctrine openly but it can readily be inferred from several passages firstly that in which moses commands deuteronomy chapter 13 that a false prophet should be put to death even though he work miracles if there arise a prophet among you and giveth thee a sign or wonder and the sign or wonder come to pass saying let us go after other gods thou shalt not hearken unto the voice of that prophet for the lord your god proveth you and that prophet shall be put to death from this it clearly follows that miracles could be wrought even by false prophets and that unless men are honestly endowed with the true knowledge and love of god they may be as easily led by miracles to follow false gods as to follow the true god for these words are added for the lord your god tempts you that he may know whether you love him with all your heart and with all your mind further the israelites from all their miracles were unable to form a sound conception of god as their experience testified for when they had persuaded themselves that moses had departed from among them they petitioned aaron to give them visible gods and the idea of god they had formed as a result of all their miracles was a calf asaph though he had heard of so many miracles yet doubted of the providence of god and would have turned himself from the true way if he had not at last come to understand true blessedness see psalms chapter 83 solomon too at a time when the jewish nation was at the height of its prosperity suspects that all things happen by chance see ecclesiastes chapter 3 verses 19 20 and 21 and chapter 9 verses 2 3 etc lastly nearly all the prophets found it very hard to reconcile the order of nature and human affairs with the conception they had formed of god's providence whereas philosophers who endeavoured to understand things by clear conceptions of them rather than by miracles have always found the task extremely easy at least such of them as place true happiness solely in virtue and peace of mind and who aim at obeying nature rather than being obeyed by her such persons rest assured 
that God directs nature according to the requirements of universal laws, not according to the requirements of the particular laws of human nature, and that, therefore, God's scheme comprehends not only the human race, but the whole of nature. It is plain, then, from Scripture itself, that miracles can give no knowledge of God, nor clearly teach us the providence of God. As to the frequent statements in Scripture that God wrought miracles to make himself plain to man, as in Exodus chapter 10, verse 2, where he deceived the Egyptians and gave signs of himself that the Israelites might know that he was God, it does not therefore follow that miracles really taught this truth, but only that the Jews held opinions which laid them easily open to conviction by miracles. We have shown in chapter 2 that the reasons assigned by the prophets, or those which are formed from revelation, are not assigned in accordance with ideas universal and common to all, but in accordance with the accepted doctrines, however absurd, and with the opinions of those to whom the revelation was given, or those whom the Holy Spirit wished to convince. This we have illustrated by many scriptural instances, and can further cite Paul, who to the Greeks was a Greek, and to the Jews a Jew. But although these miracles could convince the Egyptians and Jews from their standpoint, they could not give a true idea and knowledge of God, but only cause them to admit that there was a deity more powerful than anything known to them, and that this deity took special care of the Jews, who had just then an unexpectedly happy issue of all their affairs. They could not teach them that God cares equally for all, for this can be taught only by philosophy. The Jews and all who took their knowledge of God's providence from the dissimilarity of human conditions of life and the inequalities of fortune persuaded themselves that God loved the Jews above all men, though they did not surpass their fellows in true human perfection. I now go on to my third point and show from Scripture that the decrees and mandates of God and consequently His providence are merely the order of nature, that is, when Scripture describes an event as accomplished by God or God's will, we must understand merely that it was in accordance with the law and order of nature, not, as most people believe, that nature had for a season ceased to act or that her order was temporarily interrupted. But Scripture does not directly teach matters unconnected with its doctrine. Therefore, it has no care to explain things by their natural causes, nor to expound matters merely speculative. Therefore, our conclusion must be gathered by inference from these scriptural narratives, which happen to be written more at length and circumstantially than usual. Of these I will cite a few. In the first book of Samuel, chapter 9, verses 15 and 16, it is related that God revealed to Samuel that he would send Saul to him, yet God did not send Saul to Samuel as people are wont to send one man to another. His sending was merely the ordinary course of nature. Saul was looking for the asses he had lost and was meditating a return home without them, when, at the suggestion of his servant, he went to the prophet Samuel to learn from him where he might find them. From no part of the narrative does it appear that Saul had any command from God to visit Samuel beyond this natural motive. In Psalm chapter 105 verse 24, it is said that God changed the hearts of the Egyptians so that they hated the Israelites. This was evident a natural change, as appears from Exodus chapter 1, where we find no slight reason for the Egyptians reducing the Israelites to slavery. In Genesis chapter 9 verse 13, God tells Noah that he will set his bow in the cloud. This action of God's is but another way of expressing the refraction and reflection which the rays of the sun are subjected to in drops of water. In Psalm chapter 147 verse 18 the natural action and warmth of the wind by which hoar frost and snow are melted are styled the word of the lord and in verse 15 wind and cold are called the commandment and word of god in psalm 104 verse 4 wind and fire are called the angels and ministers of god and various other passages of the same sort are found in scripture clearly showing that the decree commandment fiat and word of god are merely expressions for the action and order of nature. Thus it is plain that all the events narrated in Scripture came to pass naturally and are referred directly to God because Scripture, as we have shown, does not aim at explaining things by their natural causes but only at narrating what appeals to the popular imagination and doing so in the manner best calculated to excite wonder 
and consequently to impress the minds of the masses with devotion. If, therefore, events are found in the Bible which we cannot refer to their causes, nay, which seem entirely to contradict the order of nature, we must not come to a stand, but assuredly believe that whatever did really happen, happened naturally. This view is confirmed by the fact that in the case of every miracle there were many attendant circumstances, though these were not always related, especially where the narrative was of a poetic character. The circumstances of the miracles clearly show, I maintain, that natural causes were needed. For instance, in order to infect the Egyptians with blains, it was necessary that Moses should scatter ashes in the air. Exodus chapter 9 verse 10. The locusts also came upon the land of Egypt by a command of God, in accordance with nature, namely, by an east wind blowing for a whole day and night, and they departed by a very strong west wind. Exodus chapter 10 verses 14 and 19. By a similar divine mandate, the sea opened a way for the Jews, Exodus chapter 14 verse 21, namely, by an east wind which blew very strongly all night. So too, when Elisha would revive the boy who was believed to be dead, he was obliged to bend over him several times until the flesh of the child waxed warm, and at last he opened his eyes. Second Kings chapter 4 verses 34 and 35. Again, in John's Gospel chapter 9, certain acts are mentioned as performed by Christ preparatory to healing the blind man, and there are numerous other instances showing that something further than the absolute fiat of God is required for working a miracle. Wherefore, we may believe that, although the circumstances attending miracles are not related always or in full detail, yet a miracle was never performed without them. This is confirmed by Exodus chapter 14 verse 27, where it is simply stated that Moses stretched forth his hand and the waters of the sea returned to their strength in the morning no mention being made of a wind. But in the Song of Moses, Exodus chapter 15 verse 10, we read, Thou didst blow with thy wind, that is, with a very strong wind, and the sea covered them. Thus the attendant circumstance is omitted in the history, and the miracle is thereby enhanced. But perhaps someone will insist that we find many things in Scripture which seem in no wise explicable by natural causes, as for instance, that the sins of men and their prayers can be the cause of rain and of the earth's fertility, or that faith can heal the blind and so on. But I think I have already made sufficient answer. I have shown that Scripture does not explain things by their secondary causes, but only narrates them in the order and style which is most power to move men, and especially uneducated men, to devotion. And therefore it speaks inaccurately of God and of events, seeing that its object is not to convince the reason but to attract and lay hold of the imagination. If the Bible were to describe the destruction of an empire in the style of political historians, the masses would remain unstirred, whereas the contrary is the case when it adopts the method of poetic description and refers all things immediately to God. When, therefore, the Bible says that the earth is barren because of men's sins, or that the blind were healed by faith, we ought to take no more notice than when it says that God is angry at men's sins, that he is sad, that he repents of the good he has promised and done, or that, on seeing a sign, he remembers something he has promised, and other similar expressions which are either thrown out poetically or related according to the opinions and prejudices of the writer. We may then be absolutely certain that every event which is truly described in Scripture necessarily happened, like everything else, according to natural laws, and if anything is there set down, which can be proved in set terms to contravene the order of nature, or not to be deducible therefrom, we must believe it to have been foisted into the sacred writings by irreligious hands. For whatsoever is contrary to nature is also contrary to reason, and whatsoever is contrary to reason is absurd, and, ipso facto, to be rejected. There remains some points concerning the interpretation of miracles to be noted, or rather to be recapitulated, for most of them have been already stated. These I proceed to discuss in the fourth division of my subject, and I am led to do so, lest anyone should, by wrongly interpreting a miracle, rashly suspect that he has found something in Scripture contrary to human reason. It is very rare for men to relate an event simply as it happened without adding an element of their own judgment. When they see or hear anything new, 
they are unless strictly on their guard so occupied with their own preconceived opinions that they perceive something quite different from the plain facts seen or heard especially if such facts surpass the comprehension of the beholder or hearer and most of all if he is interested in their happening in a given way thus men relate in chronicles and histories their own opinions rather than actual events so that one and the same event is so differently related by two men of different opinions that it seems like two separate occurrences and further it is very easy from historical chronicles to gather the personal opinions of the historian i would cite many instances in proof of this from the writings both of natural philosophers and historians but i will content myself with one only from scripture and leave the reader to judge of the rest in the time of joshua the hebrews held the ordinary opinion that the sun moves with a daily motion and that the earth remains at rest to this preconceived opinion they adapted the miracle which occurred during their battle with the five kings they did not simply relate that that day was longer than usual but asserted that the sun and moon stood still or ceased from their motion a statement which would be of great service to them at that time in convincing and proving by experience to the gentiles who worshipped the sun that the sun was under the control of another deity who could compel it to change its daily course thus partly through religious motives partly through preconceived opinions they conceived of and related the occurrence as something quite different from what really happened thus in order to interpret the scriptural miracles and understand from the narration of them how they really happened it is necessary to know the opinions of those who first related them and have recorded them for us in writing and to distinguish such opinions from the actual impression made upon their senses otherwise we shall confound opinions and judgments with the actual miracle as it really occurred nay further we shall confound actual events with symbolical and imaginary ones for many things are narrated in scripture as real and were believed to be real which were in fact only symbolical and imaginary as for instance that god came down from heaven exodus chapter 19 verse 28 deuteronomy chapter 5 verse 28 and that mount sinai smoked because god descended upon it surrounded with fire or again that elijah ascended into heaven in a chariot of fire with horses of fire all these things were assuredly merely symbols adapted to the opinions of those who had handed them down to us as they were represented to them namely israel all who have any education know that god has no right hand nor left that he is not moved nor at rest nor in a particular place but that he is absolutely infinite and contains in himself all perfections these things i repeat are known to whoever judges of things by the perception of pure reason and not according as his imagination is affected by his outward senses following the example of the masses who imagine a bodily deity holding a royal court with a throne on the convexity of heaven above the stars which are believed to be not very far off from the earth to these and similar opinions very many narrations in scripture are adapted and should not therefore be mistaken by philosophers for realities lastly in order to understand in the case of miracles what actually took place we ought to be familiar with jewish phrases and metaphors any one who did not make sufficient allowance for these would be continually seeing miracles in scripture where nothing of the kind is intended by the writer he would thus miss the knowledge not only of what actually happened but also of the mind of the writers of the sacred text for instance zechariah speaking of some future war says chapter 14 verse 7 it shall be one day which shall be known to the lord not day nor night but at even time it shall be light in these words he seems to predict a great miracle yet he only means that the battle will be doubtful the whole day that the issue will be known only to god but that in the evening they will gain the victory the prophets frequently used to predict victories and defeats of the nations in similar phrases thus isaiah describing the destruction of babylon says chapter thirteen the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light the sun shall be darkened in his going forth and the moon shall not cause her light to shine now i suppose no one imagines that at the destruction of babylon these phenomena actually occurred any more than that which the prophet adds for i will make the heavens to tremble and remove the earth out of her place so too isaiah in foretelling to the jews that they would return from babylon to jerusalem in safety 
and would not suffer from thirst on their journey, says, and they thirsted not when he led them through the deserts. He caused the waters to flow out of the rocks for them. He clave the rocks and the waters gushed out. These words merely mean that the Jews, like other people, found springs in the desert at which they quenched their thirst. For when the Jews returned to Jerusalem with the consent of Cyrus, it is admitted that no similar miracles befell them. In this way, many occurrences in the Bible are to be regarded merely as Jewish expressions. There is no need for me to go through them in detail, but I will call attention generally to the fact that the Jews employed such phrases not only rhetorically, but also, and indeed chiefly, from devotional motives. Such is the reason for the substitution of bless God for curse God in 1 Kings chapter 21 verse 10 and Job 2 verse 9 and for all things being referred to God, whence it appears that the Bible seems to relate nothing but miracles, even when speaking of the most ordinary occurrences, as in the examples given above. Hence we must believe that when the Bible says that the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, it only means that Pharaoh was obstinate. When it says that God opened the windows of heaven, it only means that it rained very hard, and so on. When we reflect on these peculiarities, and also on the fact that most things are related very shortly, with very little detail, and almost in abridgments, we shall see that there is hardly anything in Scripture which can be proved contrary to natural reason, while, on the other hand, many things which before seemed obscure will after a little consideration be understood and easily explained. I think I have now very clearly explained all that I proposed to explain, but before I finish this chapter, I would call attention to the fact that I have adopted a different method in speaking of miracles to that which I employed in treating of prophecy. Of prophecy I have asserted nothing which could not be inferred from promises revealed in Scripture, whereas in this chapter I have deduced my conclusions solely from the principles ascertained by the natural light of reason. I have proceeded in this way advisedly for prophecy, in that it surpasses human knowledge is a purely theoretical question. Therefore, I knew that I could not make any assertions about it, nor learn wherein it consists, except through deductions from premises that have been revealed. Therefore I was compelled to collate the history of prophecy, and to draw therefrom certain conclusions which would teach me, in so far as such teaching is possible, the nature and properties of the gift. But in the case of miracles, as our inquiry is a question purely philosophical, namely, whether anything can happen which contravenes or does not follow from the laws of nature, I was not under any such necessity. I therefore thought it wiser to unravel the difficulty through premises ascertained and thoroughly known by the natural light of reason. I say I thought it wiser, for I could also easily have solved the problem merely from the doctrines and fundamental principles of Scripture. In order that every one may acknowledge this, I will briefly show how it could be done. Scripture makes the general assertion in several passages that nature's course is fixed and unchangeable. In Psalm 148, verse 6, for instance, and in Jeremiah, chapter 31, verse 35, the wise man, also in Ecclesiastes, chapter 1, verse 10, distinctly teaches that there is nothing new under the sun. And in verses 11 and 12, illustrating the same idea, he adds, that although something occasionally happens which seems new, it is not really new, but hath been already of old time, which was before us, whereof there is no remembrance, neither shall there be any remembrance of things that are to come with those that come after. Again in chapter 3 verse 11 he says, God hath made everything beautiful in his time, and immediately afterwards adds, I know that whatsoever God doeth, it shall be for ever. Nothing can be put to it, nor anything taken from it. Now all these texts teach most distinctly that nature preserves a fixed and unchangeable order, and that God in all ages, known and unknown, has been the same. Further, that the laws of nature are so perfect that nothing can be added thereto, nor taken therefrom. And lastly, that miracles only appear as something new because of man's ignorance. Such is the express teaching of Scripture. Nowhere does Scripture assert that anything happens which contradicts or cannot follow from the laws of nature, and, therefore, we should not attribute to it such a doctrine. To these considerations we must add that miracles require causes and attendant circumstances, 
and that they follow not from some mysterious royal power which the masses attribute to god but from the divine rule and decree that is as we have shown from scripture itself from the laws and order of nature lastly that miracles can be wrought even by false prophets as is proved from deuteronomy chapter 13 and matthew chapter 24 verse 24 the conclusion then that is most plainly put before us is that miracles were natural occurrences and must therefore be so explained as to appear neither new in the words of solomon nor contrary to nature but as far as possible in complete agreement with ordinary events this can easily be done by any one now that i have set forth the rules drawn from scripture nevertheless though i maintain that scripture teaches this doctrine i do not assert that it teaches it as a truth necessary to salvation but only that the prophets were in agreement with ourselves on the point therefore every one is free to think on the subject as he likes according as he thinks it best for himself and most likely to conduce the worship of god and to single-hearted religion this is also the opinion of josephus for at the conclusion of the second book of his antiquities he writes let no man think the story incredible of the seas dividing to save these people for we find it in ancient records that this hath been seen before whether by god's extraordinary will or by the course of nature it is indifferent the same thing happened one time to the macedonians under the command of alexander when for want of another passage the pamphylian sea divided to make them way god's providence making use of alexander at that time as his instrument for destroying the persian empire this is attested by all the historians who have pretended to write the life of that prince but people are at liberty to think what they please such are the words of josephus and such is his opinion on faith in miracles end of section six read for you by chiquito crasto birmingham alabama Section 7 of A Theological Political Treatise by Baruch Benedict de Spinoza, translated by Robert Harvey Monroe Elvis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read for you by Chiquito Crasto. Chapter 7, Part 1 Of the Interpretation of Scripture. When people declare, as all are ready to do, that the Bible is the Word of God, teaching man true blessedness and the way of salvation, they evidently do not mean what they say. For the masses take no pains at all to live according to Scripture. And we see most people endeavouring to hawk about their own commentaries as the word of God, and giving their best efforts under the guise of religion, to compelling others to think as they do. We generally see, I say, theologians anxious to learn how to wring their inventions and sayings out of the sacred text, and to fortify them with divine authority such persons never display less scruple or more zeal than when they are interpreting scripture or the mind of the holy ghost if we ever see them perturbed it is not that they fear to attribute some error to the holy spirit and to stray from the right path but that they are afraid to be convicted of error by others and thus to overthrow and bring into contempt their own authority but if men really believed what they verbally testify of scripture they would adopt quite a different plan of life their minds would not be agitated by so many contentions nor so many hatreds and they would cease to be excited by such a blind and rash passion for interpreting the sacred writings and excogitating novelties in religion on the contrary they would not dare to adopt as the teaching of scripture anything which they could not plainly deduce therefrom lastly those sacrilegious persons who have dared in several passages to interpolate the bible would have shrunk from so great a crime and would have stayed their sacrilegious hands ambition and unscrupulousness have acts so powerful that religion is thought to consist not so much in respecting the writings of the holy ghost as in defending human commentaries so that religion is no longer identified with charity but with spreading discord and propagating insensate hatred disguised under the name of zeal for the lord and eager ardour to these evils we must add superstition which teaches men to despise reason and nature and only to admire and venerate that which is repugnant to both 
Whence it is not wonderful that for the sake of increasing the admiration and veneration felt for Scripture, men strive to explain it so as to make it appear to contradict as far as possible both one and the other. Thus they dream that most profound mysteries lie hid in the Bible, and weary themselves out in the investigation of these absurdities to the neglect of what is useful. Every result of their diseased imagination they attribute to the Holy Ghost, and strive to defend with the utmost zeal and passion, for it is an observed fact that men employ their reason to defend conclusions arrived at by reason, but conclusions arrived at by the passions are defended by the passions. If we could separate ourselves from the crowd and escape from theological prejudices, instead of rashly accepting human commentaries for divine documents, we must consider the true method of interpreting Scripture and dwell upon it at some length. For if we remain in ignorance of this, we cannot know, certainly, what the Bible and the Holy Spirit wish to teach. I may sum up the matter by saying that the method of interpreting Scripture does not widely differ from the method of interpreting nature. In fact, it is almost the same. For, as the interpretation of nature consists in the examination of the history of nature, and therefrom deducing definitions of natural phenomena on certain fixed axioms, so scriptural interpretation proceeds by the examination of scripture and inferring the intention of its authors as a legitimate conclusion from its fundamental principles by working in this manner every one will always advance without danger of error that is if they admit no principles for interpreting scripture and discussing its contents save such as they find in scripture itself and will be able with equal security to discuss what surpasses our understanding, and what is known by the natural light of reason. In order to make clear that such a method is not only correct, but is also the only one advisable, and that it agrees with that employed in interpreting nature, I must remark that Scripture very often treats of matters which cannot be deduced from principles known to reason, for it is chiefly made up of narratives and revelation. The narratives generally contain miracles, that is, as we have shown in the last chapter, relations of extraordinary natural occurrences adapted to the opinions and judgment of the historians who recorded them. The revelations also were adapted to the opinions of the prophets, as we showed in chapter 2, and in themselves surpassed human comprehension. Therefore the knowledge of all these, that is, of nearly the whole contents of Scripture, must be sought from Scripture alone, even as the knowledge of nature is sought from nature. As for the moral doctrines which are also contained in the Bible, they may be demonstrated from received axioms, but we cannot prove in the same manner that Scripture intended to teach them. This can only be learned from Scripture itself. If we would bear unprejudiced witness to the divine origin of Scripture, we must prove solely on its own authority that it teaches true moral doctrines, for by such means alone can its divine origin be demonstrated as we have shown that the certitude of the prophets depended chiefly on their having minds turned towards what is just and good, therefore we ought to have proof of their possessing this quality before we repose faith in them. From miracles God's divinity cannot be proved, as I have already shown, and need not now repeat, for miracles could be wrought by false prophets. Wherefore the divine origin of Scripture must consist solely in its teaching true virtue but we must come to our conclusion simply on scriptural grounds. For if we were unable to do so, we could not, unless strongly prejudiced, accept the Bible and bear witness to its divine origin. Our knowledge of scripture must then be looked for in scripture only. Lastly, scripture does not give us definitions of things any more than nature does. Therefore, such definitions must be sought in the latter case from the diverse workings of nature in the former case from the various narratives about the given subject which occur in the Bible. The universal rule, then, in interpreting Scripture is to accept nothing as an authoritative scriptural statement which we do not perceive very clearly when we examine it in the light of its history. What I mean by its history, and what should be the chief points elucidated, I will now explain. The history of a scriptural statement comprises 1 the nature and properties of the language in which the books of the Bible were written, and in which their authors were accustomed to speak. We shall thus be able to investigate every expression 
by comparison with common conversational usages. Now all the writers, both of the Old Testament and the New, were Hebrews. Therefore a knowledge of the Hebrew language is before all things necessary, not only for the comprehension of the Old Testament, which was written in that tongue, but also of the New. For although the latter was published in other languages, yet its characteristics are Hebrew. 2. An analysis of each book and arrangement of its contents under heads, so that we may have at hand the various texts which treat of a given subject. Lastly, a note of all the passages which are ambiguous or obscure, or which seem mutually contradictory. I call passages clear or obscure according as their meaning is inferred, easily or with difficulty in relation to the context, not according as their truth is perceived easily or the reverse by reason. We are at work not on the truth of passages, but solely on their meaning. We must take special care when we are in search of the meaning of a text not to be led away by our reason in so far as it is founded on principles of natural knowledge, to say nothing of prejudices. In order not to confound the meaning of a passage with its truth, we must examine it solely by means of the signification of the words, or by a reason acknowledging no foundation but scripture. I will illustrate my meaning by an example. The words of Moses, God is a fire, and God is jealous, are perfectly clear, so long as we regard merely the signification of the words and I therefore reckon them among the clear passages, though in relation to reason and truth they are most obscure. Still, although the literal meaning is repugnant to the natural light of reason, nevertheless, if it cannot be clearly overruled on grounds and principles derived from its scriptural history, it, that is, the literal meaning, must be the one retained. And contrarywise, if these passages literally interpreted are found to clash with principles derived from scripture, though such literal interpretation were in absolute harmony with reason, they must be interpreted in a different manner, that is, metaphorically. If we would know whether Moses believed God to be a fire or not, we must on no account decide the question on grounds of the reasonableness or the reverse of such an opinion, but must judge solely by the other opinions of Moses which are on record. In the present instance, as Moses says in several other passages, that God has no likeness to any visible thing, whether in heaven or in earth, or in the water, either all such passages must be taken metaphorically, or else the one before us must be so explained. However, as we should depart as little as possible from the literal sense, we must first ask whether this text, God is a fire, admits of any but the literal meaning, that is, whether the word fire ever means anything besides ordinary natural fire. If no such second meaning can be found, the text must be taken literally however repugnant to reason it may be, and all the other passages, though in complete accordance with reason, must be brought into harmony with it. If the verbal expressions would not admit of being thus harmonized, we should have to set them down as irreconcilable, and suspend our judgment concerning them. However, as we find the name fire applied to anger and jealousy, see Job chapter 31 verse 12, we can thus easily reconcile the words of Moses and legitimately conclude that the two propositions, God is a fire and God is jealous, are in meaning identical. Further, as Moses clearly teaches that God is jealous, and nowhere states that God is without passions or emotions, we must evidently infer that Moses held this doctrine himself, or at any rate, that he wished to teach it, nor must we refrain, because such a belief seems contrary to reason. For, as we have shown, we cannot arrest the meaning of texts to suit the dictates of our reason, or our preconceived opinions. The whole knowledge of the Bible must be sought solely from itself. 3. Lastly, such a history should relate the environment of all the prophetic books extant, that is, the life, the conduct, and the studies of the author of each book, who he was, what was the occasion, and the epoch of his writing, whom did he write for, and in what language. Further, it should inquire into the fate of each book, how it was first received, into whose hands it fell, how many different versions there were of it, by whose advice was it received into the Bible, and, lastly, how all the books now universally accepted as sacred were united into a single whole. All such information should, as I have said, be contained in the history of Scripture. For, in order to know what statements are set forth as laws, and what as moral precepts, it is important to be acquainted with the life, 
the conduct and the pursuits of their author moreover it becomes easier to explain a man's writings in proportion as we have more intimate knowledge of his genius and temperament further that we may not confound precepts which are eternal with those which served only a temporary purpose or were only meant for a few we should know what was the occasion the time the age in which each book was written and to what nation it was addressed lastly we should have knowledge on the other points i have mentioned in order to be sure in addition to the authenticity of the work that it has not been tampered with by sacrilegious hands or whether errors can have crept in and if so whether they have been corrected by men sufficiently skilled and worthy of credence all these things should be known that we may not be led away by blind impulse to accept whatever is thrust on our notice instead of only that which is sure and indisputable now when we are in possession of this history of scripture and have finally decided that we assert nothing as prophetic doctrine which does not directly follow from such history or which is not clearly deducible from it then i say it will be time to gird ourselves for the task of investigating the mind of the prophets and of the holy spirit but in this further arguing also we shall require a method very like that employed in interpreting nature from her history as in the examination of natural phenomena we try first to investigate what is most universal and common to all nature such for instance as motion and rest and their laws and rules which nature always observes and through which she continually works and then we proceed to what is less universal so too in the history of scripture we first seek for that which is most universal and serves for the basis and foundation of all scripture a doctrine in fact that is commended by all the prophets as eternal and most profitable to all men for example that god is one and that he is omnipotent that he alone should be worshipped that he has a care for all men and that he especially loves those who adore him and love their neighbour as themselves etc these and similar doctrines i repeat scripture everywhere so clearly and expressly teaches that no one was ever in doubt of its meaning concerning them the nature of god his manner of regarding and providing for things and similar doctrines scripture nowhere teaches professedly and as eternal doctrine on the contrary we have shown that the prophets themselves did not agree on the subject therefore we must not lay down any doctrine as scriptural on such subjects though it may appear perfectly clear on rational grounds from a proper knowledge of this universal doctrine of scripture we must then proceed to other doctrines less universal but which nevertheless have regard to the general conduct of life and flow from all the universal doctrine like rivulets from a source such are all particular external manifestations of true virtue which need a given occasion for their exercise whatever is obscure or ambiguous on such points in scripture must be explained and defined by its universal doctrine with regard to contradictory instances we must observe the occasion and the time in which they were written for instance when christ says blessed are they that mourn for they shall be comforted we do not know from the actual passage what sort of mourners are meant as however christ afterwards teaches that we should have care for nothing save only for the kingdom of god and his righteousness which is commended as the highest good see matthew chapter 6 verse 33 it follows that by mourners he only meant those who mourn for the kingdom of god and righteousness neglected by man for this would be the only cause of mourning to those who love nothing but the divine kingdom and justice and who evidently despise the gifts of fortune so too when christ says but if a man strike you on the right cheek turn to him the left also and the words which follow if he had given such a command as a lawgiver to judges he would thereby have abrogated the law of moses but this he expressly says he did not do matthew chapter 5 verse 17 wherefore we must consider who was the speaker what was the occasion and to whom were the words addressed now christ said that he did not ordain laws as a legislator but inculcated precepts as a teacher inasmuch as he did not aim at correcting outward actions so much as the frame of mind further these words were spoken to men who were oppressed who lived in a corrupt commonwealth on the brink of ruin where justice was utterly neglected the very doctrine inculcated here by christ just before the destruction of the city 
was also taught by Jeremiah before the first destruction of Jerusalem, that is, in similar circumstances as we see from Lamentations chapter 3, verses 25 to 30. Now, as such teaching was only set forth by the prophets in times of oppression, and was even then never laid down as a law, and as, on the other hand, Moses, who did not write in times of oppression, but, mark this, strove to found a well-ordered commonwealth, while condemning envy and hatred of one's neighbour, yet ordained that an eye should be given for an eye. It follows more clearly from these purely scriptural grounds that this precept of Christ and Jeremiah concerning submission to injuries was only valid in places where justice is neglected, and in a time of oppression, but does not hold good in a well-ordered state. In a well-ordered state, where justice is administered, every one is bound, if he would be accounted just, to demand penalties before the judge. See Leviticus chapter 5 verse 1, not for the sake of vengeance, Leviticus chapter 19 verses 17 and 18, but in order to defend justice and his country's laws, and to prevent the wicked rejoicing in their wickedness. All this is plainly in accordance with reason. I might cite many other examples in the same manner, but I think the foregoing are sufficient to explain my meaning and the utility of this method, and this is all my present purpose. Hitherto we have only shown how to investigate those passages of Scripture which treat of practical conduct, and which, therefore, are more easily examined, for on such subjects there was never really any controversy among the writers of the Bible. The purely speculative passages cannot be so easily traced to their real meaning. The way becomes narrower, for as the prophets differed in matters speculative among themselves, and the narratives are in great measure adapted to the prejudices of each age, we must not on any account infer the intention of one prophet from clearer passages in the writings of another, nor must we so explain his meaning, unless it is perfectly plain that the two prophets were at one in the matter. How are we to strive at the intention of the prophets in such cases, I will briefly explain. Here, too, we must begin from the most universal proposition, inquiring first from the most clear scriptural statements what is the nature of prophecy or revelation, and wherein does it consist. Then we must proceed to miracles, and so on to whatever is most general, till we come to the opinions of a particular prophet, and, at last, to the meaning of a particular revelation, prophecy, history, or miracle. We have already pointed out that great caution is necessary not to confound the mind of a prophet or historian with the mind of the Holy Spirit and the truth of the matter. Therefore, I need not dwell further on the subject. I would, however, here remark concerning the meaning of revelation that the present method only teaches us what the prophets really saw or heard, not what they desire to signify or represent by symbols. The latter may be guessed at, but cannot be inferred with certainty from scriptural premises. We have thus shown the plan for interpreting scripture, and have at the same time demonstrated that it is the one and surest way of investigating its true meaning. I am willing indeed to admit that those persons, if any such there be, would be more absolutely certainly right, who have received either a trustworthy tradition or an assurance from the prophets themselves, such as is claimed by the Pharisees, or who have a pontiff gifted with infallibility in the interpretation of Scripture, such as the Roman Catholics boast. But as we can never be perfectly sure, either of such a tradition or of the authority of the pontiff, we cannot found any certain conclusion on either. The one is denied by the oldest sect of Christians, the other by the oldest sect of Jews. Indeed, if we consider the series of years to mention no other point accepted by the Pharisees from their rabbis, during which time they say they have handed down the tradition from Moses, we shall find that it is not correct, as I show elsewhere. Therefore, such a tradition should be received with extreme suspicion, and although, according to our method, we are bound to consider as uncorrupted the tradition of the Jews, namely the meaning of the Hebrew words which we receive from them, we may accept the latter while retaining our doubts about the former. No one has ever been able to change the meaning of a word in ordinary use, though many have changed the meaning of a particular sentence. Such a proceeding would be most difficult, for whoever attempted to change the meaning of a word 
would be compelled at the same time to explain all the authors who employed it, each according to his temperament and intention, or else with consummate cunning to falsify them. Further, the masses and the learned alike preserve language, but it is only the learned who preserve the meaning of particular sentences and books. Thus we may easily imagine that the learned have a very rare book in their power, might change or corrupt the meaning of a sentence in it, but they could not alter the signification of the words. Moreover, if any one wanted to change the meaning of a common word, he would not be able to keep up the change among posterity, or in common parlance or writing. For these and such like reasons we may readily conclude that it would never enter into the mind of any one to corrupt a language, though the intention of a writer may often have been falsified by changing his phrases or interpreting them amiss. As then our method, based on the principle that the knowledge of Scripture must be sought from itself alone, is the sole true one, we must evidently renounce any knowledge which it cannot furnish for the complete understanding of Scripture. I will now point out its difficulties and shortcomings, which prevent our gaining a complete and assured knowledge of the sacred text. Its first great difficulty consists in its requiring a thorough knowledge of the Hebrew language. Where is such knowledge to be obtained? The men of old who employed the Hebrew tongue have left none of the principles and bases of their language to posterity. We have from them absolutely nothing in the way of dictionary, grammar, or rhetoric. Now the Hebrew nation has lost all its grace and beauty, as one would expect after the defeats and persecutions it has gone through and has only retained certain fragments of its language and of a few books. Nearly all the names of the fruits, birds, and fishes, and many other words have perished in the wear and tear of time. Further, the meaning of many nouns and verbs which occur in the Bible are either utterly lost or are subjects of dispute. And not only are these gone, but we are lacking in a knowledge of Hebrew phraseology. The devouring tooth of time has destroyed nearly all the phrases and turns of expression peculiar to the Hebrews, so that we know them no more. Therefore, we cannot investigate, as we would, all the meanings of a sentence by the use of the language. And there are many phrases of which the meaning is most obscure or altogether inexplicable, though the component words are perfectly plain. To this impossibility of tracing the history of the Hebrew language must be added its particular nature and composition. These give rise to so many ambiguities that it is impossible to find a method which would enable us to gain a certain knowledge of all the statements in Scripture. In addition to the sources of ambiguities common to all languages, there are many peculiar to Hebrew. These I think it worth while to mention. Firstly, an ambiguity often arises in the Bible from our mistaking one letter for another similar one. The Hebrews divide the letters of the alphabet into five classes, according to the five organs of the mouth employed in pronouncing them namely the lips, the tongue, the teeth, the palate, and the throat. For instance, alpha, get, chagain, ch are called gutturals, and are barely distinguishable by any sign that we know one from the other. L, which signifies two, is often taken for chagal, which signifies above, and vice versa. Hence, sentences are often rendered rather ambiguous or meaningless. A second difficulty arises from the multiplied meaning of conjunctions and adverbs. For instance, vow serves promiscuously for a particle of union or of separation, meaning and, but, because, however, then. Key has seven or eight meanings, namely, wherefore, although, if, when, inasmuch, as, because, a burning, etc., and so on with almost all particles. The third very fertile source of doubt is the fact that Hebrew verbs in the indicative mood lack the present, the past imperfect, the pluperfect, the future perfect, and other tenses most frequently employed in other languages. In the imperative and infinitive moods they are wanting in all except the present, and a subjunctive mood does not exist. Now, although all these defects in moods and tenses may be supplied by certain fundamental rules of the language with ease and even elegance, the ancient writers evidently neglected such rules altogether and employed indifferently future for present and past and vice versa, past for future, and also indicative for imperative and subjunctive, with the result of considerable confusion. End of section seven, read for you by Chiquito Crasto, Birmingham, Alabama.
Section 8 of A Theological Political Treatise by Baruch Benedict de Spinoza Translated by Robert Harvey Monroe Elvis This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read for you by Chiquito Crasto. Chapter 7, Part 2 Besides these sources of ambiguity, there are two others, one very important. Firstly, there are in Hebrew no vowels. Secondly, the sentences are not separated by any marks, elucidating the meaning or separating the clauses. Though the want of these two has generally been supplied by points and accents, such substitutes cannot be accepted by us, inasmuch as they were invented and designed by men of an after age whose authority should carry no weight. The ancients wrote without points, that is, without vowels and accents, as is abundantly testified. Their descendants added what was lacking, according to their own ideas of scriptural interpretation, Wherefore, the existing accents and points are simply current interpretations and are no more authoritative than any other commentaries. Those who are ignorant of this fact cannot justify the author of the epistle to the Hebrews for interpreting chapter 11 verse 21 and Genesis chapter 47 verse 31 very differently from the version given in our Hebrew text as at present pointed, as though the apostle had been obliged to learn the meaning of scripture from those who added the points. In my opinion, the latter are clearly wrong. In order that every one may judge for himself and also see how the discrepancy arose simply from the want of vowels, I will give both interpretations. Those who pointed our version read, and Israel bent himself over, or changing Hegain into Aleph, a similar letter, towards the head of the bed. The author of the epistle reads, and Israel bent himself over the head of his staff, substituting mat for mita, from which it only differs in respect of vowels. Now, as in this narrative, it is Jacob's age only that is in question, and not his illness, which is not touched on till the next chapter. It seems more likely that the historian intended to say that Jacob bent over the head of his staff, a thing commonly used by men of advanced age for their support, than that he bowed himself at the head of his bed, especially as for the former reading no substitution of letters is required. In this example I have desired not only to reconcile the passage in which the epistle with the passage in Genesis, but also and chiefly to illustrate how little trust should be placed in the points and accents which are found in our present Bible, and so to prove that he who would be without bias in interpreting Scripture should hesitate about accepting them and inquire afresh for himself. Such being the nature and structure of the Hebrew language, one may easily understand that many difficulties are likely to arise, and that no possible method could solve all of them. It is useless to hope for a way out of our difficulties in the comparison of various parallel passages. We have shown that the only method of discovering the true sense of a passage, out of many alternative ones, is to see what are the usages of the language. For this comparison of parallel passages can only accidentally throw light on a difficult point, seeing that the prophets never wrote with the express object of explaining their own phrases or those of other people, and also because we cannot infer the meaning of one prophet or apostle by the meaning of another, unless on a purely practical question, not when the matter is speculative, or if a miracle or history is being narrated. I might illustrate my point with instances for there are many inexplicable phrases in Scripture, but I would rather pass on to consider the difficulties and imperfections of the method under discussion. A further difficulty attends the method from the fact that it requires the history of all that has happened to every book in the Bible. Such a history we are often quite unable to furnish. Of the authors, or, if the expression be preferred, the writers of many of the books, we are either in complete ignorance or at any rate in doubt, as I will point out at length. Further, we do not know either the occasion or the epochs when these books of unknown authorship were written. We cannot say into what hands they fell, nor how the numerous varying versions originated, nor lastly whether they were not other versions now lost. I have briefly shown that such knowledge is necessary, but I pass over certain considerations which I will now draw attention to. If we read a book which contains incredible or impossible narratives, or is written in a very obscure style, and if we know nothing of its author, nor of the time or occasion of its being written, we shall vainly endeavour to gain any certain knowledge of its true meaning. 
for being in ignorance on these points we cannot possibly know the aim or intended aim of the author if we are fully informed we so order our thoughts as not to be in any way prejudiced either in ascribing to the author or him for whom the author wrote either more or less than his meaning and we only take into consideration what the author may have had in his mind or what the time and occasion demanded i think this must be tolerably evident to all it also happens that in different books we read histories in themselves similar but which we judge very differently according to the opinions we have formed of the authors i remember once to have read in some book that a man named orlando furioso used to drive a kind of winged monster through the air fly over any countries he liked kill unaided vast number of men and giants and such like fancies which from the point of view of reason are obviously absurd a very similar story i read in ovid of perseus and also in the books of judges and kings of samson who alone and unarmed killed thousands of men and of elijah who flew through the air and at last went up to heaven in a chariot of fire with horses of fire all these stories are obviously alike but we judge them very differently the first only sought to amuse the second had a political object the third a religious object we gather this simply from the opinions we have previously formed of the authors thus it is evidently necessary to know something of the authors of writings which are obscure or unintelligible if we would interpret their meaning and for the same reason in order to choose the proper reading from among a great variety we ought to have information as to the versions in which the differences are found and as to the possibility of other readings have been discovered by persons of greater authority a further difficulty attends this method in the case of some of the books of scripture namely that they are no longer extant in their original language the gospel according to matthew and certainly the epistle to the hebrews were written it is taught in hebrew though they no longer exist in that form aben ezra affirms in his commentaries that the book of job was translated into hebrew out of another language and that its obscurity arises from this fact i say nothing of the apocryphal books for their authority stands on very inferior ground the foregoing difficulties in this method of interpreting scripture from its own history i conceive to be so great that i do not hesitate to say that the true meaning of scripture is in many places inexplicable or at best mere subject for guesswork but i must again point out on the other hand that such difficulties only arise when we endeavour to follow the meaning of a prophet in matters which cannot be perceived but only imagined not in things whereof the understanding can give a clear and distinct idea and which are conceivable through themselves matters which by their nature are easily perceived cannot be expressed so obscurely as to be unintelligible as the proverb says a word is enough to the wise euclid who only wrote of matters very simple and easily understood can easily be comprehended by any one in any language we can follow his intention perfectly and be certain of his true meaning without having a thorough knowledge of the language in which he wrote in fact a quite rudimentary acquaintance is sufficient we need make no researches concerning the life the pursuits or the habits of the author nor indeed we inquire in what language nor when he wrote nor the vicissitudes of his book nor its various readings nor how nor by whose advice it has been received what we here say of euclid might equally be said of any book which treats of things by their nature perceptible thus we conclude that we can easily follow the intention of scripture in moral questions from the history we possess of it and we can be sure of its true meaning the precepts of true piety are expressed in very ordinary language and are equally simple and easily understood further as true salvation and blessedness consist in a true ascent of the soul and we truly assent only to what we clearly understand it is most plain that we can follow with certainty the intention of scripture in matters relating to salvation and necessary to blessedness therefore we need not be much troubled about what remains such matters inasmuch as we generally cannot grasp them with our reason and understanding are more curious than profitable i think i have now set forth the true method of scriptural interpretation and have sufficiently explained my own opinion thereon besides i do not doubt that every one will see that such a method only requires the aid of natural reason the nature and efficacy of the natural reason consists in deducing and proving the unknown from the known 
or in carrying premises to their legitimate conclusions, and these are the very processes which our method desiderates. Though we must admit that it does not suffice to explain everything in the Bible, such imperfection does not spring from its own nature, but from the fact that the path which it teaches us, as the true one, has never been tended or trodden by men, and has thus by the lapse of time become very difficult and almost impossible, as indeed I have shown in the difficulties I draw attention to. There only remains to examine the opinions of those who differ from me. The first, which comes under our notice, is that the light of nature has no power to interpret scripture, but that a supernatural faculty is required for the task. What is meant by this supernatural faculty, I will leave to its propounders to explain. Personally, I can only suppose that they have adopted a very obscure way of stating their complete uncertainty about the true meaning of Scripture. If we look at their interpretations, they contain nothing supernatural, at least nothing but the merest conjectures. Let them be placed side by side with the interpretations of those who frankly confess that they have no faculty beyond their natural ones. We shall see that the two are just alike, both human, both pondered over, both laboriously invented. To say that the natural reason is insufficient for such results is plainly untrue. Firstly, for the reasons above stated, namely that the difficulty of interpreting Scripture arises from no defect in human reason, but simply from the carelessness, not to say malice, of men who neglected the history of the Bible while there were still materials for inquiry. Secondly, from the fact, admitted, I think, by all, that the supernatural faculty is a divine gift granted only to the faithful. But the prophets and apostles did not preach to the faithful only, but chiefly to the unfaithful and wicked. Such persons, therefore, were able to understand the intention of the prophets and apostles. Otherwise, the prophets and apostles would have seemed to be preaching to little boys and infants, not to men endowed with reason. Moses, too, would have given his laws in vain if they could only be comprehended by the faithful, who need no law. Indeed, those who demand supernatural faculties for comprehending the meaning of the prophets and apostles seem truly lacking in natural faculties, so that we should hardly suppose such persons the possessors of a divine supernatural gift. The opinion of Maimonides was widely different. He asserted that each passage in Scripture admits of various, nay, contrary meanings, but that we could never be certain of any particular one till we knew that the passage as we interpreted it contained nothing contrary or repugnant to reason. If the literal meaning clashes with reason, though the passage seems in itself perfectly clear, it must be interpreted in some metaphorical sense. This doctrine he lays down very plainly in chapter 25, part 2 of his book, More Nebuchim, for he says, Know that we shrink not from affirming that the world hath existed from eternity, because of what Scripture saith concerning the world's creation. For the texts which teach that the world was created are not more in number than those which teach that God hath a body. Neither are the approaches in this matter of the world's creation closed, or even made hard to us. So that we should not be able to explain what is written, as we did when we showed that God hath no body, nay, peradventure, we could explain and make fast the doctrine of the world's eternity more easily than we did away with the doctrines that God hath a beatified body. Yet two things hinder me from doing as I have said, and believing that the world is eternal. As it hath been clearly shown that God hath not a body, we must perforce explain all those passages whereof the literal sense agreeeth not with the demonstration, for sure it is that they can be so explained. But the eternity of the world hath not been so demonstrated. Therefore it is not necessary to do violence to Scripture in support of some common opinion, whereof we might, at the bidding of reason, embrace the contrary. Such are the words of Maimonides, and they are evidently sufficient to establish our point, for if he had been convinced by reason that the world is eternal, he would not have hesitated to twist and explain away the words of Scripture till he made them appear to teach this doctrine. He would have felt quite sure that Scripture, though everywhere plainly denying the eternity of the world, really intends to teach it. So that, however clear the meaning of Scripture may be, he would not feel certain of having grasped it, so long as he remained doubtful of the truth of what was written. For we are in doubt whether a thing is in conformity with reason, or contrary thereto, so long as we are uncertain of its truth, and, consequently, we cannot be sure 
whether the literal meaning of a passage be true or false. If such a theory as this were sound, I would certainly grant that some faculty beyond the natural reason is required for interpreting Scripture. For nearly all things that we find in Scripture cannot be inferred from known principles of the natural reason, and therefore we should be unable to come to any conclusion about their truth or about the real meaning and intention of Scripture, but should stand in need of some further assistance. Further, the truth of this theory would involve that the masses, having generally no comprehension of, nor leisure for, detailed proofs, would be reduced to receiving all their knowledge of Scripture on the authority and testimony of philosophers, and consequently would be compelled to suppose that the interpretations given by philosophers were infallible. Truly, this would be a new form of ecclesiastical authority, and a new sort of priests or pontiffs more likely to excite men's ridicule than their veneration. Certainly, our method demands a knowledge of Hebrew for which the masses have no leisure. But no such objection as the foregoing can be brought against us. For the ordinary Jews or Gentiles, to whom the prophets and apostles preached and wrote, understood the language, and, consequently, the intention of the prophet or apostle addressing them. But they did not grasp the intrinsic reason of what was preached, which, according to Maimonides, would be necessary for an understanding of it. There is nothing, then, in our method which renders it necessary that the masses should follow the testimony of commentators, for I point to a set of unlearned people who understood the language of the prophets and apostles, whereas Maimonides could not point to any such who could arrive at the prophetic or apostolic meaning through their knowledge of the cause of things. As to the multitude of our time, we have shown that whatsoever is necessary to salvation, though its reasons may be unknown, can easily be understood in any language, because it is thoroughly ordinary and usual. It is in such understanding as this that the masses acquiesce, not in the testimony of commentators, with regard to other questions, the ignorant and the learned fare alike. But let us return to the opinion of Maimonides and examine it more closely. In the first place, he supposes that the prophets were in entire agreement one with another, and that they were consummate philosophers and theologians for he would have them to have based their conclusion on the absolute truth. Further, he supposes that the sense of Scripture cannot be made plain from Scripture itself, for the truth of things is not made plain therein, in that it does not prove anything, nor teach the matters of which it speaks through their definitions and first causes. Therefore, according to Maimonides, the true sense of Scripture cannot be made plain from itself, and must not be there sought. The falsity of such a doctrine is shown in this very chapter. For we have shown, both by reason and examples, that the meaning of Scripture is only made plain through Scripture itself, and even in questions deducible from ordinary knowledge should be looked for from no other source. Lastly, such a theory supposes that we may explain the words of Scripture according to our preconceived opinions, twisting them about, and reversing or completely changing the literal sense, however plain it may be. Such license is utterly opposed to the teaching of this and the preceding chapters, and moreover will be evident to every one as rash and excessive. But if we grant all this license, what can it effect after all? Absolutely nothing. Those things which cannot be demonstrated, and which make up the greater part of Scripture, cannot be examined by reason, and cannot therefore be explained or interpreted by this rule. Whereas, on the contrary, by following our own method, we can explain many questions of this nature, and discuss them on a sure basis as we have already shown by reason and example. Those matters which are by their nature comprehensible we can easily explain, as has been pointed out, simply by means of the context. Therefore the method of Maimonides is clearly useless, to which we may add that it does away with all the certainty which the masses acquire by candid reading, or which is gained by any other persons in any other way. In conclusion, then, we dismiss Maimonides' theory as harmful, useless, and absurd. As to the tradition of the Pharisees, we have already shown that it is not consistent. While the authority of the popes of Rome stands in need of more credible evidence, the latter, indeed, I reject simply on this ground. For if the popes could point out to us the meaning of Scripture, as surely as did the high priests of the Jews, I would not be deterred by the fact that there have been heretic and impious Roman pontiffs. For among the Hebrew high priests of old, there were also heretics and impious men who gained the high priesthood by improper means. 
but who nevertheless had scriptural sanction for their supreme power of interpreting the law see deuteronomy chapter 17 verses 11 and 12 and chapter 33 verse 10 also malachi chapter 2 verse 8 however as the popes can show no such sanction their authority remains open to very grave doubt nor should any one be deceived by the example of the jewish high priests and think that a catholic religion also stands in need of a pontiff he should bear in mind that the laws of moses being also the ordinary laws of the country necessarily required some public authority to ensure their observance for if every one were free to interpret the laws of his country as he pleased no state could stand but would for that very reason be dissolved at once and public rights would become private rights with religion the case is widely different inasmuch as it consists not so much in outward actions as in simplicity and truth of character it stands outside the sphere of law and public authority simplicity and truth of character are not produced by the constraint of laws nor by the authority of the state no one the world over can be forced or legislated into a state of blessedness the means required for such a consummation are faithful and brotherly admonition sound education and above all free use of the individual judgment therefore as the supreme right of free thinking even on religion is in every man's power and as it is inconceivable that such power could be alienated it is also in every man's power to wield the supreme right and authority of free judgment in this behalf and to explain and interpret religion for himself the only reason for vesting the supreme authority in the interpretation of law and judgment on public affairs in the hands of the magistrates is that it concerns questions of public right similarly the supreme authority in explaining religion and in passing judgment thereon is lodged with the individual because it concerns questions of individual right so far then from the authority of the hebrew high priests telling in confirmation of the authority of the roman pontiffs to interpret religion it would rather tend to establish individual freedom of judgment thus in this way also we have shown that our method of interpreting scripture is the best for as the highest power of scriptural interpretation belongs to every man the rule for such interpretation should be nothing but the natural light of reason which is common to all not any supernatural light nor any external authority moreover such a rule ought not to be so difficult that it can only be applied by very skilful philosophers but should be adapted to the natural and ordinary faculties and capacity of mankind and such i have shown our method to be for such difficulties as it has arise from men's carelessness and are no part of its nature end of section eight read for you by chiquito crasto birmingham alabama section nine of a theological political treatise by baruch benedict de spinoza translated by robert harvey Monroe elvis this librivox recording is in the public domain read for you by chiquito crasto chapter eight of the authorship of the pentateuch and the other historical books of the old testament in the former chapter we treated of the foundations and principles of scriptural knowledge and showed that it consists solely in a trustworthy history of the sacred writings such a history in spite of its indispensability the ancients neglected or at any rate whatever they may have written or handed down has perished in the lapse of time consequently the groundwork for such an investigation is to a great extent cut from under us this might be put up with if succeeding generations had confined themselves within the limit of truth and had handed down conscientiously what few particulars they had received or discovered without any addition from their own brains as it is the history of the bible is not so much imperfect as untrustworthy the foundations are not only too scanty for building upon but are also unsound it is part of my purpose to remedy these defects and to remove common theological prejudices but i fear that i am attempting my task too late for men have arrived at the pitch of not suffering contradiction but defending obstinately whatever they have adopted under the name of religion so widely have these prejudices taken possession of men's minds that very few comparatively speaking will listen to reason however i will make the attempt and spare no effort for there is no positive reason for despairing of success in order to treat the subject methodically i will begin with the received opinions concerning the true authors of the sacred books 
and in the first place speak of the author of the Pentateuch, which is almost universally supposed to have been Moses. The Pharisees are so firmly convinced of his identity that they account as a heretic any one who differs from them on the subject. Wherefore, Aben Ezra, a man of enlightened intelligence and no small learning, who was the first, so far as I know, to treat of this opinion, dared not express his meaning openly, but confined himself to dark hints which I shall not scruple to elucidate, thus throwing full light on the subject. The words of Aben Ezra, which occur in his commentary on Deuteronomy, are as follows. Beyond Jordan, etc., if so be that thou understandest the mystery of the twelve. Moreover, Moses wrote the law. The Canaanite was then in the land. It shall be revealed on the mount of God. Then also behold his bed, his iron bed, then shalt thou know the truth. In these few words he hints, and also shows that it was not Moses who wrote the Pentateuch, but someone who lived long after him, and further, that the book which Moses wrote was something different from any now extant. To prove this, I say, he draws attention to the facts. 1. That the preface to Deuteronomy could not have been written by Moses, inasmuch as he had never crossed the Jordan. 2. That the whole book of Moses was written at full length on the circumference of a single altar. Deuteronomy chapter 27 and Joshua chapter 8 verse 37, which altar, according to the rabbis, consisted of only twelve stones. Therefore the book of Moses must have been of far less extent than the Pentateuch. This is what our author means, I think, by the mystery of the twelve, unless he is referring to the twelve curses contained in the chapter of Deuteronomy above cited, which he thought could not have been contained in the law, because Moses bade the Levites read them after the recital of the law, and so bind the people to its observance. Or again, he may have had in his mind the last chapter of Deuteronomy, which treats of the death of Moses, and which contains twelve verses. But there is no need to dwell further on these and similar conjectures. 3. That in Deuteronomy, chapter 31, verse 9, the expression occurs, and Moses wrote the law, words that cannot be ascribed to Moses, but must be those of some other writer narrating the deeds and writings of Moses. 4. That in Genesis, chapter 12, verse 6, the historian, after narrating that Abraham journeyed through the land of Canaan, adds, and the Canaanite was then in the land, thus clearly excluding the time at which he wrote. So that this passage must have been written after the death of Moses, when the Canaanites had been driven out, and no longer possessed the land. Aben Ezra, in his commentary on the passage, alludes to the difficulty as follows. And the Canaanite was then in the land. It appears that Canaan, the grandson of Noah, took from another the land which bears his name. If this be not the true meaning, there lurks some mystery in the passage, and let him who understands it keep silence. That is, if Canaan invaded those regions, the sense will be, the Canaanite was then in the land, in contradistinction to the time when it had been held by another. But if, as follows from Genesis chapter 10, Canaan was the first to inhabit the land, the text must mean to exclude the time present, that is the time at which it was written. Therefore it cannot be the work of Moses, in whose time the Canaanites still possessed those territories. This is the mystery concerning which silence is recommended. 5. That in Genesis chapter 22 verse 14, Mount Moriah is called the Mount of God, a name which it did not acquire till after the building of the temple. The choice of the mountain was not made in the time of Moses, for Moses does not point out any spot as chosen by God. On the contrary, he foretells that God will at some future time choose a spot to which his name will be given. 6. Lastly, that in Deuteronomy chapter 3, in the passage relating to Og, king of Bashan, these words are inserted. For only Og, king of Bashan, remained of the remnant of giants. Behold, his bedstead was a bedstead of iron. Is it not in Rabbath of the children of Ammon? Nine cubits was the length thereof, and four cubits the breadth of it, after the cubit of a man. This parenthesis most plainly shows that its writer lived long after Moses, for this mode of speaking is only employed by one treating of things long past, and pointing to relics for the sake of gaining credence. Moreover, this bed was almost certainly first discovered by David, who conquered the city of Rabbath. Second Samuel chapter 12 verse 30. 
Again, the historian, a little further on, inserts after the words of Moses, Jair, the son of Manasseh, took all the country of Argob into the coasts of Geshuri and Mahati, and called them after his own name, Bashan Havot Jair, unto this day. This passage, I say, is inserted to explain the words of Moses which preceded, and the rest of Gilead, and all Bashan, being the kingdom of Og, gave I unto half the tribe of Manasseh, all the region of Argob, with all Bashan, which is called the land of the giants. The Hebrews, in the time of the writer, indisputably knew what territories belonged to the tribe of Judah, but did not know them under the name of the jurisdiction of Argob, or the land of the giants. Therefore the writer is compelled to explain what these places were which were anciently so styled, and at the same time to point out why they were, at the time of his writing, known by the name of Jair, who was of the tribe of Manasseh, not of Judah. We have thus made clear the meaning of Aben Ezra, and also the passages of the Pentateuch, which he cites in proof of his contention. However, Aben Ezra does not call attention to every instance, or even the chief ones. There remain many of greater importance which may be cited. Namely, 1. That the writer of the books in question not only speaks of Moses in the third person, but also bears witness to many details concerning him. For instance, Moses talked with God. The Lord spoke with Moses face to face. Moses was the meekest of men. Numbers chapter 12 verse 3. Moses was wroth with the captains of the host. Moses, the man of God. Moses, the servant of the Lord, died. There was never a prophet in Israel like unto Moses, etc. On the other hand, in Deuteronomy, where the law which Moses had expounded to the people and written is set forth, Moses speaks and declares what he has done in the first person. God spake with me. Deuteronomy chapter 2, verses 1, 17, etc. I prayed to the Lord, etc. Except at the end of the book, when the historian, after relating the words of Moses, begins again to speak in the third person, and to tell how Moses handed over the law, which he had expounded to the people in writing, again admonishing them, and further, how Moses ended his life. All these details, the manner of narration, the testimony, and the context of the whole story, lead to the plain conclusion that these books were written by another, and not by Moses in person. 2. We must also remark that the history relates not only the manner of Moses' death and burial, and the thirty days of mourning of the Hebrews, but further compares him with all the prophets who came after him, and states that he surpassed them all. There was never a prophet in Israel like unto Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. Such testimony cannot have been given of Moses by himself, nor by any who immediately succeeded him, but it must come from someone who lived centuries afterwards, especially as the historian speaks of past times. There was never a prophet, etc. And of the place of burial, no one knows it to this day. 3. We must note that some places are not styled by the names they bore during Moses' lifetime, but by others which they obtained subsequently. For instance, Abraham is said to have pursued his enemies even unto Dan, a name not bestowed on the city, till long after the death of Joshua. Genesis chapter 14 verse 14. Judges chapter 18 verse 29. 4. The narrative is prolonged after the death of Moses, for in Exodus chapter 16 verse 34 we read that the children of Israel did eat manna forty years until they came to a land inhabited, until they came unto the borders of the land of Canaan. In other words, until the time alluded to in Joshua chapter 6 verse 12. So too in Genesis chapter 36 verse 31 it is stated, These are the kings that reigned in Edom before they reigned any king over the children of Israel. The historian doubtless here relates the king of Idumea before that territory was conquered by David and garrisoned, as we read in Second Samuel chapter 8 verse 14. From what has been said, it is thus clearer than the sun at noonday that the Pentateuch was not written by Moses, but by someone who lived long after Moses. Let us now turn our attention to the books which Moses actually did write, and which are cited in the Pentateuch. Thus also shall we see that they were different from the Pentateuch. Firstly, it appears from Exodus chapter 17, verse 14, that Moses, by the command of God, wrote an account of the war against Amalek. The book in which he did so is not named in the chapter just quoted, but in Numbers chapter 21, verse 12, a book is referred to under the title of the Wars of God, and doubtless this war against Amalek 
and the castrametations said in numbers chapter thirty three verse two to have been written by moses are therein described we hear also in exodus chapter twenty four verse four of another book called the book of the covenant which moses read before the israelites when they first made a covenant with god but this book or this writing contained very little namely the laws or commandments of god which we find in exodus chapter twenty verse twenty two to the end of chapter twenty four and this no one will deny who reads the aforesaid chapter rationally and impartially it is therefore stated that as soon as moses had learned the feeling of the people on the subject of making a covenant with god he immediately wrote down god's laws and utterances and in the morning after some ceremonies had been performed read out the conditions of the covenant to an assembly of the whole people when these had been gone through and doubtless understood by all the whole people gave their assent now from the shortness of the time taken in its perusal and also from its nature as a compact this document evidently contained nothing more than that which we have just described further it is clear that moses explained all the laws which he had received in the fortieth year after the exodus from egypt also that he bound over the people a second time to observe them and that finally he committed them to writing deuteronomy chapter one verse five chapter twenty nine verse fourteen chapter thirty one verse nine in a book which contained these laws explained and the new covenant and this book was therefore called the book of the law of god the same which was afterwards added to by joshua when he set forth the fresh covenant with which he bound over the people and which he entered into with god joshua chapter twenty four verses twenty five twenty six now as we have extant no book containing this covenant of moses and also the covenant of joshua we must perforce conclude that it has perished unless indeed we adopt the wild conjecture of the chaldean paraphrased jonathan and twist about the words of scripture to our heart's content this commentator in the face of our present difficulty preferred corrupting the sacred text to confessing his own ignorance the passage in the book of joshua which runs and joshua wrote these words in the book of the law of god he changes into and joshua wrote these words and kept them with the book of the law of god what is to be done with persons who will only see what pleases them what is such a proceeding if it is not denying scripture and inventing another bible out of our own heads we may therefore conclude that the book of the law of god which moses wrote was not the pentateuch but something quite different which the author of the pentateuch duly inserted into his book so much is abundantly plain both from what i have said and from what i am about to add for in the passage of deuteronomy above quoted where it is related that moses wrote the book of the law the historian adds that he handed it over to the priests and bade them read it out at a stated time to the whole people this shows that the work was of much less length than the pentateuch inasmuch as it could be read through at one sitting so as to be understood by all further we must not omit to notice that out of all the books which moses wrote this one book of the second covenant and the song which latter he wrote afterwards so that all the people might learn it was the only one which he caused to be religiously guarded and preserved in the first covenant he had only bound over those who were present but in the second covenant he bound over all their descendants also deuteronomy chapter twenty nine verse fourteen and therefore ordered this covenant with future ages to be religiously preserved together with the song which was especially addressed to posterity as then we have no proof that moses wrote any book save this of the covenant and as he committed no other to the care of posterity and lastly as there are many passages in the pentateuch which moses could not have written it follows that the belief that moses was the author of the pentateuch is ungrounded and even irrational someone will perhaps ask whether moses did not also write down other laws when they were first revealed to him in other words whether during the course of forty years he did not write down any of the laws which he promulgated save only those few which i have stated to be contained in the book of the first covenant to this i would answer that although it seems reasonable to suppose that moses wrote down the laws at the time when he wished to communicate them to the people yet we are not warranted to take it as proved for i have shown above that we must make no assertions in such matters which we do not gather from scripture or which do not flow as legitimate consequences from its fundamental principles we must not accept whatever is reasonably probable however even reason in this case would not force such a conclusion upon us 
for it may be that the assembly of elders wrote down the decrees of Moses and communicated them to the people, and the historian collected them and duly set them forth in his narrative of the life of Moses. So much for the five books of Moses. It is now time for us to turn to the other sacred writings. The book of Joshua may be proved not to be an autograph by reasons similar to those we have just employed, for it must be some other than Joshua who testifies that the fame of Joshua was spread over the whole world that he omitted nothing of what moses had taught joshua chapter 6 verse 27 chapter 8 last verse chapter 11 verse 15 that he grew old and summoned an assembly of the whole people and finally that he departed this life furthermore events are related which took place after joshua's death for instance that the israelites worshiped god after his death so long as there were any old men alive who remembered him and in chapter 16 verse 10 we read that ephraim and manasseh did not drive out the canaanites which dwell in gezer but the canaanite dwelt in the land of ephraim unto this day and was tributary to him this is the same statement as that in judges chapter 1 and the phrase unto this day shows that the writer was speaking of ancient times with these texts we may compare the last verse of chapter 15 concerning the sons of judah and also the history of caleb in the same chapter verse 14 further the building of an altar beyond jordan by the two tribes and a half chapter twenty two verse ten the following ones seems to have taken place after the death of joshua for in the whole narrative his name is never mentioned but the people alone held counsel as to waging war sent out legates waited for their return and finally approved of their answer lastly from chapter ten verse fourteen it is clear that the book was written many generations after the death of Joshua, for it bears witness, there was never any day like unto that day, either before or after, that the Lord hearkened to the voice of a man, etc. If, therefore, Joshua wrote any book at all, it was that which is quoted in the work now before us. Chapter 10, verse 13. With regard to the book of Judges, I suppose no rational person persuades himself that it was written by the actual judges. For the conclusion of the whole history contained in chapter 2 clearly shows that it is all the work of a single historian. Further, inasmuch as a writer frequently tells us that there was then no king in Israel, it is evident that the book was written after the establishment of the monarchy. The books of Samuel need not detain us long, inasmuch as the narrative in them is continued long after Samuel's death. But I should like to draw attention to the fact that it was written many generations after Samuel's death. For in Book 1, Chapter 9, Verse 9, the historian remarks in a parenthesis, Before time in Israel, when a man went to inquire of God, thus he spake, Come and let us go to the seer. For he that is now called a prophet was before time called a seer. Lastly, the Book of Kings, as we gather from internal evidence, was compiled from the books of King Solomon. First Kings, Chapter 11, Verse 41, from the Chronicles of the Kings of Judah, first kings chapter 14 verses 19 29 and the chronicles of the kings of israel we may therefore conclude that all the books we have considered hitherto are compilations and that the events therein are recorded as having happened in old time now if we turn our attention to the connection and argument of all these books we shall easily see that they were written by a single historian who wished to relate the antiquities of the jews from their first beginning down to the first destruction of the city the way in which the several books are connected one with the other is alone enough to show us that they form the narrative of one and the same writer for as soon as he has related the life of moses the historian thus passes on to the story of joshua and it came to pass after that moses the servant of the lord was dead that god spake unto joshua etc so in the same way after the death of joshua was concluded he passes with identically the same transition and connection to the history of the judges and it came to pass after that joshua was dead that the children of israel sought from god etc to the book of judges he adds the story of ruth as a sort of appendix in these words now it came to pass in the days that the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land the first book of samuel is introduced with a similar phrase and so is the second book of samuel then before the history of david is concluded the historian passes in the same way to the first book of kings and after david's death to the second book of kings 
The putting together and the order of the narratives show that they are all the work of one man, writing with a definite aim. For the historian begins with relating the first origin of the Hebrew nation, and then sets forth in order the times and the occasions in which Moses put forth his laws and made his predictions. He then proceeds to relate how the Israelites invaded the promised land in accordance with Moses' prophecy, Deuteronomy chapter 7, and how, when the land was subdued, they turned their backs on their laws and thereby incurred many misfortune, Deuteronomy chapter 31, verses 16, 17. He tells how they wished to elect rulers and how, according as these rulers observed the law, the people flourished or suffered, Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 36. Finally, how destruction came upon the nation, even as Moses had foretold. In regard to other matters which do not serve to confirm the law, the writer either passes over them in silence or refers the reader to other books for information. All that is set down in the books we have conduces to the sole object of setting forth the words and laws of Moses and proving them by subsequent events. When we put together these three considerations, namely the unity of the subject of all the books, the connection between them, and the fact that they are compilations made many generations after the events they relate had taken place, we come to the conclusion, as I have just stated, that they are all the work of a single historian. Who this historian was, it is not easy to show. But I suspect that he was Ezra, and there are several strong reasons for adopting this hypothesis. The historian, whom we already know to be but one individual, brings his history down to the liberation of Jehoiakim, and adds that he himself sat at the king's table all his life, that is, at the table either of Jehoiakim or of the son of Nebuchadnezzar, for the sense of the passage is ambiguous. Hence it follows that he did not live before the time of Ezra. But scripture does not testify of any except of Ezra, Ezra chapter 7 verse 10, that he prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to set it forth, and further, that he was a ready scribe in the law of Moses. Therefore I cannot find any one save Ezra to whom to attribute the sacred books. Further, from this testimony concerning Ezra, we see that he prepared his heart not only to seek the law of the Lord, but also to set it forth. And in Nehemiah chapter 8 verse 8 we read that they read in the book of the law of God distinctly, and gave the sense and caused them to understand the reading. As then in Deuteronomy we find not only the book of the law of Moses or the greater part of it, but also many things inserted for its better explanation. I conjecture that this Deuteronomy is the book of the law of God, written, set forth, and explained by Ezra, which is referred to in the text above quoted. Two examples of the way matters were inserted parenthetically in the text of Deuteronomy, with a view to its fuller explanation, we have already given in speaking of Aben Ezra's opinion. Many others are found in the course of the work. For instance, in chapter 2, verse 12, the Horims dwelt also in Sair before time, but the children of Esau succeeded them, when they had destroyed them from before them, and dwelt in their stead, as Israel did unto the land of his possession, which the Lord gave unto them. This explains verses 3 and 4 of the same chapter, where it is stated that Mount Sair, which had come to the children of Esau for a possession, did not fall into their hands uninhabited, but that they invaded it and turned out and destroyed the Horims who formerly dwelt therein, even as the children of Israel had done unto the Canaanites after the death of Moses. So also verses 6, 7, 8, 9 of the 10th chapter are inserted parenthetically among the words of Moses. Everyone must see that verse 8 which begins, At that time the Lord separated the tribe of Levi, necessarily refers to verse 5, and not to the death of Aaron, which is only mentioned here by Ezra, because Moses, in telling of the golden calf worshipped by the people, stated that he had prayed for Aaron. He then explains that at the time at which Moses spoke, God had chosen for himself the tribe of Levi in order that he may point out the reason for their election, and for the fact of their not sharing in the inheritance. After the digression, he resumes the thread of Moses' speech. To these parentheses we must add the preface to the book, and all the passages in which Moses is spoken of in the third person, besides many which we cannot now distinguish, though doubtless they would have been plainly recognized by the writer's contemporaries. If I say we were in possession of the book of the law as Moses wrote it, I do not doubt that we should find a great difference in the words of the precepts. 
the order in which they are given, and the reason by which they are supported. A comparison of the Decalogue in Deuteronomy with the Decalogue in Exodus, where its history is explicitly set forth, will be sufficient to show us a wide discrepancy in all these three particulars, for the fourth commandment is given not only in a different form, but at much greater length, while the reason for its observance differs wholly from that stated in Exodus. Again, the order in which the tenth commandment is explained differs in the two versions. I think that the differences here as elsewhere are the work of Ezra, who explained the law of God to his contemporaries, and who wrote this book of the law of God before anything else. This I gather from the fact that it contains the laws of the country, of which the people stood in most need, and also because it is not joined to the book which precedes it by any connecting phrase, but begins with the independent statement, these are the words of Moses. After this task was completed, I think Ezra set himself to give a complete account of the history of the Hebrew nation, from the creation of the world to the entire destruction of the city, and in this account he inserted the book of Deuteronomy, and, possibly, he called the first five books by the name of Moses, because his life is chiefly contained therein, and forms their principal subject. For the same reason he called the sixth Joshua, the seventh Judges, the eighth Ruth, the ninth and perhaps the tenth Samuel, and lastly the eleventh and twelfth Kings. Whether Ezra put the finishing touches to this work and finished it as he intended, we will discuss in the next chapter. End of section 9, read for you by Chiquito Crasto, Birmingham, Alabama.